Tradoon.
distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extra. What'd you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Okay, got it in for me. And look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrist. It's not one of these guys that learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. That Could doesn't be. look very scary. <laughs> more like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Turkey. Six-foot turkey. Turkey. Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. Get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter a clearing. Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. So good to have you here. A happy, happy Friday to you, and a very, very happy World Pangolin Day, which officially is tomorrow, February 17th, but I wasn't planning on streaming tomorrow, so we're doing it today instead. And if any of you are here for the very first time, and I believe there are a few of you, you picked a wonderful day to show up. A slightly unusual day, but man, are we going to have a cool stream today. I'll explain why in a minute. First, let me introduce myself, especially for any new folks who might be here for the very first time. Um, welcome, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a, a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. Now that's me, I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Um, and Strunk, thank you for that follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I call myself a dinosaur paleontologist because there are many, many different kinds of paleontologists. Farning, thank you. Thank you for those five months of support, Farning. I really appreciate that. Good stuff. Um, most paleontologists do not work on dinosaurs. Paleontology is the study of fossils in general. Everything from fossil fungi and fossilized plankton to fossil mammals and insects and amphibians and reptiles and birds. I work on dinosaurs in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. It's important to make that distinction because I feel like a lot of folks in the general public think that Paleontologist means dinosaur scientist. But no, we are actually a small minority within the paleontological community. 
Most paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs. It's just dinosaurs get a ton of attention. I'm sure dinosaurs will be getting a fair amount of attention on today's stream too, but we are going to be focusing on pangolins today. In honor of World Pangolin Day. These are incredibly cool animals, and I, like I said in the going live message, I guarantee you, 100%, you can take this to the bank, by the end of this stream, you will adore these animals. They are incredibly charismatic. The eight or nine species that exist today are all endangered or critically endangered. They desperately need our help. We'll be talking about why they're important, why they're so cool, and what we can do to help save them today. Now, this is going to be kind of a far-reaching stream. It's going to be going into, uh, well, like we often do, biology and the fossil record, evolutionary history. It's going to get into the interrelatedness of different mammals. It's going to get into conservation and the illegal wildlife trade. How pangolins... How poaching pangolins may have actually led directly to the coronavirus pandemic. COVID-19 might be a direct result of people mistreating pangolins. We'll be talking about why all this stuff is important to know. It's, oh man, it's going to be a whirlwind stream. And I'm so glad you're here for it. Um, Laser Fern says, I'm ready with my cul-de-sac pangolin copy pasta. What is that, Laser Fern? Enlighten us? <laughs> Uh, and very funny, G. Shumway. It's called Penguin and not Pangolin. Just kidding. Let me introduce you to these remarkable creatures. Oh, and we've got a relative of one right here, actually. We'll be talking about the closest living relatives of pangolins and how they are carnivorous mammals, like Mini Pie right here. Hello, hello, Mini. How are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, pangolins, despite looking like, well, despite looking like, some people say an armadillo, some people say an anteater, some people say they look like an artichoke with legs, um, they're actually related to dogs and cats and other carnivorous mammals, like, uh, like mini pie right there. Myosaurs always ate their vegetables. And just some dude, thank you for the follow, I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Uh... Here we go. Come on, mouse. Don't fail me now. These ladies and gents and NBs and everybody else are pangolins. This is some kind of Asian pangolin here. There's another one right there. And I can give a little warning at the beginning of stream and it because this is a live broadcast and people are just kind of jumping in, this will go unheeded by new viewers. Um, we're going to hear this a million times, even if I warn you against it. People are going to say, Oh, that's, that looks like a Pokemon! This is a real-life animal that is in desperate need of our help. It, it just kind of irks me a little bit when people go, Oh, that's a Pokemon! It's like, okay, I understand you're not familiar with a lot of animals. Um, there's a, a giant ground African pangolin right there. Very, very cool. It's honestly my favorite one. Um, there's eight or nine species of these animals alive on Earth today. They have a fossil history going back to, I think, the Eocene period? Um, I think we have fossils of them from Messel in Germany be talking a little bit about that too if we have time but they are incredibly charismatic animals and oh man you can type an exclamation mark pangolin p-a-n-g-o-l-i-n pangolin for information on how to help them there's a donate button there on that website um yeah the pangolin crisis fund Oh, I can't wait to get into this. Yeah. Um, and I just learned it's a cat, so I don't know what you mean. So these critters are related to cats and dogs and other carnivorous mammals. 
So they're related to cats and dogs and bears, seals and sea lions, weasels and badgers and critters like that, what we call carnivora. These guys are kind of an outgroup. They, they evolved just before the origin of carnivora. Yeah, that protective keratin. Welcome back, Patrick Pirate. It's good to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Um, yeah, what an incredible creature, the pangolin. And, uh, yeah, as you can tell, changed the accoutrement in the office today to suit today's topic. It's pangolins galore in the office today in honor of World Pangolin Day. Yeah. Um, such cool critters. And do they bite? What do they eat? I would like one as a pet, says the Tratus Minis. They do not do well as pets. They absolutely do not. They do not do well in captivity. Uh, they eat ants and termites. So unless you have a dozen ant and termite nests within the confines of your house, these animals will starve and die. Um, they do not make good pets. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, we actually have footage of a pangolin wreaking havoc in someone's house. Uh, they've also got incredibly strong claws. The larger species of pangolin can actually dig through concrete. Very, very cool. Um, they are, they are not, they are not built to be pets. Most definitely not. Let me find that video here. Um, with, uh, with Honeybun, who's the name of this particular pangolin. An African giant pangolin. Um, take a look at this. I was ever. Oh, here. It starts off very sad. There's going to be a mixture of, of sadness and joy in today's stream, just to let you know. And, and outrage, too. Are they endangered by anything specific? Yes. Uh, Giacco, Giacobi? Uh, by poaching. Yeah. Um, there's this big scam that's been going around in Asia where, uh, some folks have been able to convince people that these creatures have magical scales and flesh which can cure all illnesses and make you more virile and everything else. Like, you know, they call it traditional medicine, but it's neither traditional nor is it medicine. Um, but these creatures are, are poached for that reason and then made into soup or stuff like that. It's, it's really horrifying, and we'll be talking about that today. The arrival of Honeybun was probably one of the saddest arrivals ever. Oh. The mother was seriously abused. She had been kicked around. It was obviously on a cement floor. Um, um, evolutionary biologists, taxonomists, phylogenists. All life on Earth seems to have come from a single common ancestor. Uh, about 3.8 billion years ago, give or take. And so all life on Earth can be plotted on a tree like this, since it all came from one ancestor. We can tell that all life is related. And we can kind of quantify those relate interrelationships by looking at things like DNA, and also by looking at the fossil record to see where certain groups originated and stuff like that. It's all, it's all part of this. Let's jump to mammals here. You and I, chat, are, are mammals. I assume everybody watching is probably a mammal. If you're a human being, then you're a mammal. Any other cats or dogs or other pets who are watching while their owners are asleep, um, chances are you're also a mammal. Unless you're a reptile, like a lizard or a, a bird or something. Um, and uh, Menong Hassan, it is great to have you here. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. And thank you for the six months subscribing in advance. Big paleo salute to you. It is wonderful to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Normally I'd be talking about dinosaurs or fossils in general, 
but today's a special day. It's World Pangolin Day tomorrow, and so we're celebrating, talking about pangolins, and hopefully trying to raise a little bit of money for pangolin conservation. Um, and we're talking about where, uh, where pangolins are on the family tree. Uh, on the grand tree of life. So let's zoom in here. There's our pangolins there. Uh, this says eight species, but just recently there was a potential ninth species discovered. Pangolin in Asia. But anyway, they are allied with the carnivorous mammals. So they're this little branch that comes off here. 15.2 million years ago. That seems awful recent, actually. I thought they were older than that. But they are allied with the carnivorans, which is lions and tigers and bears. Uh, walruses and sea lions and weasels and otters. Mongoose and civets and stuff like that. Um, a lot of carnivorous mammals happen to be carnivorans. This doesn't mean that, that these animals all eat meat. They don't. Some of these don't. A giant panda, for instance, is not a carnivore. It eats bamboo. But carnivorans, this is a group of mammals, um, they've got these carnassial teeth. Um, like, that's something that the ancestor of these guys evolved. And, uh, in fact, I can even show you a clip. Um, let's see here. Carnivorans. Uh, I made a little video about a carnivoran mammal. Um, let's see. There we go. There you have it. This is, shoot, from way before I joined Twitch. Before I'd ever heard of Twitch, I was making videos on YouTube. This is back when I lived in Montana. Long time ago. Um, there you go. Based only on their bones. It's a practice called osteology, and... It's kind of our wheelhouse. It's to, yeah, it's to, so to just eat by meat. Sometimes to crush bones, sort of. In the adjust board you'll see, you'll see. Especially the structure of the skull, the general shape of the teeth, and the zygomatic arch. I can tell right off the bat that this thing is a carnivoran. They're the group of mammals that includes lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Plus canines and hyenas, foxes, raccoons, pinnipeds, and all kinds of little weaselly guys, too. This group split off from the rest of the mammals, probably sometime in the Eocene, about 42 million years ago. 42 million years ago, and that that's why I was a little surprised that, here's carnivorans here, that they're saying pangolins here originated 15.2 million years ago? Maybe they're not saying that that's where the split occurred? Oh, no, shoot, they're saying the split here is 65 million years ago. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. This makes a lot more sense. Yeah, but anyway, pangolins are pretty close to the carnivora. Yeah. And from their common ancestor, they inherited something that we call carnassials. Those are those distinct no, teeth, right? Not there. those carnassials. Dumb joke. I'm talking about the distinctly shaped there we go. cheek teeth that these critters use for slicing up meat and stuff like that. Or for chewing on bones. That's what hyenas use them for. Um, Chinas will actually crush bone using their carnassial teeth. So different kinds of carnivorous mammals have got different kinds of... Like, they've got different uses for their carnassial teeth. Um, in pandas, they're kind of blunt and, you know, they're... They're used for chewing bamboo. In uh, in dogs, they're used mostly for slicing. Most of the time, carnassial teeth are for slicing. Shaped cheek teeth that these critters use for slicing up meat and stuff like that. Yeah. So those are carnivorans. And the group that... Uh, that gave rise to pangolins is right here. I don't know what the name of this clade is, and they don't say here. But there's our pangolins there. And uh, they're a pretty cool group of mammals. They really are. Or scissoring through tough toys. There you go, Queen Dark Lady. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lenina says, I always laugh when I see a dog toy that is priding itself as indestructible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, dogs laugh at that. Especially particularly destructive dogs. But 
let's get into this little video here to kind of give you some background information on these animals. I'm not a mammal scientist, so I'm not an expert on these. I'm just very enthusiastic about them. And so we're going to be watching some videos like this today. And it seems like the battery on my mouse... I might need to replace the batteries here because the mouse is being real sluggish. Um... So I might go try and find some new batteries while this is playing. It's four minutes long. I will be right back, okay? And here is a link to that video. Follow Animal Fact Files on YouTube if uh, if you like this video. They do good work. Um, take a look. Until 2020, many people didn't... Uh, oh, no closed captioning on this. So apologies. I'll turn the volume up a little bit. Not like that will help too much, but... Up until 2020, many people didn't even go. know pangolins existed. We want to take a moment to describe these unique and endangered animals without the context of why they've recently been making headlines. One look at a pangolin shows that these are some strange mammals. Known also as walking pine cones and scaly anteaters, pangolins are the only known living scaled mammals. Their armor does superficially have some similarities to armadillos. And, like some armadillo species, pangolins curl up for defense. But these two mammal groups are unrelated. We say groups because there are multiple pangolin species. There are four pangolin species living in Asia and four in Africa. These animals are arboreal creatures, meaning they live in trees, though they may also dig burrows in the ground for sleeping. Their long, prehensile tails act like a fifth grasping limb and aid oh, cool. in tree climbing. Pangolins also have long, sharp nails that are helpful in digging up food. While pangolins are more closely related to cats than anteaters, yep. the name scaly anteater isn't a misnomer. These scaly mammals love to dine both on ants and termites. Yep. The pangolins use their sharp front claws to dig into nests of their prey. While eating, a pangolin can close its eyes, nose, and ears to avoid bites. And it will use its sticky tongue to lap up thousands of insects. Pangolin tongues are insanely long. Very cool. While our tongues are pretty much confined to our mouths. A pangolin's tongue is anchored near the bottom of its rib cage. At full <laughs> extension, a pangolin's tongue can reach more than two feet in length. That's longer than Chester's entire body. Of hmm. course, this is only in the larger pangolin species, as these animals can range from about the size of a house cat up to a large dog. Pangolins are generally found living Much in better. places with dense trees, like swamps and forests. They are primarily nocturnal animals and live alone, though a mother will travel with her current offspring. They, females on her back, find usually, yeah. available males by tracking scents from urine and feces. After mating, these animals part ways. The female will gestate for two to four and a half months and give birth to one to three babies, depending on the species. The babies are born with soft scales, which harden after birth. Yep. Young pangolins may stick with their mother until they reach reproductive maturity at two years of age. While pangolins do come with their own built-in armor, they may fall victim to predators including leopards, lions, pythons, owls, eagles, chimpanzees, and more. They're mm. also the most trafficked mammals in the world. Yeah, that's in some one of the reasons why we're talking about them. scales are believed to have medicinal properties, and they their don't have medicinal is considered properties. a delicacy. This has led to endangerment of all pangolin species, with some listed as critically endangered as of this recording. Yeah. If they can keep away from predators, however, these animals may live to be 20 years old. Hmm. All pangolin species lack teeth. When you have a super tongue, do you really need teeth? And when you're Instead, eating ants or termites, these animals yeah. will swallow small stones to aid in digestion of their insect diets. And I, I'd totally forgotten about that. They use gastroliths. That is super cool. This is actually a more common behavior than you might expect uh, using gastroliths. Various animals that live in the water will do this as ballast, but um. Yeah, in fact, I can show you a quick clip of that. Yeah, from 
prehistoric planet. Here's some plesiosaurs. Not dinosaurs, but these are marine reptiles that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. So these are not dinosaurs here, but they lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. It has something that few others can provide. And, uh, Yamina says, why are they not dinosaurs? Because they didn't evolve from a dinosaur ancestor. I'm glad you asked that question. Here, um... I use this poster a lot whenever I get that question. You can get it at 252nya.com. Um, I love the art style here. But the way that we classify living things as scientists is not based on, like, what they look like. It's not based on some arbitrary set of characteristics. Living things are more closely related to other living things in a real sense if they share a recent common ancestor. So with dinosaurs, we had one original dinosaur that evolved, and then every single dinosaur afterward is descended from that one dinosaur. That's what makes them all dinosaurs, is that they all had the same ancestor. And then there was this wonderful adaptive radiation. You had all these different species that sprung from one original species. And this is what we call a clade. A clade is like an actual biological group of living things that are all related to each other. So like pangolins, like we were talking about earlier, or like we're talking about today, but I was showing you here on the tree earlier. Folodota, this is a clade. So all of these guys evolved from a common ancestor about 15.2 million years ago. That's why these guys are not armadillos or anteaters or something, because anteaters and armadillos evolved from a different ancestor. Armadillos, I think, are... Uh... I think they're xenarthrans. So they're related to sloths. Uh, nope, hang on. No, it's trying to do... No, not the pill bug armadillo. Armadillos, there we go. Yeah... We had the same thing yesterday, where it tried to take us to the pill bug that's called armadillo. But yeah, these guys are related to sloths. So even though these guys might superficially look kind of like pangolins, they're not closely related to them. They had different ancestors. So we classify living things based on their ancestry in science. And so in order to be a dinosaur, you have to have evolved from this ancestor. Plesiosaurs are over here. And they evolved from a different ancestor than the dinosaurs did. Does that make sense? In order to be a dinosaur, you have to have evolved from a dinosaur. So dinosaurs begin here. That's why pterosaurs, aka pterodactyls, are not dinosaurs. They're very closely related, but they evolved, their ancestors split off before the ancestors of the dinosaurs did. And so they are not quite dinosaurs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so when people say the crocs are dinosaurs, it's wrong. Yes, Yamina, yeah. So crocodilians are over here. Yeah. Um, so crocodilians and dinosaurs, they do share a common ancestor down here, a non-dinosaur common ancestor. And they're both part of what we call Archosauria. So they, they're part of the same bigger group. But dinosaurs are a smaller group within that bigger group, and crocodiles are not part of that smaller group. Does that make sense? Crocodilians are their own group over here. But if you go back far enough, you can get to where dinosaurs and crocodiles share a common ancestor. But then again, that's true of all life on Earth. Since we, we understand that all life on Earth diverged from a single common ancestor about 3.8 billion years ago, everything is related if you go back far enough. We as human beings are related to bacteria, to fungi, to trees, to sharks, and to dinosaurs. And Manang Hassan, thank you so much for those five gift subs. I appreciate that very much. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you. Manang, holy moly. Um, thank you, thank you for that. You're brand new to that. You subscribed for six months in advance, and now you're gifting subs to five. I really appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. 
good people in this aunt's chat. Appreciate you. Come on. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and there are five, I'm sure, very grateful people who just got a gift sub who uh, won't have to watch any ads for the next 30 days. Thank you for that. Yeah. So chickens are dinosaurs, but crocodiles are not? Yes, this is true. Yeah. Um, here to go back to our, uh, our image here. Birds, including this magpie and including chickens, they are dinosaurs. You can trace their ancestry back to that first dinosaur ancestor. Birds evolved from an earlier dinosaur ancestor. Not just chickens, but ostriches and magpies and penguins and and, and plovers. All birds are dinosaurs. Because they evolved from dinosaurs. Crocodiles did not evolve from dinosaurs. Crocodiles evolved from an earlier ancestor of dinosaurs down here. So they're outside of the dinosaur family tree. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this becomes increasingly obvious when you, you start learning about all of the feathered dinosaurs that we have now. Uh, like, for instance... Velociraptor. We know it had feathers all over its body. Jurassic World lied to you. These animals had feathers all over their bodies. And that would have made them all the more deadly. There's a, there's a neat little like webcomic uh, that features this. Um, this is actually based on the research of my old crew chief. Kind of my mentor when I was in Montana. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm pulling this up for all the, the cool new people here. But, yeah, this webcomic, it's this little girl reading about dinosaurs. And uh, a woman walks up and she goes, What are you reading about? Just dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. They've gotten all weird since when I was a kid. They used to be awesome, but now they all have dorky feathers, right? And she goes, Yep. This says that they now think raptors use their wings for stability, flapping to stay on top of their prey while hanging on with their hooked claws and eating it alive. <laughs> Which is actually what we think. I can show you the, the paper that, that proposes this idea. And she pauses for a second, and then she sits down and starts reading, too. This is... Oh! I love that so much. But, uh... Yeah, here is the paper right here by Denver Fowler, my old crew chief, and my mentor when I was in Montana. The Predatory Ecology of Deinonychus. Deinonychus is the name of the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. It's a long story. They're not actually velociraptor. They're Deinonychus in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. And the origin of flapping in birds. So this is the idea, is that these animals, just like modern birds of prey, use their, their wings to flap for stability when they're on top of large prey that's struggling a lot, they will hook their claws into it. And then, in order to, to prevent being bucked off of the prey, they'll they'll flap their wings to stay upright. And then they'll just they'll just take bites while the animal's still still struggling. We think that that dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor or Deinonychus or um Utah Raptor, um, they would have done the same thing. Utah raptor here and uh, and here. It's not an animal you'd want to run into in a dark alley. Holy cow. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Neat stuff. Um, yeah. And Sensei says so there was a time when it was generally agreed upon that they didn't have feathers. Everyone just kind of assumed that, oh yeah, dinosaurs are reptiles so let's give them scaly skin like lizards. But a lot of dinosaurs had feathers like this. And it started to make more sense when I realized that birds are a kind of reptile and that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And then we started finding dinosaur fossils with feathers all over them. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if so, when did we begin to figure out that they had feathers and why did we not think this before? But yeah, yeah. A, a big part of it is that we just kind of thought that like when I was when I was a little kid, you know, growing up in the nineties, 
Um, there were maybe about half of dinosaur paleontologists kind of suspected that birds were dinosaurs. But we didn't have, like, direct proof of that yet. No one had ever found fossil feathers on a dinosaur. Or at least if they had, it had been misinterpreted as other stuff. Because people weren't thinking of them as feathered, feathered animals. And then, that all started to change around 1996. Um, you know, actually, there's a video about this, too. Um, there we go. Take a look. Related to birds. There we go. When Jurassic Park first came out in 1993, it was a pretty groundbreaking depiction of dinosaurs. <laughs> Steven Spielberg certainly took plenty of artistic liberties, but overall, the movie was so much better than what had come before in terms of recreating what scientists knew about how dinosaurs looked and how they moved. The character yeah. Alan Grant was actually a bit ahead of his time. Look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. Back then, the claim that birds evolved from dinosaurs was still controversial. Now yep. it's widely accepted. But yeah, so Jurassic Park was ahead of its time back then. In 1993, you would still see a lot of paleontologists who were like, yeah, I think birds probably evolved from some sort of like earlier crocodile-like thing. We don't really think they have anything to do with dinosaurs. But no, it became increasingly obvious in the late 90s that, shoot, they evolved from dinosaurs. And that, it was the discovery of feathers in, in Liaoning, in China, that really But really in the late 1990s, off. the science started speeding ahead, and the yeah. movies just didn't keep up. Even the latest installment, Jurassic World, shot in ultra-high-definition 3D, it features dinosaurs that are out of date. Grievously out of date. They're like 30 years out of date in that film. It's awful. Three years after the first Jurassic Park movie was released, scientists yep. in China uncovered a feathered dinosaur for the first time. Yeah. We've got Sinoceropteryx emotes here for tier two subscribers and tier three. Um, this is also the first dinosaur where we could figure out what colors it was. Because the there are there are preserved color cells in those feathers. It is so well preserved that you can actually look at the shape of of the color cells in the feathers. You can look at the melanosomes and figure out, oh, this shape corresponds to reddish feathers. This shape corresponds to whitish feathers. And we can actually... So the that emote right there, the two-part Sinoceropteryx emote, you know, these, um, those are based on real science. The coloration is not speculative. It's based on actual hard evidence, which is super cool. Yeah. And Baha Spencer says, but they didn't think Archaeopteryx was a dinosaur then? For a long time, uh, a lot of scientists were really against the idea that Archaeopteryx was a dinosaur. They thought it evolved from some sort of crocodile type thing. There was some mysterious ghost lineage of bird-like crocodilian things, and it, that all turned out to be nonsense. It takes yeah. very specific conditions for the Earth to record soft tissues like these primitive feathers. The animals had to be buried quickly before decomposing and in fine-grained sediment. It turned out that this part of China, Liaoning province, saw major volcanic eruptions around 120 million years ago, which provided these very conditions. And yep. more than... Uh, Trooper says, are these real feathers or more like thick hair? It depends which kind of dinosaur we're talking about. Some of them have got what we call proto-feathers, where they basically just look like... They just look kind of like wiry filaments, almost like hair or fur. Um, but some of them actually have like branching elements. Some of them actually have a, a central rachis, like a shaft, with the little barbules coming off of that. I think they're called barbules. Um, barbules are how they connect to each other, at least. Some dinosaurs had full-on flight feathers. Velociraptor is one of those dinosaurs, where they had like full-on penaceous feathers, is what we call them. That's the, the term that we use for like full-on flight feathers. Penaceous feathers. Um, but there's a whole spectrum within dinosauria, and I think they'll show you that in a little phylogeny, a little family tree. 30 feathered dinosaur species have been unearthed there and in some other places since 1996. These yep. fuzzy dinosaurs were mostly two-legged meat eaters, part of a group that's closely related to birds in the dinosaur family tree. That group includes many of the dinosaurs featured in the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, Gallimimus. These guys yeah. probably had feathers of some sort for insulation or decoration. Mm -hmm. And that includes the raptors. Oh, Jurassic yeah. Park 3 sort of nodded to the new research by giving them a little bit of a hairdo, but their feathers probably looked more like this. 
A velociraptor okay. fossil We're from the Gobi different. Desert revealed bumps yeah. on the forearm, similar to the wing attachments on modern birds. That means the raptors had wings. Oh, uh, terrible reconstruction right there. Terrible. I would... They would have looked much more like, uh, much more like this, you know, fully feathered. The Velociraptor, if you were to see it in life, you'd be like, holy cow, what is wrong with that eagle running around on the ground? That is the scariest thing I've ever seen. That's what you would say. <laughs> oh, just, yeah, yeah. It, it's like a giant ground running eagle, except it's got gigantic claws on its hands and it's got a mouth full of, of deadly sharp teeth. Um, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Yeah. Not like and this. And what about T-Rex? There's no direct evidence, but a few years ago, scientists found a 30-foot dinosaur go, with yeah. some feathers, yeah. the biggest yet so far. Eutyranus is thought to be closely yeah. related to T-Rex, so it's possible that the most famous and feared dinosaur might have been sort of fluffy. Yeah, and you can see cool depictions of T-Rex with feathers. Um... Let's see, the game Saurian has a really, really good feathered T-Rex that I like a lot. Uh, and that's right here. Um, we don't know if T-Rex had feathers yet. We don't have good, um, good like, preserved skin or integument from T-Rex. So it's definitely possible. Um, my guess is they T-Rex almost certainly would have had thick feathers when it was young. And then when it gets bigger as it ages, as it grows and matures... Um, those would have fallen off. Kind of like with elephants, where, like, baby elephants are hairier than the adults. Because when you're a baby elephant, like, you're much smaller than an adult, you gotta keep warm. Big animals have a much easier time staying warm. Um, especially in warm environments. In fact, they need to dump heat. They need... Their problem is not... is not retaining heat. It's getting rid of excess heat when you get really big. Um, because of the, what is it, the inverse square law? Um, or the square cube law? I don't know, I'm not a mathematician. Um, so yeah, adult T-Rex probably didn't have, like, feathers everywhere. At least not for warmth. But, uh, when T-Rex was young, they almost certainly had feathers, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and Asian elephants are especially hairy. There you go, Charlie's Dragon, yeah. Yeah, especially when they're younger. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. It's not clear how universal feathers were among dinosaurs. Here's that but family while most tree of the here. specimens are theropods, there have been a few interesting findings from way over on the other side of the family tree. Yep. These two have bristles of some sort, which may I or may not be that, actually, But these feathers. guys, TNU long, yeah. And this one found last year Who has the even more complex feather-like filaments. Yeah. These fossils may indicate that feather precursors date back to some of the dinosaurs' earliest common ancestors. Yep. And it, it could be that feathers actually predate dinosaurs. Because we know that pterosaurs... Remember we were talking about how pterosaurs are not dinosaurs? But they're, they're very closely related to dinosaurs, but they're not quite dinosaurs. They evolved before. Or they split off... That branch split off before. We know they had fuzzy filaments. They didn't have, like, flight feathers. Because their wings were skin membranes. Like this. Almost kind of like a bat. Um, but they did have a fuzzy covering. So the question is, is this fuzzy covering something that pterosaurs evolved that was special and unique? Or did these guys and dinosaurs both inherit that fuzzy covering, that proto-feather type thing, from their common ancestor? We still don't know. This is a big question, Claybur. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh... Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? I hope so. So it could be that, that feathers actually predate the, the first dinosaurs by a little bit. Um, if pterosaurs... If the fuzz that pterosaurs has had... If that is homologous to feathers, if it is the same structure, then that implies that it first arose in the ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Feather precursors date back to some of the dinosaurs' earliest common ancestors. Jurassic World could have introduced feathered dinosaurs to a huge audience this Such year, a missed opportunity. But it didn't. Ugh. For According shame. Jack Horner, a paleontologist that worked on all four films, the decision was made for the sake um, of consistency. 
Yeah, uh, he must have been so disappointed, too, when they said that. Poor Jack. This is my old boss, everybody, if you're new here. Um, yeah. I've, I've heard that Jack wanted Steven Spielberg to put feathers on the dinosaurs back in 1993. Because Jack is like, yeah, they almost certainly had feathers back in 1993 before we'd even found fossils of the feathers yet. But they, they overruled him. But you have to assume that they also just weren't up for the task of making feathers into something scary. And I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, holy cow, feathers can be scary. And... Yeah... Yeah, I mean... Shoot. Take a look at this. Neat little, like, fan animation done here. Of a feathered dromaeosaur. A skilled filmmaker can make lots of things scary. Feathers are not inherently unscary or anything. In fact, I think... I believe pretty strongly that... That feathers can actually make you a lot scarier if they're like... If they have a certain like kind of shagginess to them. It's like, it could be really, really unsettling. Um... Yeah. Um... Like, there's a, uh, a Therizinosaurus model at the Dinosaur Museum in Blanding, Utah. And, uh, the fact that it's got feathers all over its body, these kind of, like, rough, shaggy feathers, um, I think that makes it significantly more unsettling. This is a plant-eating animal, but still, it's like, it shouldn't be that scary looking as a plant eater um like oof. i did a live stream from here in 2021 and uh that was one of the highlights of that stream was uh walking up to that therizinosaurus model and like something about that just like that kind of formless shaggy like ugh, something about that's very unsettling yeah um despite this animal probably being a gentle herbivore but yeah, yeah. Uh, and certain plant eaters are scarier and more dangerous than predators. Yeah, well, think about hippos, for instance. And Yamina says, why did it need such huge claws? We're still kind of figuring that out for Therizinosaurs. But this whole group tends to have pretty large claws. They evolved from meat-eating dinosaurs. And, oh, I know her. That's Amy Atwater. Right? Is that Amy right there? Maybe not. Looks like her, at least. Amy Atwater used to be um, the collections manager at Museum of the Rockies. Uh, just after I left, I think. But I, I knew her from beforehand, too. Um, she ran the blog uh, Mary Anning's Revenge. Um, but yeah, yeah. So these guys, Therizinosaurs, uh, they're also closely related to birds. I'll show you another Therizinosaur, Ehrlichosaurus. Um, I've got a 3D printed skull of one of these critters. And uh, so these were, they evolved from meat eating dinosaurs, but they evolved to eat plants. And a lot of really interesting things happen to their anatomy as they do that. Um, their, their posture kind of tilts upward. Um, their hips get really big and thick. They become much slower and more cumbersome. They develop this great big gut. And then they have these huge arms with these massive claws on the end. And we think those are probably for, like, reaching up into branches and, um, and pulling down leaves. Um, Bapiosaurus is a good example of this. Um, pretty big gut on this animal. Um, on Lewis Ray's illustration of Bapiosaurus. There we go, there's some... Stampeding Bapiosaurus. Look at that big gut there. Um, just ruining these other feathered dinosaurs' day. <laughs> yeah. Um. And if dinosaurs had not died, I imagine that mammals would still be small creatures like this living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. 
Yeah, uh, really, girl, it's true. Thank you for the follow. And we are talking about mammals today. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to be talking about pangolins. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But yeah, Therizinosaur Party. There you go, Moosey Fate. Therizinosaur Party. Um, they're, uh, they're getting crazy there in the, at the club. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, Juan Arizona says, Juan H. Arizona says, Hey, in my class, my professor showed us several dinosaurs to research information. I got the Chindosaurus. Can you give me some information, please? I can, Juan. I can, just for you. I can talk about Chindosaurus real quick. First of all, that's how you say it, Chindosaurus. Or close to that, anyway. Um, I'll show you what it looked like when I was a kid, and then what we now understand it looked like. Um, let me grab that book. Hang on, camera froze again. That's better. There we go. Yeah, so when I was a kid, Chindosaurus, we thought it had a totally different looking crest. I turned right to it. It's a duckbill dinosaur from the late Cretaceous of... I can't remember if it's from Mongolia or from Inner Mongolia, which is part of China. But um, this is what we thought it looked like when I was a kid, which I don't know why they... We know it had a bony crest like this coming off the top of its head, but I don't know why the fleshy protrusion... Maybe somebody was playing a joke, because it, it looks... Remember, this is a, a PG or G-rated chat, everybody, so don't... Um... Yeah, hold your tongues. But yeah, Chindosaurus. I don't know why we thought it looked like that. Um, but it turns out that's wrong. Here's a skeleton of it. Um, yeah, Chindosaurus spinorhinus. Uh, at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology in Beijing. Uh, oh, it's from the... Late Cretaceous rocks of Laying County, Shandong Province, China. Um, its most distinctive feature is the unicorn-like, forwardly pointing crest extending from the top of the skull. We now know that that's just the remnants of the crest. That's not the whole thing. So the animal, after we realized that and looked at some of its relatives, we realized that its crest probably looked more like this. Much more similar to that of its relatives, like... Um, uh, Corythosaurus and Hypacrosaurus and, and Lambiosaurus. Yeah. So it, it suddenly made a lot more sense that its crest is not as weird looking as we once thought it was. Um, yeah. Looks like that. And if you're looking for resources on this animal, Juan, the best single source of information online is actually Wikipedia, believe it or not. Wikipedia isn't perfect for a lot of stuff. In fact, for other topics, Wikipedia might not be very good, but for dinosaurs, Wikipedia is really fantastic. It is like the single best source of information on the internet. Um, and that's largely because there's a lot of people who are really, really into dinosaurs on Wikipedia, and they work very, very hard to make these articles as good as they can keep them up to date, you know, incorporate the latest research and stuff into them. And also, right here, the references are what you want. This is how you can get those primary sources of data on these creatures. Wikipedia is basically just like a synthesis of this, a summary. This is the real info here, the original scientific literature. You can get to it here through the Wikipedia page. Excellent stuff. Yeah. So there you go, Juan. I hope that's helpful. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So the crest is mostly soft tissue? No, I mean, parts of the actual bone are gone as you're firing. Um, yeah. Uh, outdated crest shape there. Hmm. 
Let's see. Conclusion of the unicorn-like bone was just the rear part of a larger cranial crest that started from the tip of the snout. The front of the crest would have been formed by the ascending processes of the premaxilla. So that's these bones at the front of the snout. These had expanded rhomboid contact facets with the expanded upper parts of the crest processes of the nasal bones forming the rear of the crest. The rear base of the crest was covered by outgrowths of the prefrontals. Um, so basically the idea is that, like, this had been improperly reconstructed and there were a bunch of bones that were missing and they were improperly reconstructed by the original researchers. And this makes a ton of sense when you realize that there are other duckbill dinosaurs that have very similar crests. Like Lambiosaurus, for instance. It's got a pretty similar crest right there. Um, Carithosaurus. This guy here. Hypacrosaurus. Uh, yeah. So, it turns out that the... The crest of uh, Chindosaurus, not all that weird or unusual. It, it kind of fits with what some of these other duckbill dinosaurs had. Which makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's just a little bit more um, pronounced than some of these guys. So yeah. Yeah. Corythosaurus is your other favorite. Well, well, well. That's awesome, Juan. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. And were those crests covered in keratin? Probably more skin than keratin. Um, but there may have been some keratin as well. If if a, a structure were covered in keratin, we would expect it to have kind of a... Almost like a veiny texture to it, but like inverted. Um, like little... Uh, little like creases and wrinkles in it. And, and that's not really what we see in most hadrosaur crests. They're probably covered by skin rather than keratin. Grooves! Thank you, Yamina. That's the word I was actually searching for. Appreciate it. Yes, grooves. Um, yeah. Like, um, I'll show you a stegosaur spike. Hang on. done painting this replica yet, but here's my 3D printed stegosaur tail spike. And you see these characteristic grooves running up it like that. See that? These are attachment points for keratin right here. These are what we call blood vessel grooves or nutrient grooves. So in a, in a bone that has got a keratin covering over the top, you see these grooves in it like that. And that's what, uh, what supplies the keratin with nutrients. So in life, by the way, this would be probably like twice as long. This is just the bony core right here. There'd be a keratinous sheath, almost like the same material as a rhino's horn or our fingernails or pangolin scales, as we'll be talking about later. Um, also made of keratin. So this would be like, maybe like this long in life. It would come to a really, really sharp point up here. This right here is not gonna, that's not going to go through my hand, but an actual stegosaur spike in life, covered by that keratin sheath. Oh boy. Yeah, you do not want to get... You do not want to get skewered by that. It's going to be curtains for you. So yeah, yeah. Creature Brit says, nice color. Thanks, Brit. Yeah, I, it's not done yet. I'm still working on it, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of keratin... We gotta get back to, uh, gotta get back to our pangolins here. Um, super, super cool critters. Here we go. Um, let's try this one. Seem to be a particularly gassy baby. Oh. I think it was just he was, he was so greedy. He was very insistent from the get go. Very few baby penguins will actually allow themselves to be fed like that. Anywhere between three Pretty rare. Months. He would still be with his mom for a good six to eight months. 
Yeah. As strong as he was, you could see he was scared. It's this very trusting, despite this horrible trauma that he had gone through. There's Panglin coming off their legal trade. Panglins are the most illegally trafficked mammals in the world. Yeah. We do intelligence operations, retrieving them from the illegal wildlife trade. When I put my hands on the head, that's the signal. I recognize that voice. I've had eyes on the animal. It confirmed. It is downright scary. The evening before, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you're nauseous. That particular operation took two and a half hours for me to convince the suspect to show me the pangolin. These so this guy are used in cultural medicines. This guy works for the Pangolin Crisis Fund, or works with the Pangolin Crisis Fund at least. And that is an organization that I'm hoping if you, if your heart is touched by, by today's stream and you want to help these animals, there's a donate link right there, um, pangolincrisisfund.org. Um, I'm sure every dollar counts. Um, and this is this is the kind of thing that, that they work with, you know. The suspect to show me the pangolin. Yeah. These Empire Fate, go for it. Yeah. In cultural yeah. medicines in Asia, in particular China. Stevie was named after one of my team members that's been so loyal. It's quite a personal thing for me and very emotional to know that he's doing fantastic. The second or third day of us having him, I actually took him out for a walk. Panglins will ride on their mom's backs for quite a long time. Oh. Yeah, he adapted to that pose very well. He did love it quite a lot. It was always very easy to try experience new things and to be exposed to new things. And I put him into a termite mound and he spent nearly 45, 50 minutes in that termite mound just <laughs> feeding. <laughs> great to know that drive and that instinct to do what he needs to do naturally was there at some point during the walk you would experience a bit of stevie playtime <laughs> that for me was also a huge sign that he was getting comfortable for some reason he took to rocks he even used to have a rock that as one does i love rocks myself area in case he wanted to play uh -huh. he started to feed so much stronger he started to eat so much better kind of started to do that himself it's a very subtle thing i took him down to where he's doing his soft release process he just hit the ground running and he was ready to be a pangolin <laughs> i think him accepting me as his carer it's a privilege that i can never really describe i'm going to be forever grateful oh very cool such incredible animals you know Uh, here's a, a link to that video right here. Um, good stuff. So yeah, in uh, in case you just tuned in recently, we are celebrating World Pangolin Day right now. Uh, which is tomorrow, February 17th, but I wasn't planning on streaming tomorrow, so... Um, we're doing that now. Um, take a look at this. This curious creature looks like it's straight out of Jurassic Park. It is, however, no dinosaur. I don't know about that. This is a pangolin. Unlike yeah. the understanding of most dinosaurs, pangolins are shy, defenseless, and harmless. Yet they face a myriad of challenges. If more yeah. isn't done to protect it, the pangolin may well face the same fate as the dinosaurs. Cases that we have seen in the uh, recent past include mean they evolved a in nice birth. suitcase which you expect to be containing suits, clothes and dresses, and yet they are full of pangolin scales. We have also witnessed a case where a container which is uh, ready for shipment is packed with a uh, uh, pangolin, whole body of pangolin. They are frozen, they are dead, but um, Whole pangolin. Africa's pangolins are under threat oh. from the poaching and trafficking of the skilled animals to the Far East. So, World Pangolin Day on Saturday, February 18, is a chance for conservationists to highlight their plight. Recently, what we're doing today. There was a report that pangolin has got a virus that possibly is the, the progeny no to shame, the. No sign of disgrace or failure. 
In fact, in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. It's true. Uh, or they evolve into a different species. I don't know. That's actually something I would disagree about with, with Gould there. But uh, we do not want pangolins to go extinct on our watch. These are creatures that have been around for tens of millions of years. And every single existent species of pangolins, every single extant species, every species that's still around of pangolins, there's eight or nine of them today, they are all either endangered or critically endangered. And it's because of the greed and carelessness and selfishness of human beings. But we can do something about that. And that's that's what this stream today is about. Um, penguins might also be getting their, their revenge currently. Well, not really. But there is a chance that COVID-19 is the direct result of pangolin poaching. Which... Levy is going to talk about right here. ...to highlight their plight. Recently, in 2020, there was a report that pangolin has got a virus that possibly is the progeny to the COVID-19, and yeah. that turned people's thoughts about pangolin. If we don't do research and understand the background of such stories, we are unable to help bad media around pangolin, and that can add another threat to pangolin. So we may lose pangolin faster than we expected if we don't stop such media well, with, with facts. Yeah. Officials at the National Museums of Kenya say 120,000 kilograms of pangolins were exported from Africa between 2010 to 2014. People don't know what a pangolin is. So when they see yeah. a pangolin, they think it's something harmful or something poisonous or dangerous. So the first instinct of every human when they see something harmful is trying to kill it or eating it to get away from it or something like that. So that is a major thing that is going on. And also, it's not just only with local people, even uh, people from law enforcement that they don't know what this is, so they're not giving an issue concerning pangolin as much weight as it should have. There are eight different species of pangolins, all threatened with extinction. The International Union for Conservation has given them statuses ranging from vulnerable to the critically endangered. Yep. These are creatures that are very much misunderstood and largely unknown by most members of the public. Um, in fact, I, I kind of want to run a quick poll here. Well, maybe we'll do that after we get a big raid. Maybe we'll do a poll. Um, but yeah, here, take a look at, at this video here. I, this just popped up too, and it looks like this is going to be another one of these news reports. Um, from uh from Africa NTVU NTV Uganda is I guess the uh, the station here let's take a look they put in um, sort of a wood glue in 2019 uh. the Uganda Revenue Authority seized the consignment of 3.2 tons of elephant ivory and over 400 kilograms of pangolin scales uh. being trafficked by Vietnamese nationals pangolins are among the top 10 most trafficked species with others being rhinos lions chimpanzees among others it's estimated that um, for instance between 20, 2000 and 2013 over 1 million pangolins were trafficked so biodiversity alliance so far has rescued 120 pangolins since 2018. Several factors are fueling the trafficking of the mammals, including oh. beliefs in the tradition medicinal capacity contained in wildlife extracts. It's especially in Asian countries and specifically China, where they believe uh, pangolin meat, if you eat it, maybe it will improve lactation in mothers. You drink the soup, it will increase lactation in mothers. It will uh, help men to be more, uh, uh, it will improve male vitality. Out of the eight species of pangolins None of that has in the any world, basis in Uganda fact. has three of the four species found in Africa. These, yeah. like every other creatures, have great ecological importance. Gardeners of the forest or of the, the lands because they, you know, with their claws, they move the soil, they eat it's estimated about 15,000 ants and termites. So it's a good insecticide, an organic, natural insecticide. It doesn't cost money. 
while pangolins are protected by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild, Fauna and Flora, and with the highest level of protection and ascites, illegal trade in them continues, rather unabated. There are issues of accountability, transparency, corruption within our legal systems. Even when the culprits are, are arrested, in some instances, it takes so long to bring these culprits to book. Sometimes exhibits even get lost. The conservationists now give tips on what needs to be done to protect the endangered species. We need to reduce corruption. We need to create more transparency, have our values put in place. Systematic corruption is yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, For instance, we need real campaigns that are going to hold our own governments accountable so that wildlife gets the right justice. Yeah. We need to reduce the de to deal with the demand, especially in those countries which are importing uh, these pangolin scales and other wildlife products used in traditional medicine. Meanwhile, government, through the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, remains committed to protecting all the country's wildlife and is optimistic that the new Wildlife Act 2019 will go a long way in addressing wildlife crimes. Let's Benjamin so. Jumbe. NTV. Good stuff. Uh, here's a link to that video right there. Let's give that a thumbs up also. Nope. And um oh and thank you, Trek Morticia. Okay. Good stream from everyone and thank you, Danny, for spreading awareness about this. Of course, Trek Morticia. Thank you for being here. Um yeah, there's, there's definitely... And this is some harrowing stuff. So I, I respect that that's... be a little dramatic. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. Um... There are... good, passionate hard-working, caring people who are doing their utmost to save these animals, though. And that's, again, what we're trying to do on this stream as well. If you type in exclamation mark pangolin at any time during this stream, you'll see a link there to the Pangolin Crisis Fund. And I'll show you a little video from them right here. This is a pangolin. While the scale-covered pangolin may look like a little dragon, they're actually more closely related to dogs and cats than to any lizard. Or pangolins other mammals, yeah. Pangolins are nature's gardeners. Yeah. They keep ecosystems balanced and insect populations in check. Gentle by nature, pangolins roll into an armored ball when threatened, a defensive maneuver that has protected them from natural predators for millions of years. Yep. But now that life-saving adaptation has left them vulnerable to poachers who can yeah. easily scoop them from the forest floor and into the black market. Pangolins are the most illegally trafficked mammals on earth. Their meat is eaten as a delicacy in Asia while their scales are used in traditional medicines. Which is neither traditional nor is it medicine. I want to make that very, very clear during this. It, it's just keratin. You might as well be grinding up toenails and, and making them into a soup or putting them in your tea, you know? It, this is why science education is so important, you know, so that people can be inoculated against stupid ideas like that. What do you mean by it's not traditional? It hasn't been used for thousands of years. People in China have not been not been importing pangolin scales from Africa for thousands of years, you know? In fact, a lot of this goes back to, like, the Cultural Revolution in China and, and Mao's country doctors and all that. There's... Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link if you're curious. Um, let's see. Yeah, the secret history of Chinese medicine. Um, there you go. Um, secret history. It makes it sound like it's some sort of conspiratorial thing or something. It's not. Like, this is 
it's just history. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, traffic's uh, sure, Alex Dixon, sure, but we're, um, yeah, I've also got, you know, exclamation mark, Pangolin. There is the Pangolin Crisis Fund, which, uh, which we're trying to support today. And I'll be making a donation toward the end of the stream. But yeah, Mao did actually push superstition as medical policy. Well, kind of. The thing is, when, during the, like, Great Leap Forward, uh, Mao Zedong was, was trying to modernize China, but they just didn't have enough doctors. And so there is this book that they printed and gave out to people in the Chinese countryside, um, where, like, the first half of it or whatever is, like, actual medical remedies, and it's like a handbook for people who have medical training or medical supplies. But in a lot of these rural villages way out in the middle of nowhere, they didn't have any medical supplies, let alone medical training or anything like that. All they had was, like, herbs and crud. And so basically the second half of the book is like, okay, if you don't have actual medicine, here's some placebo stuff that like hopefully might help a little bit. I don't know. Like, oh. And when this book was reproduced, especially in the 1970s, like after President Nixon visited China and there's like all of this craze about Chinese culture in, in American society and it's all, you know, plastic wrapped and, and bought and sold, you know, for, like, American consumption. It's not real. They only had the first part of the, They only had the second part of the book that they reproduced for American audiences. It was translated in, into English, and it was only the second part with all of the, like, mystical nonsense. They didn't actually have the practical advice about how to treat people in a Chinese village using actual medicine. And so I think in the West, we have kind of a racist view of, like, you know, like, oh, well, Chinese medicine is all this, you know, traditional, you know, acupuncture and, you know, squeezing bugs to get their juice and, you know, uh, you know, stuff like this. And it's like, that's not how medicine works in China. It's not. They have actual doctors in China. And in China, people actually get proper medical care. The, like, traditional stuff is not actually traditional. Like, not really. It basically comes from the 1950s and was bought and sold to Americans later, you know. Yeah, we're not going to get into that too much right now. But yeah, yeah. Because the second part could be commercialized. Exactly, Azura. Exactly. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. They actually have rather good health care in China. Better than the U.S. for the vast majority of people. You know? I personally know people who have died here in the U.S. because they didn't have health insurance. And, like, they just couldn't get treatment. In the wealthiest country in the world. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but Gertis Pucka says, in German, pangolins are called Schuppentier. Schuppentier? Scale animal, or Tannenzapfentier, pine cone animal. Yes, German is very descriptive. I love that, Gertis Pucka. I love that. That's like, I've heard that in, um, here in the U.S., in Texas in particular, there are a bunch of German immigrants to Texas at some point, and those German immigrants encountered armadillos for the first time. And they didn't have a German word for armadillo, because these are a new world animal. They don't have them in Germany. And so what did they call them? They called them Panzerschwein. <laughs> Panzerschwein, which means armored pig. <laughs> what a delightful language. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 Lady Dennis says, we have a huge German culture here. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, German, Mexican, and Czech. A Czech. That's interesting. I mean, Mexican makes sense. German, I've heard of. I've never heard of Czech. Yeah. But, 
yeah, yeah. Um, shoot, what was it? Uh, what were the German ner German words for pangolin? Um, Schuppentier, scale animal, or Tannenzapfentier, pine cone animal. Tannenzapfentier. Is so tier must be animal, huh? That's cool. That's cool. Panzer Schwein is my new favorite word. <laughs> Good job. Uh, it almost sounds like you hear somebody, you know, you would hear one of the background bad guys yelling that at Indiana Jones during one of those movies or something. It would just be like, you barely hear it in the background. Yeah. And the Irish is Pengain. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. We called our armored transporters Panzer Panzer Is that re really a trooper? Interesting. Like a like an armored personnel carrier? We call those APCs in the US. Armored personnel carrier. It's the official name. I'm sure they had all kinds of colorful nicknames too. Panzer Schwein sounds like a nickname for that. That's cool. And in Polish it's uh, Vuskovets, husk animal. Very cool. Very cool. Um, neat critters. Very neat critters. Uh, let's, uh, oh, okay, let's, let's get back to this video about, about pangolins. Pangolins are the most illegally trafficked mammals on Earth. Uh, their meat is eaten as a delicacy in Asia, while their scales are used in traditional medicines, alongside rhino horn and tiger parts. As a result, all eight species of pangolins are threatened with extinction. Recently, there was a ninth species of the pangolin infant? described. Oh. The adult. Ontogeny. Azanku. I do too, Hazanku. You are here on the right day. Thank you, thank you for the 23 months of support. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And Cliff Alistair McLean says, I've never heard the word Panzerschwein referred to an animal. I think that's a myth. Oh, it could be. It could be. It's such a wonderful story that I could see why it would catch on, but do, 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 have... Uh, Texans of, of German descent not referred to armadillos as, as Panzerschwein? Because that's what I always heard, is that German immigrants from Texas called armadillos Panzerschwein. But yeah. Yeah. And Le Petit says, like, for the royal elite, everything exotic was a delicacy. I know, right? Including peasant children and stuff like that. Yeah. Do pangolins roll into balls and roll downhill? They don't I don't know how often they live near hills, but they do definitely roll into a ball, Florendon, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And pangolin yeah. trafficking threatens human health, as wildlife consumption can transmit diseases like COVID-19. Yeah, that's where COVID-19 came from. The illegal pangolin trade must be eliminated if these from bats, maybe from pangolins also. And if future wildlife-related pandemics are to be prevented. Yeah. This is possible if pangolin conservation, long underfunded and under-resourced, is given proper support. This is the strategy of the Pangolin Crisis Fund. Which is our cause for today. If you type an exclamation mark pangolin into chat, you get a link to the Pangolin Crisis Fund and you can donate there. And I'll be donating toward the end of this stream today. Uh. Created by the Wildlife Conservation Network and Save Pangolins. The Pangolin Crisis Fund has one goal, to save pangolins from extinction. The Pangolin Crisis Fund sends 100% of every dollar donated directly to the most innovative and effective methods of saving pangolins across their entire range in Africa and Asia. We also invest in campaigns to raise awareness and rally support for the protection of these little known creatures. <laughs> Was that was that Jackie Chan there? Not here. Protection of these little known. Oh, I remember this. I remember seeing subway ads for this, like ads on on the on the train, um, with uh with Jackie Chan like posing in a, you know, like going like this, and there's a pangolin on his shoulder. Oh, I've seen this before. Um. 
Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yes! Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um. Yeah. It takes just one move to protect pangolins. Oh, I love that. I love that. And is there is that a link to it there, Claire? Um. <laughs> up to now, penguin only defense from poachers was to roll up into a ball. But now all species are protected by law. <laughs> so please, never buy penguin meat or spill. When the buying stop, the killing can too. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Here's the link to that video too. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, every story I've ever heard of Jackie Chan makes him seem like a really cool guy. And I feel that twice as much now. Good for him. What a champ. I know, right, Dame Karen? Yeah. Um, awesome. Awesome. Oh yeah, back to, back to here. The Pangolin Crisis Fund sends 100% of every dollar donated directly to the most innovative and effective methods of saving pangolins across their entire range in Africa and Asia. We also invest in campaigns to raise awareness and rally support for the protection of these little-known creatures. Oh. But saving a species cannot be accomplished by any single organization working alone. Right. That's why the Pangolin Crisis Fund is committed to bringing the conservation community together to change the fate of these endangered animals. Because the future of pangolins hasn't been decided yet. Yep. There's still time to change the course of history, to outwit poachers, outgrow tradition, and outrun extinction. Please join us and support the Pangolin Crisis Fund today. Together, we can save these unique animals. Yeah. So our our link in the pangolin command goes directly to that site there. And again, I'll be making a donation toward the end of today's stream too. Really cool animals. Let's talk a little bit more about their biology. Let's talk about them as animals here. We've got an animalogic video with Danielle Dufo. She always does great stuff. Um, so let's take a look at that. This is the pangolin, an incredible eater of ants covered head to toe in scales. I'll be right and back. I got to run to the, the bathroom. Most heavily poached animal in the world. Oh boy. Hi, I'm Danielle Dufo, and you're watching Animal Logic. Pangolins look like the offspring of an anteater and a pinecone. And until pretty recently, they were placed in the same order as anteaters, Xenarthra. But new research has placed them in their own family, Manidae. Their closest known relatives on the evolutionary branch are now believed to be carnivora. There are eight different species of pangolin, four in Asia and four in Africa. Depending on the species, they're either arboreal and living in trees, or ground dwelling and living in burrows, which can be up to 40 meters long and five meters below the ground. Pangolins vary in size as well, the smallest being the long-tailed pangolin, whose body is roughly 30 centimeters long, and the largest being the aptly named giant pangolin, whose body is 1.8 meters long. They are covered head to toe in beautiful, defensive scales, which look a lot like scale armor. In fact, King George III was presented with a suit of armor made of pangolin scales in 1820. 
Pangolin scales are very similar to reptile scales, as they're both made up of keratin, the same stuff that our fingernails are made out of. In fact, pangolins are the only known mammals to have scales at all. Their scales, which overlap each other, are fantastic for warding off ant and termite bites. As well, when attacked by predators like lions or hyenas, the pangolin will curl up into a ball, tucking their head under their armored tail, leaving them virtually impenetrable. Not only do their scales make it near impossible for- You, you gross. Oh, this is the... Some brainless monarch had arm- Yeah, yeah. That's probably what you're reacting to, right? Yeah. Confuse a leopard, says Golgonek. Yeah, and lions too. Lions and leopards are, are, they can't crack that armor. I'll show you a video in a little bit of a lion trying to eat, a group of lions trying to eat a, an African giant ground pangolin. And they're just, they're lion proof. It's amazing. For them to be chewed on by lions, but the edges of their scales can be very sharp, making yeah. them even less appealing as an afternoon snack. However, if a pangolin is caught before it's had a chance to roll up, it will defend itself by thrashing its long, muscular tail back and forth, cutting its attacker with its sharp scales. The diet of huh. pangolins consists almost exclusively of ants and termites. Yeah. And like anteaters, they have a very long and sticky tongue which they use to grab and eat their meals. Depending on the species, a pangolin's tongue can be longer than its body, and unlike our tongue, the pangolin's tongue is rooted down close to their abdomen. In order to keep their tongue sticky, they have an overactive salivary gland which is constantly lubricating their tongue. Their scales huh. aren't their only defense from attacking ants. Their eyelids are incredibly thick, and they can constrict their ears and nostrils to prevent ants and termites from entering. Not Very only that, cool. but pangolins don't have teeth. I, I bet you most of, most of you in chat can't do that. You can't close your, your ears and nostrils to keep ants and termites out. Wouldn't that be wonderful if you could, though? You would never again have to worry about ants and termites going into your ears to lay their eggs in your brain, you know? Um... And also, I bet most of you have more teeth than, uh, than pangolins do. Ants and termites from entering. Not only that, but pangolins don't have teeth. Instead, yeah. they have very muscular stomachs that are lined <laughs> with keratinous spines, which they use to break down the prey that they eat live. Kind of like the sarlacc pit. They will also <laughs> swallow small rocks called gastroliths, which, in combination with their unusual stomachs, help mash and grind down the ants and termites that the pangolin swallows. In order to find their meal... Beats International says, I wasn't worried about that until now. <laughs> uh, don't be worried about... I think there's only a few thousand Americans every year who uh, end up having ants crawl through their ears and lay their eggs in their brains, you know? Statistically, it's a very, very slim chance. <laughs> Uh, honestly, <laughs> why would you say this? I've never actually heard of it happening. It's not to anyone I know. ...which are typically located in the ground, <laughs> in hills, or in mounds, pangolins have huge claws uh. designed for digging. The claws are curved and are perfect for breaking through termite mounds, digging up ants, prying open rocks, and reportedly even digging through concrete. Also, yeah. arboreal pangolins have a prehensile tail, which they use for gripping branches when climbing up and down very trees. Very cool. Oh. I bet very few of you in chat have a, a fully prehensile tail. How cool is this animal? You know? Yeah, Danny, your tail. I'm sorry, Dave Karen. <laughs> <laughs> prehensile tail, which they use uh, for gripping branches when climbing up and down trees. Other than their scales, probably everyone's favorite thing about the pangolin is the fact that they're bipedal. <laughs> and thus, look how- Yeah, dating with the chat shaming- I mean, get on it, chat! Where are your prehensile tails? Or your closable ears? Or, uh, or your claws that can reportedly dig through concrete? You know? Get on their level! Pangolins! Pretty cool. Yeah, a, a belt hanging out of half of your loops. That's almost as good in jet fuel. Did you did you get dressed in the dark this morning? I do that sometimes. Sometimes I'll I'll miss a belt loop with my belt. You know, yeah. 
Um, Alzura, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll continue. It's hilarious when they walk, kind of like a T-Rex. They do this because their front legs, while adept at digging... See, I'm, as a dinosaur paleontologist, I don't think they walk like a T-Rex. I think... Kind of like a T-Rex. I, I think they walk kind of like, um... Kind of like... Mr. Burns. Um... Yeah, I think... I think this is kind of what they look like. Um... Yeah, there's the Simpsons character and his real-life counterpart. Um... Yeah, pangolins are a lot nicer, though. They do this because their front legs, while adept at digging, aren't as good at walking. Though they are yeah. what's called facultative bipeds, yep. meaning they aren't exclusively bipedal and do spend the majority of their time on all fours. Pangolins are very solitary animals. And, and that, that's such a wild thing, too, that they can... Oh, it's fair, Dinosaur Day, fair. Um... The only reason that they could, like, they, they look like they'd be very unbalanced walking on two legs like this, but they have such a big, thick, heavy tail that it counterbalances them. So they're able to walk on two legs even though it looks like it shouldn't be possible. And it's because that tail counterbalances called them. facultative bipeds, meaning they aren't exclusively and they go bipedal chappy, yeah. and do yeah. spend the majority of their time on all fours. Rachidactylus says, I walk hunched over like that when I'm super tired. Do you also have a, a thick, muscular tail, Rachidactylus? <laughs> Covered in scaly armor? Aren't as good at walking, though they are I presume you don't. facultative bipeds, meaning they aren't exclusively bipedal <laughs> and do spend the majority of their time on all fours. And Azura says, so does that mean that pangolins with smaller tails don't walk on two legs as much? Yes. In fact, I think there's only one species of pangolin that does walk on on two legs like this and i think it's only this one the african giant pangolin um here google images is what i'm gonna do um pangolin species poster let's try yeah i think not totally sure but i think that the giant ground pangolin is the only one who walks on two legs. It could be the Indian pangolin does too, but I think most of these guys will walk on four legs, um, even on the ground, I think. I assume I, no, I don't. Fair, Rachidactylus, appreciate your modesty. <laughs> um, yeah, here let's uh, let's try and find video of an Indian pangolin. Yeah. Um. Here. It's 4 a.m. Oh, and shoot, we gotta since this is a National Geographic video, we gotta protect ourselves from being copyright nuked when the vod goes up on YouTube. Uh-oh. Rico, Rico, yeah. Oh. Yeah. That looks a lot like the... That looks a lot like the African ground pangolin, and that makes me want to, to see if they are closely allied on, uh, on the Tree of Life. Let's go to Folodota, the pangolins. Manidae is the family. There we go. Pangolins. The infant. The adult. Ontogeny. 
Neolithic Fool, thank you for the 23 months. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have your happy World Pangolin Day, which is tomorrow. How are you celebrating, Neolithic? How are you celebrating World Pangolin Day tomorrow? I, uh... Well, you're already ahead of the game watching this stream. I can tell you that. So, we've got the... Uh, Temminx Ground Pangolin, which is also the African Ground Pangolin. African Giant Pangolin, too. It's got a bunch of different common names. And the Tree Pangolin are here. Oh, wait, no, hang on. Giant Ground Pangolin here. Manus Gigantia. I guess they're different? And the Long-Tailed Pangolin. The Indian Pangolin is here next to the Chinese Pangolin? I guess they're... I would expect this guy to be closely allied with the African giant pangolin, but maybe not. Maybe not. Its ancestors live in the shadow. Yeah. Pangolin cake? I like that. <laughs> I appreciate that so much, Claire. Holy cow. Wow. See, I I bet half of you in chat don't even eat 600 grams of ants and termites every day. Get on their level, chat. <laughs> I rarely do I eat that many ants in a single day, you know? You're cutting down Patrick Crusader. Well, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Alzura says, are you going to shame us for every pangolin shortcoming? They're not, they're not pangolin shortcomings, Alzura. That's my, that's my point. <laughs> These aren't the pangolins shortcomings. <laughs> and Fiery Fae, yeah, yeah. Huh. Only four or five species of ants? So that, that's kind of nuts. They're, they're almost like um, pandas, where pandas will only eat a few species of bamboo. Um, but yeah, yeah. You just absorb the ants directly through your brain tissues. <laughs> it's one way to do it, Dame Karen. Yeah, yeah. I came here for edutainment <laughs> with self-esteem issues. I hope, I hope you're not being earnest right now, Alzora, because you are wonderful, and I, I'm only trying to to add some levity to the a subject matter which can be a little bit you know uh a little bit dire when we're talking about these these incredible animals that are all at risk of going completely extinct because of human selfishness and greed and ignorance um but yeah yeah Ugh. And, again, there's what the world actually looks like, more or less. I gotta reverse the footage for YouTube, you know, for when these VODs go up on YouTube. But, um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and going to here in the United States, where is that? Is that Oklahoma or Nebraska? I'm going to crack down. Kansas, says Claire Burr. They think they can win the Super Bowl. and Did they actually win? I don't even know. I didn't, I didn't watch. Um, they think they can be in the, in the Super Bowl and then, and then... Yeah. Although Kansas City, strictly speaking, that's Kansas City, Missouri, I think. There's a Kansas City, Missouri, and a Kansas City, Kansas, uh, on either sides of the, the Mississippi River. The of this flying monster would have been about 15 and one half meters. Uh, thank you, thank you for the 15 months of support. I really appreciate that. Um, 
Thank you, thank you, Mudman. For those 15 months of support, I, that makes me feel almost as good as, um, as Taylor Swift herself when she, uh, caught the winning pass in the end zone at the Super Bowl and won it for the, um, Santa Clara 49ers. You know? I, pr I appreciate that, Mudman. Holy cow. Got that 15 month ring there. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Yeah. Mommy does this. A lot of states have garbage exotic regulations. I swear I've seen pangolin scales in Chinatown in San Francisco. Like, not a joke. Um, yeah. And as your fire, thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. I'll see you later. See, this stuff is not as as well policed or well regulated as it should be. These like it like now is the time to, to crack down on this. These animals will go extinct unless we can do something about this. Unless the organizations pushing for their conservation and protection get some serious help, we will lose pangolins entirely. I know I know I was joking about this, but this is serious stuff, you know? Yeah. Oh boy. Not one of the most ancient, but it is cool. Just two? Yeah. Good stuff. Um, here's a link to that video there. And there, you like the music game, Karen? Yeah. Put it since I thought they were extinct. No. There are currently eight or nine species of pangolin, depending on whom you ask. Um, in the world today, and they are all either endangered or critically endangered. Pangolins. This says eight species here. Um, but yeah, the Chinese pangolin, critically endangered. The Indian pangolin, endangered. The Philippine pangolin, critically endangered. The Sunda pangolin, critically endangered. Um, and these ones are, according to this, not even evaluated, but they are also endangered, as far as I know. Oh, boy. Yeah. And it's just character- exactly, Miss Yvette, exactly. Yeah. Makes me wonder what his thoughts are on animal extinction. Who- whose thoughts? My thoughts, Pooter K? Extinction should be one of those things that is, like, crazy rare. Um, I'm personally not one of these people who talks about background extinction rates. I'm not personally convinced that background extinction rates are even a thing. Uh, there's a cool paper about this, actually. So-called background extinction rate is a sampling artifact. I think this author has a point here. Um, extinction happens when when. I can see that my uh, fifty thousand a year has been well spent. Tragune. Kepper M M N Kepper Kepper, thank you, thank you for those ten months of support. Holy cow, that is superb, and I really appreciate it. Holy cow, thank you, thank you for that. Fantastic. At, at tier three. Ten months now at tier three, Kepper. Thank you for helping support my mission of science outreach and education. It's... I appreciate you. I really do. Um, and Jody Fish, holy moly! 
Thank you for those 10 gift subs, Jody Fish. Look at this lovely Tinamu bird. You're so happy about those 10 gift subs. Very, very happy. Listen to it call out, enjoy. Or, uh oh. Oh no. Oh shoot. Jody Fish is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Holy cow, Jody Fish. Thank you. Thank you for that. Extraordinary. I appreciate that, Jody Fish. Don't worry about the Tinamu. I'm sure he'll be fine. Um, good stuff, Jody Fish. Good stuff. And they're not anywhere close to endangered. They're very common, as far as I know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. There are 10 people in the chat who won't have to worry about any ads for the next month, Jody Fish. It's going to take us halfway into March before they have to see a single ad on this channel, and that's thanks to you. Appreciate your generosity there, Jody Fish. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, he does that when he gets hangry. There you go. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so extinction is is a tragedy, especially when it's when it's when it's done by humans. We are the reason. We as human beings, collectively, are the reason why the eight living pangolin species are at risk of extinction. And and that kind of well, well, yeah. We'll be talking about that a little more in a bit. But these remarkable animals are incredibly persecuted by, by people. It's it's such a shame. They aren't exclusively bipedal and do spend the majority of their time on all fours. Pangolins are very solitary animals and will only interact when courting and mating. Males, which are 50% heavier than females, won't <gasps> seek out a female. Instead, they'll mark their territory with urine or feces, and the female will come to them. In competition, wow. males will vie for the female's attention by fighting each other with their massive, sharp tails. The mating hmm. period lasts from three to five days, and the gestation varies by species. From the shortest, 65 days for an Indian pangolin, to the longest, 372 days for the Chinese pangolin. Though that number does vary depending which study you read. Baby ground- I'm sorry, what? From three to five days, and the gestation varies by species. From the shortest, 65 days for an Indian pangolin. Only 65 days gestation. That's like a two-month pregnancy. That's so fast. To the longest, 372 days for the Chinese pangolin. So, like, more than a year for the Chinese pangolin. Oh, boy. And that's in one of the countries where pangolins are just slaughtered wholesale. And they've got the longest gestation period there. Oh boy. Yeah. Though that number does vary depending which study you read. Baby huh. ground dwelling pangolins will sting in the burrow for about a month while their soft scales harden. After which they'll emerge and ride around on mom's tail. Staying with her for about two years, back. all the while yeah. learning how to do pangolin things. Pangolins don't reproduce well in captivity, or do well at anything in captivity, to be honest. Yeah. As they've been described as the hardest animal in the world to captive raise. Which is oh. really unfortunate, because pangolins are the most poached animal in the world. They're so and I don't know if they're the hardest animal in the world to captive raise. Like, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit, because I don't think anybody's been able to captive raise, I don't know, blue whales? I've never seen footage of blue whales in somebody's house knocking over their laundry baskets or stuff like that, like we saw with the pangolin earlier. Yeah, great whites don't last long in aquariums at all, but at least they've been held there. No one's ever done it with a blue whale, Anita. The San Diego Zoo has one? Has a blue whale? I don't think so, Miss Yvette. I don't think so. <laughs> no, you mean a pangolin, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Um... And, uh, Zenodo98, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Did, did you follow earlier during, uh, during Hassan's stream? It's good to have you here, Zenodo. You did. Wonderful to have you here. Welcome 
It's a paleontologizer. Um, we've not gotten a big raid so far in this stream, which is a little odd, or I'd play you a welcome video to introduce you, but it's about time I do that anyway, I suppose. We've got new folks in the chat. I'll just introduce myself real quick. We'll play a welcome video if we get a big raid, but my name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Um, as a paleontologist, I study fossils. As a dinosaur paleontologist... I study dinosaur fossils. Dinosaurs are what I work on, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and what I dig up during the summers. This past summer, we were out in the field digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and Utah. At least three new species last year. And I was live streaming as often as I could. Story, so we'll get Riggs did Riggs in like 1903. Like... Yeah. Get back into the quarry over here. Um, there we go. This is one of those bots that's now up on YouTube. We've been really looking forward to doing that again this next summer. There we go. Yeah. Right now, there's snow all over the ground here in Utah now, so I can't stream here now. That did it. But we'll wait till it warms up. Probably July. I'll be out here in August. Or in, out here in Utah. There we go. Let me know July if you can through see August. and or hear me. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, all right. Well, hello, hello, everybody. And welcome back to Paleontologizing. Uh, we're going to have a really fun stream today, so I hope you're ready for it. And Jody Fish. Welcome awesome. Welcome once again to the desert of <laughs> eastern Utah. Out here, kind of near the town of Moab, if you know where that is. And we're out digging dinosaurs right now and streaming it. Uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I already said all this. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils to learn about the history of life on Earth. I study dinosaur fossils in particular, and that's exactly what we're digging up here with the Utah Geological Survey. Um... Anyway, yeah. So, this was a, a wonderful opportunity to do some, like, science outreach that was fairly unique. Yeah. Yeah. Show people, not just tell people how fossil science works, but to show them firsthand. Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and, and Utah. You know, for the Northern Hemisphere, that's where you study it. Because even in China, the record across that boundary is, you know. Where in Spain? Uh, well, in Portugal. Anyway, um, but today, it's World Pangolin Day. And so we are talking about these remarkable animals. Pangolins. They are just amazing creatures. Very charismatic. Very cute very, very in danger of extinction because of human exploitation. There are currently eight or nine species of pangolin alive in the world. All of them are at risk of extinction. Um, largely because wealthy people pay tremendous amounts of money for their scales and also for their flesh. Because, I don't know. There seems to be, like, a positive correlation between being wealthy and being very superstitious and, like, just exploitation in general, I guess. Anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll be talking about that. There's also a chance that the whole COVID-19 pandemic is a direct result of the exploitation of these animals. We know that, that COVID-19 came from a wild animal source because of like wild animal poaching in Wuhan and China um, there have been coronaviruses extremely similar to COVID-19 that have been found in pangolins and COVID-19 it, it matches very very closely with, with certain viruses found in horseshoe bats and also in pangolins and it could be that some like it may have jumped from a, pang a horseshoe bat to a pangolin and then to humans we're still kind of figuring that out um 
someday hopefully we'll know the the complete picture of that but right now it's it's still a little mysterious but the point stands that pangolin populations harbor different coronaviruses which can jump to humans and so one of the reasons to leave these animals alone and just let them thrive in their natural habitat and not continuously poach them for their scales and their flesh one of the reasons to, to just let them be is so that we don't have any more global pandemics that kill millions of people, you know? So, yeah. No, horseshoe bat, Bahasmancer, horseshoe bat. Yeah. And DC Venue Today, yes, I, uh, I did an interview with Brian Curtis just a few months ago on, on Paleo Portals. Uh, DC, yes indeed. Um, we're gonna be having Brian Curtis on here as an interviewee before too long. Yeah, Brian's a good guy. Um, I wonder if he has that interview up on YouTube yet. Paleo portals... Um, from fossil crates. Let's see... I don't know if he has that up yet. He says he'll, he'll post that... That interview, after a little while, it's going to be paywalled for a bit. Just because he's got a... Yeah, yeah. But, um... Anyway, yeah. DC? He's working with my nephew and took him through his museum in Phoenix yesterday. Very cool, DC. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, we were, uh... I think we met for the second or third time. First time I really knew who he was, though, was this summer. In, uh, in Salt Lake City at the... The Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference. MTE 14 that I presented at. I was doing some work on armored dinosaurs and kylosaurs. And uh, there's the photo I was looking for. Yeah. So here's Jim Kirkland, Utah State Paleontologist. And there's Brian Curtis right there next to him. In the blue shirt. Brian Curtis. And there's me right there. Yeah. This was uh, this is a wonderful conference. Thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, and there will be several people from this conference who show up as interviewees on this channel in the near future. Um, very excited about that. Yeah, here's Rebecca Hunt Foster, whom we uh, we interviewed. She was our first ever interviewee on Paleontologize a couple years ago. Um, there's Nick Longrich. He was in the field with me this summer. Um, we were talking about him on Balint stream just the other day, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, bunch of cool people here. This is a great conference. So anyway, it's a small world in in vertebrate paleontology. DC, so I'm, I'm glad you're here, and that's really cool that your nephew is into paleontology. And I heard he has done some work out your way, too? Out in California, DC? Huh. Yeah. Um... I know this wasn't 2014, Patrick Crusader. This was this year. MTE 14. It's the 14th uh, Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference in 2023. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, back in 2014, I didn't have a beard yet. Um, but I can maybe show you a photo of me in 2014 at a different conference. Also in Utah. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> uh, this is the mid Mesozoic meeting, well, on the way to the mid Mesozoic meeting in 2014. Yeah. Um, me at Dinosaur National Monument. With the uh, stegosaurus there. 
there's Jim Kirkland. Explaining some of the geology near the Crystal Geyser Quarry, I believe. Where Falcarius is from. Here's me with a sauropod femur. Uh, sauropod researchers Carrie Woodruff and Matt Wadle. And we've just broken a sauropod bone there. What a shame that was already broken. <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, there's me and a Ceratopsian dinosaur. That's Utah Ceratops, I believe. Anyway, good stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, oh, very cool, DC. Well, that's awesome that your nephew's really into, uh, into fossil science. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. Kids who are really intensely interested in dinosaurs or, or other academic topics like that. It's like, a, it's a good sign that like, A, they're pretty smart, B, they're pretty driven, C, they'll probably be fairly successful in life, you know? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Today we're talking about pangolins. And so let's continue this video here about pangolins. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Pangolins don't reproduce well in captivity, or do well at anything in captivity, to be honest, as they've been described as the hardest animal in the world to captive raise. Which is really unfortunate, because pangolins are the most poached animal in the world. They're sold predominantly for their scales, for use in traditional Asian medicine, and their meat is considered a delicacy. Over a million pangolins have been illegally bought and sold in the past 10 years alone. Uh. And that's crazy, because most people don't even know what a pangolin is. So please, yeah. go tell your friends about these amazing animals. Or, you know, send them a link to this video. Because pangolins are amazing. What animal should I check out next? Please let me know in the comments. Be sure to subscribe. Yeah, good stuff. Here's a link to this video. Animalogic, Danielle Dufo always does really excellent work. Um, pangolins. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, now, In talking about COVID-19, well, here, let's take a look at this. Uh, it'd help if I turn the sound on, huh? Let's try that. The animal suspected of transmitting the coronavirus to humans faces an even greater threat, extinction. Today on what is World Pangolin Day, Tom Hansen in Chicago has more on the troubled creature. At the Brookfield Zoo just outside Chicago, scientists are working around the clock to save some of the most vulnerable creatures on the planet. Meet Biggie, one of 11 white-bellied tree pangolins living here. The pangolin has spent most of its existence in obscurity, but after a group of Chinese scientists recently labeled them as the potential transmitter of the novel coronavirus, now it's at the center of a PR nightmare. What they found was a coronavirus that was very... And, and... This almost sounds like it's their, it almost makes it sound like it's their fault. Like, oh yeah, well, humans got it because a pangolin bit somebody. No. There are no pangolins native to, to Wuhan in, in China. These animals were torn from their homes, illegally smuggled to Wuhan, to a wet market there. We know that there were pangolins there. And this is the thing is that maybe we'll talk a little bit about, well, maybe we'll watch this video first and then we'll talk a little bit about um, zoonotic transfer of diseases because it's, it's harrowing stuff and it's not the animal's fault. Oh boy. It's Chuck. Chuck. It's Marvin. And you know, Hugin. Marvin Barry. Thank you you know that new sound you're looking for? Yeah. Good 
stuff, Hugin. Good stuff. I appreciate that, Hugin. How did your stream go? I hope it was real good. Good to have you here. Now, um... It is time for Metazoo, isn't it, Jody Fish? Let's do Metazoo here real quick. Just as soon as it's refreshed. We've got a brand new animal for today. Let's try and guess what it is. This is a guessing game a lot like Wordle, if you're familiar with that game. Except we have to try and guess what the animal of the day is. So you type a, an animal into here. And this will show you the the most exclusive clade, the most exclusive evolutionary group that includes both your animal and the mystery animal of the day. And so for us right here, I would say give me the name of a placental mammal, and everybody's going to say pangolin. But pangolins are not actually going to be the best guess for this. Jody Fish says antelope. That's a good one. We want a placental mammal that's part of a larger clade. Folodota. Um, they do have pangolin. But um, let's try antelope for this. That's an artiodactyl. It's a good place to start. And Oh, no. Okay, okay. Excellent. Well, it's not a mammal. Amniota is the most exclusive group that includes our mystery animal and our guest antelope. So let's look up uh, amniotes here. Amniotes are tetrapods uh, exclusive of amphibians. So we've got lung fishes and tetrapods. Lobe fin fishes including tetrapods. Tetrapods and then amniotes. So these are vertebrate animals that lay eggs on land. So not not amphibians that have to lay their eggs in the water. Or they have like jelly-like eggs. These are animals with an amniotic egg that actually has an amnion and everything. It's self-contained. It, it can survive in the dry. It doesn't have to stay moist, those eggs. Amniotes. And so we know it's not a mammal. So we can... We can Eliminate 5,000 species right there. Our mystery animal is not a mammal today. Because it, we guessed a mammal, and it says, Nope, amniota, not mammalia. So it's got to be a sauropsid. These are reptiles. Which includes birds, too. Birds are a kind of reptile, because birds evolved from dinosaurs, as we were discussing earlier. Yeah. So, sauropsids. Um, it could either be... An Archeliosaur over here, birds, turtles, and crocs. Or it could be a Squamate, or a Lepidosaur, rather. It's probably not a Tuatara, so it would probably be a Squamate. Give me, give me the name of a bird or a crocodilian or a turtle, chat. Let's see if we can knock this out. Um, Egret, says Jody Fish. They don't have egret. Um, Gariel. They don't have Gariel either. Shoot. Leatherback sea turtle. They don't have that either, Mayor Space. Emu. They do have emu, but... Okay, we can try emu. Interesting. Interesting. Actually, that's really good. This is really good. You know what this means, chat? It gave us Archeliosauria. Or Archeliosauria. But not Archosauria. So, what does that tell us, chat? What does that tell us? It gave us Ar Archeliosauria when we guessed Emu. So, what does that mean? It didn't give us Archosauria. Even though emus are an archosaur, it gave us Archelosauria. Ooh. So what does that mean? What does that mean, chats? I know what it means. That means... Where's my, where's my button for that? Hang on. Sorry. 
Where's my button for? I gotta. Okay, it's right here. That means it's turtle time. Turtles. Yes, indeed. We got a turtle on our hands. That's what it means. That's what it means. Ah, so it's got to be a turtle. It's got to be a turtle. Now, there's only about 231 species of turtle extant today. There are going to be even fewer that are within the the roster for this game. It only gives us three. Box turtle, sea turtle, or snapping turtle. We'll go with my favorites first. We'll go with sea turtle. Oh boy. Hold on to your butts. And it's not a sea turtle, but it is part of Ameri Americalidia, which is not a clade that I'm familiar with, but let's look that up real quick. Americalidia is a clade of turtles that consists of sea turtles, snapping turtles, the Central American river turtle, and mud turtles. It does not include box turtles, it seems. Um... Box turtle. Yeah, these are terrapins. So, if this clade includes the turtles and snapping turtles, then you know what this is gonna be. It's gotta be a snapping turtle, right? Right? Hold on to your butts. Let's try it. And holy cow, that's it. Not too shabby. We got it in four guesses there. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. Yeah, excellent. Much better than last time. Took us, what, like ten guesses or something? Nine guesses? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Four is less than ten. Yes, Gimpleg. Yes. Um. Yeah. Superb. Superb. That's pretty good. That's better than our average, too. What is my average now? Um. Does it show my average here? I don't think it does. I think I have to... I think I have to paste this into here. Yeah, average guess is 5.4. That's still a pretty good average, you know? It gives you 20 guesses. And I figured it out in four. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. 5.4 is pretty good average. Yeah. Red Fox, Crow, and this. Wow, Alex Jackson. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, excellent. Well, um, of course, today is we're getting ready for World Pangolin Day tomorrow. I do not plan on streaming tomorrow. So we're celebrating World Pangolin Day today. And let's talk a little bit about pangolins and their potential connection to the coronavirus pandemic, to COVID-19. It could have been because of mankind's grievous mistreatment of these animals that we have 
suffered a global pandemic. Let's talk about it. The animal suspected of transmitting the coronavirus to humans faces an even greater threat, extinction. Today on what is face. World Pangolin Day, <laughs> Tom Hansen oh, in Chicago me. has more on the troubled creature. At the Brookfield Zoo just outside Chicago, scientists are working around the clock to save some of the most vulnerable creatures on the planet. Aww. Meet Biggie, one of 11 white-bellied tree pangolins living here. Oh, cool, the cool. pangolin has spent pegasus? most of its existence nice. in obscurity, but after a group of Chinese scientists the recently labeled on them it, as it? the potential transmitter of the novel coronavirus, now it's at the center of a PR nightmare. What they found was a coronavirus that was very, very similar to what they're seeing now coming out of Wuhan. Scientists across the globe, including Bill Ziegler at Brookfield, have questioned the findings of the research. My concern is if we don't word it right and people become afraid of pangolins, they may go out and if they find a pangolin in the wild, in which case there is real no issue there, it's not a danger to you as far as transferring a disease, they would kill it anyway because they're afraid of it. And we do not want that. I feel like among pangolin researchers, there's been a, a a tendency to kind of like downplay the potential connection between COVID-19 and pangolins because they don't want to demonize these animals and they don't want people who live near pangolins to just mercilessly slaughter them on site. But as a scientist, it's like, well, shoot, there probably is a connection there between pangolins and COVID-19. That should be a reason to leave pangolins alone and not smuggle them. You know, like, it, the pangolins' connection to COVID-19 should be... That should potentially be a boon for this species in the sense that, like, if that can get people to leave them alone so their populations can recover, that would be a good thing, you know? Yeah. And it did have the quills. Oh, no, Hugan. Yeah, so the Tachosaurus almost certainly didn't actually have that. But... Anyway, you talk to Jim Kirkland about that. He'll tell you. <laughs> but yeah. Even though it's illegal worldwide, these odd-looking animals are heavily poached for their uh, prized meat and their scales, which are believed to have medicinal value. They don't. Ziegler Might as well be eating fingernails. Scientists hope education will save these gentle animals from disappearing. And that's our goal, uh, not only to help provide the science to conserve the species, but we want to establish a sustainable population here in North America. The stress on pangolin populations is so severe, scientists fear that over the next decade, if nothing is done, two or three of the world's eight species could disappear. Errol? All right, Tom Hansen, thank you. Yeah. Um. Oh, boy. Um, but there is research, legit research, that shows that there are various strains of different coronaviruses, not... COVID-19 in particular, but other coronaviruses, like from the same family that share a common ancestor with COVID-19, that do show up in pangolins. And Chef Nagin, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It is good to have you here. Spelled that out without looking? Congrats there, Chef Nagin. Congrats. Welcome, welcome. It is wonderful to have you here. Um, for once, we are not talking about dinosaurs today. We're not talking about extinct animals either. Today is World Pangolin Day. And so we are discussing these incredible charismatic animals, which are in serious danger of extinction. World Pangolin Day is tomorrow, February 17th. And so I'm doing my, my utmost to to raise people's awareness of these creatures and to maybe also raise a little bit of money for their conservation. Um, no, this is not a Pokemon. This is a real creature. There are eight species, eight or nine, depending on who you ask, eight or nine different species of this animal alive on our planet Earth today. There's a little baby one right there whose scales haven't hardened yet. But they are, uh... They are incredible, incredible creatures. Um, and we're talking about why they're important. And we're talking about how the worldwide, the, the global illegal trade in their flesh and their scales may have actually caused the COVID-19 pandemic. 
This is not some sort of fringe conspiracy theory. This is like... We know that there are... That there are different coronaviruses that... That circulate through populations of pangolins. And also bats. And genetic testing, looking at the RNA of, of COVID-19... Uh, shows that it's very, very similar to that the same coronaviruses that exist in pangolins and in bats. And it may very well have been like, there was a virus that spread from a bat to a pangolin and then spread to people that may have actually helped cause this, this pandemic in the first place. So it's extraordinarily important to understand these creatures and to protect them and to leave them alone. Like, do not... Do not smuggle them. Do not use them in... in for medicinal purposes or for delicacies or whatever else. I mean, most of all because they're they're incredibly endangered. But they are such incredible animals and and I feel like a lot of people don't even like a lot of people don't even realize that they that they exist. We need more public awareness of pangolins so that we can protect them. They are incredible critters. They are so weird and cool. They are unique among mammals and having scaly armor like this. Um, they're incredibly cool. Incredibly cool. And Sparky Bogger just says they remind me of armadillos. They are not related to armadillos. We used to think that maybe they were. Now we recognize that they're probably more close to related, odd as it seems to dogs and cats, to bears and werewolves, werewolves, uh, werewolf. sorry, I've been streaming for a while now, I started early today, um, wolves and badgers and, um, what was I thinking? Not ard wolves. Sorry. Wolverines! Thank you, Gertis Bucket. Wolverines! Are mustelids. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yes, wolverines. Uh, yeah. Um, so these animals, they're not turtles. They are mammals. Let's jump to the mammal part of the tree of life here. Yeah. Uh, mammals and carnivora are lions and tigers and bears. And weasels and seals, hyenas, and wolverines, and mongoose and otters and stuff like that. Carnivorans. Just outside of Carnivora, this group that includes dogs and cats and bears and sea lions, etc. Just outside of Carnivora, you get pangolins. Polodota. We think that they are the closest living relatives to... The Carnivorans, which includes dogs and cats and bears and wolverines and etc. And we're not werewolves, Rick and Jack. Werewolves are not real. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, it bursts some chatters bubbles. But yeah. Yeah. Um, they needs a snack break. I'm fine. I'm fine, Mama Bon Bon. I'll do okay. But yeah. Is it known how they're affected by coronavirus? They probably just kind of power through it, Zevin. Yeah. Here, let's, let's take a minute and let's talk about zoonotic diseases. Because I feel like that will be some, some good background information before we start talking about COVID and pangolins in particular. First, let's broaden out a little bit and let's talk about zoonotic disease. Um... Let's see here. Uh, let's try this. Uh. We know that the novel coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic has brought our planet to a complete halt. Trade and commerce, travel and tourism, even doing mundane things like going to a supermarket or eating out or going to the movies everything has been suspended and that's because i think this video was probably produced in 2020 right yeah three years ago um 
Well, you know, we want to broaden out even further than this, actually. I'll give you a link to this video here in case you want to watch it. But... Um... There, Wolf, there, Cass... Yeah, there you go, Jet Fuel. Young Frankenstein reference there. Um... Let's see... Um, it's interesting. For once, SciShow doesn't have a video on this topic. Yeah. But let's... Um, here, let's take a look at this. As a new decade dawned in 2020, everyday life seemed relatively normal. Then, COVID-19, a new deadly coronavirus, spread across the globe and changed our lives. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. As of June 2021, at least 177 million people have been infected, and more than, more than 3 that million have died, though these are thought to be low estimates and numbers... I mean, yeah. ...continue to rise. Um, let's take a look at that right now, actually. Um, coronavirus statistics from Worldometer. Yeah, 6.9 million deaths worldwide so far is the estimate. The real number is almost certainly higher than this. But 674 million people worldwide have recovered from it. But among those, almost 7 million people have died. 7 million people! Crazy. And, like, it's it's nuts that, like, over 1 million of those were here in the United States. Um, the U.S. in particular has, uh, has not done well. Um, yeah. So if we go to total deaths... The USA was actually the hardest hit in the world, probably because we have such a crummy healthcare system. Um, well, it's, let's be honest, it's because of that. 1.2 million Americans died of COVID. And still dying. Yeah, Gator Gator, yeah. There's still people dying from COVID every day. Um, so yeah, yeah. What's the total U.S. population? Um, U.S. population, about 331 million. We'll say 332 million. Um, wait, in 2021, let's say 333 million. Let's be super generous about this. And, um... Let's see, and let's say 1.2 million total deaths. Um, let's see, here we go. So, 333, no, hang on. Um, 1.2 divided by 333 equals, that's, Let's see, that would be 3%. That would be almost 0.4% of the total U.S. population. So. So one out of 200 and, one out of every 277 people died of COVID in the U.S. That's nuts. You know? That's really crazy. That's more than the percent of Americans who died during World War II. Um, although, to be fair, the U.S., you know, we were really only fighting overseas. It was in not very many places that U.S. soil was invaded during World War II. Pretty much only in, like, the Aleutian Islands uh, of Alaska. But, yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, tremendous number of Americans died during this pandemic, and that might be directly a result of our, not Americans, but well, probably some Americans, but just people in general, mistreatment of pangolins that brought this on. Lockdowns and other restrictions imposed in response to the pandemic also triggered the deepest global economic recession in a century, with at least 131 million people pushed into poverty. Still. And the billionaires are just raking in the dough during this time, too. Holy cow, the wealthiest people in the world got so much more wealthy during this time. Because that's what the system is designed for. But I'm not going to get into that right now. The pandemic rages on as new, more contagious strains evolve. But this coronavirus is just the newest zoonotic disease to jump from animals to infect people. Yep. I guess Sparky Pugwash, good on you for not spreading it. Yeah. Yeah. Since the mid 20th century, new and deadly human diseases have emerged at an alarming and escalating rate. About two thirds are zoonotic, including AIDS, go, Ebola, yeah. swine flu, unkind of dragons flu, there, I would say. Disease, though. SARS, and now <laughs> COVID 19. A mix of oh. human activities helped these diseases to emerge including widespread destruction of wild habitat, livestock production practices, the global wildlife trade, and unprecedented international travel and trade. Though we don't yet know- Was that Oakland right there? Is that where I live? An unprecedented international- mm, Maybe. I don't recognize any of the signature buildings. That's that's probably not Oakland. But Oakland Harbor does look a lot like this. But I don't recognize any of those buildings. Yeah. SV Harkins says, thank you for covering this. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Claire Burr says, does Oakland have a big downtown like that? Oh, you bet, Claire Burr. Yes, absolutely. Um, you never been here, Claire? Yeah, Oakland's got a a pretty pretty impressive downtown, really. Um, yeah, let's see, Oakland Harbor. I'm trying to find you one with the buildings in the background. Yeah, Port of Oakland. There you go. It's not as impressive as like downtown San Francisco, but um, there we go. You know, those container cranes, and then... I didn't see the, the big Oakland Federal buildings like that. Those twin buildings with the thing in between. Um, anyway. Yeah. And they... Okay, gotcha, Claire. Yeah. 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 Uh. Anywho. Back to this. Well, travel and trade. Though we don't yet know the wild source of COVID-19... We do know bats were the original host for SARS, another... And what is this animal right here that they show? ...travel and trade. Though we don't yet know the wild source of COVID-19... That's a pangolin right there. Looks like maybe an Indian pangolin. Or maybe a Sunda pangolin. Um, we do know bats were the original host for SARS, another coronavirus, which then jumped to civets and then to humans. The current pandemic serves as a warning. The international trade in wild animals for meat, pets, traditional medicine, fashion, and other purposes poses grave public health threats. Yep. Today, Globalization fosters the rapid spread of once localized or emerging diseases. Yep. Nearly all zoonotic diseases originate in birds or mammals, which may carry 1.6 million different viruses. Yep. About 700,000 could present a risk to human health. And birds or mammals there. Why do you think, chat, that birds and mammals 
together harbor diseases that can easily jump to humans. Why do you think? Hmm. Seeing some correct answers already, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a number of different correct answers here. Uh, Clever says best immune systems. It's part of it. Mammals in particular have immune systems that are very similar. Well, we are mammals ourselves. And so there's a phylogenetic closeness there between other mammals and ourselves. So if a virus e uh, evolves to exploit a certain immune system in a mammal, um, it'll be closer to us and it can more easily exploit our own immune system. Because uh, we eat a lot of mammals and birds. This is also true mayor space. Yes. Yes. Endothermy, says Dr. Afsan, and Makeaway, and Zevin. Yeah. So mammals and birds are both endothermic, warm-blooded. Um, and so, like, with high metabolisms, you've got, like, kind of a... Even though mammals and birds are not closely related at all, um they both might have elevated body temperatures. And so viruses evolved to exploit that. And yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and similar protein receptors, jet fuel, that's probably part of it. I assume, I don't that's getting really into the weeds. I'm not, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Yeah, with high metabolism comes high responsibility or something. There you go, Charlie's Dragon, yeah. A mayor space says, with great metabolisms come great responsibility, yes. Yes, yes. Or mammals, which may carry 1.6 million different viruses. Oh, boy. About 700,000 could present a risk to human health. Researchers have linked increased outbreaks of zoonotic diseases to extensive deforestation in tropical countries, yep. much of it to meet growing global consumer demand for beef, soy, palm oil, and other commodities. In fact, there is actually a moment... Has anybody here ever seen the film Contagion? Um, this was one of my favorite movies when it came out back in 2012, I think. Um, and it became wildly popular again in, uh, well, in 2020 with the emergence of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, yeah, here. Um, here's the trailer right here. Great movie. And the wonderful thing is they actually, like, interviewed a bunch of, uh, like, they had... They had virologists and epidemiologists, scientists who study pandemics. They consulted them for this and had their input in order to make as as realistic a movie as possible. And um, it really shows in the final product. If you haven't seen this, I recommend it very highly. It was a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. Did you mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? Oh, boy. No, she said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every week. Uh, thanks, Gwyneth. This says SVR. <laughs> it there is also for a scientist, for somebody who like follows these things, there's a mm, there's just this delicious irony. Um in uh, uh, almost like cosmic justice in, in Gwyneth Paltrow being patient zero in this film because she has been involved with all kinds of like healthcare scams and stuff in the past. Her whole like goop empire, all this nonsense, um, just like misinforming people about like all kinds of wacko health claims and stuff like that, alternative medicine nonsense. And then in this movie, she causes a global pandemic. Um, Wellness scripting, exactly, S.V. Harkin, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, oh, it's just, I almost feel like they specifically cast her in this film because of that. It is just this, the most delicious irony. Oh, I love it so much. Ah, 
every yeah. minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Beth. Mom? No, no, uh, uh, go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. Yeah. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Yeah, she before? had a history of seizures. No, no, no. Allergies. No. That's an all-star cast, Clarebury, yeah. Yeah. You've never seen this? Oh, man. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne is in it from, um, uh, where was he? Lawrence Fishburne right there from, uh, from Apocalypse Now. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah, from Apocalypse Now. Um, uh, and Pee Wee's Playhouse, yeah, I go clear, he's the mailman, right? <laughs> or no, the cowboy? Cowboy Curtis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, what? Ow, moon pie. Ouch. Come here. Come on up here, but don't dig your claws into my knees. Don't do that, moon pie. Come here. Hey, come here. Um, it also has, uh, oh, wonderful performance by, um, um, oh, hello. Yeah. Well, we might have a moon pie appearance here. Let's see. Oh, oh yes, we do. Hello, hello, Moon Pie. Well, oh, and the camera's frozen again. Give me a second here. That's better. Moon Pie. Yeah. There you are. Moon Pie, I know you're not a pangolin, but you are related to them, at least in the sense that you are a carnivorous mammal. Thanks for making an appearance. Yeah. Stop showing your butt to the camera. Come on, turn around. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, oh, hello. Yeah. Um, good to see you, Moon Pie. You pushing my microphone around? Yeah. Oh, always a treat to see you, Moon Pie. You used to never appear on stream, and now it's like practically every stream you show up. I love that. I love that for us. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Moonpie is one of three cats who live here. And um, Ios and Lordy are gone this week. And so the cats have just been all over me, wanting all kinds of attention. And that's really awesome. Um, because while Ios and Lordy are gone, you're in charge, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Good stuff. Or they're putting the moon in Moonpie. Very <laughs> steel town. <Yeah>. Moonpie. <laughs> yeah, hide that butt from the camera. Oh. <laughs> and Marion Cotillard from Inception. Kate Winslet from Titanic. Yeah, she plays a scientist in this. I think one of her best roles. Well, she also played Mary Anning, another scientist in another great film. But uh, Jude Law from Talented Mr. I've never seen that, but I've seen Jude Law in other things. Somebody names? Yeah, Gator Gator, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think, Moon Pie? You want to watch this later? It's a good movie. Here, let's let's continue. Um, play. No vaccine at this time. Yeah. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Yeah, she before? had a history of seizures no, 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 and allergies. No. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. I said, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking It's... At? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission. 
so we just need to know which direction. Yeah. On that one, What's kind of nuts people. is that then, this movie predicted a lot, um, but the U.S. government was far more proactive and 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 focused on protecting the American people in this film than it was in real life, which I suppose is to be expected. In but, four, yeah. and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president. And it's interesting. In this, Jude Law plays like a, an Alex Jones type figure who like, this is also kind of, uh, you know, kind of prophetic in the sense that, like, he's got this scam cure that he sells to everybody. And then, like, you know, in real life, when we had the coronavirus pandemic, when we had COVID-19, it was, like, ivermectin and stuff like that as, like, a scam cure. Um, it's it's incredible, like, the, the number of things that this film got correct. It was just a little bit too uh too optimistic about how the u.s government would respond there were two people and then four and then 16. in three months it's a billion that's where we're headed they're calling out the national guard they're moving the president underground people will panic get away it will tip over the truth is being kept from the world cook your samples destroy everything Life imitates art. Yeah, there you go, Claire Burr. Like Hello. the cliche, yeah. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. The back in your car. We're not sick! It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutate. Yeah. Great film. Highly recommend it. And I'll, uh... I can kind of show you the end of it here. It just doesn't really spoil anything. This is almost like a post credit sequence. Um... But it's good stuff, and it, at the beginning, this, at the very end of the film, after they have the vaccine that rolls out and everything, and there's like kind of a, kind of a happy ending, it kind of screw, goes back to the very beginning, to day one, and it shows you how the virus started in the first place. Again, this movie was released in 2012, and because the filmmakers had the input even like during the, you know, writing the script and everything, they had the input of epidemiologists, virus scientists. They really got this part right, like how diseases like this start, how pandemics start. Take a look. Oh, there's some bats. Deforesting their home. There we go. So, transfer from one animal species to another. A pig, in this case. There you go. Yeah. Day one. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's all it can take sometimes. With, with COVID-19, it seems to have been a bit more dramatic than this, though. With, you know, these so-called wet markets in Wuhan. And, like, there's a long history of 
zoonotic diseases coming through Wuhan as well. I mean, for crying out loud, they had a whole research laboratory that was built there because they had all of these zoonotic diseases that were being spread through, you know, these wild animal markets in that city. Like, this had been a recurring thing again and again and again to the point where they built a they built a giant research facility there. I don't know if it's giant, but they had like a well-known zoonotic disease research facility there in that city because there was a thriving wild animal trade there. And there were more and more and more zoonotic diseases. So yeah. Yeah. Um let's see. Mary L had a question uh about could a virus cause human extinction? Not extinction, no, because uh, viruses do not viruses do not seem to cause extinctions for the most part, unless species are already stressed. For a virus to cause the extinction of humans, we would already have to be almost extinct to start with, you know. Um, yeah, viruses are not a good explanation for extinction events. But viruses, I don't know. If we had another worse zoonotic disease than COVID, and then that caused some sort of an international thermonuclear war, that could cause human extinction, potentially. But a virus by itself would not wipe out every person on Earth. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um... It would have to it has to heat a weak link, like making reproduction difficult. Oh, you mean like a, like a Children of Men kind of scenario? Another great film, one of my favorites. Yeah, viruses like to keep their hosts living and coughing. There you go, Mayor Space. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And Rachodactylus is a virus isn't likely to totally annihilate its host because that wipes it itself out too. Yeah, it's got to keep the host alive long enough to reproduce itself before the host dies. So, like, there will never be a virus where, like, you you get it and you instantly die. Like, that would not spread throughout a human population, because what possibility is there is there for you to spread it, you know? Um, even when we had, like, the Black Death in Europe, um, that was only, like, one-third of people died from that. Like, 30% or something. Um, but it's just kind of like the nuts and bolts of how viruses work, that... They can't kill everyone, because then there's nobody to spread the virus, you know? Yeah, Children of Men was so good. What, again, one of my favorite films, Gator Gator, yeah. yeah. Um, unless a mutation, well, yeah, but that's the thing, is that a mutation like that will not spread. Because if it kills its host fast enough where it cannot be reproduced, then that snuffs it out, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. And Jet Fuel says, what is more likely to happen is enough people die from that larger population dying from the resulting social break. Yeah, there you go. Like, it would it would have to be a, an impetus for worse things happening, basically. Like, thermonuclear war or something like that. You know? But anyway, zoonotic diseases. Let's... Let's talk about it. About 700,000 could present a risk to human health. And and again, we're not watching this for any like morbid reason. It, it's World Pangolin Day. That's what we're talking about right here. And human mistreatment of pangolins may have played a major role in the origin of coronavirus, of, of COVID-19 in particular. That's why we're talking about this. Like, it is not just for pangolins' sake that we need to save these animals and let them let them alone just let them do their thing and not traffic them any longer not eat their meat as delicacies and, and sell their scales on the black market we need to leave them alone not just for their own sake so they don't go extinct but also to protect ourselves as well it is in our own self-interest as human beings to stop the illegal trade of pangolins and pangolin parts because there's like a significant chance that that's what caused COVID-19 in the first place. And we don't want to keep doing this sort of thing. We know that there are a lot of coronaviruses in pangolin populations that they just kind of live with. And they're fine. 
But when those spread to people, it can be really, really bad. So let's leave them alone, you know? That's what this is about. Researchers have linked increased outbreaks of zoonotic diseases to extensive deforestation in tropical countries. Yep. Much of it to meet growing global consumer demand for beef, soy, palm oil, and other commodities. With 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth, we're intruding ever deeper into the world's last wild places. This yeah. brings forest animals, livestock, humans, and the virus each of them carry into close proximity. Each year, millions of animals are taken from the wild for commercial trade. Tomas says, if only the Chinese government used the brain. I mean, China's had far fewer deaths from COVID than the U.S. has. I mean, like, let's be fair. The Chinese government's done a lot better job taking care of their own people than they have, than the U.S. has taking care of our own people, you know? This emerged from China, but it could very easily have emerged from, you know, any other place. Where, like, wild animals are, are, are taken from their habitat and kept in tiny, filthy cages in city centers, you know? We've got this in all kinds of cities around the world. The next global pandemic could very well come out of, you know, a place like Oklahoma or Nebraska, where you've got these gigantic facilities that are just filled with chickens, for instance. Bird flu, you know? Oklahoma, like the Spanish... There you go, transit biker. Yeah, the, tr the Spanish flu did originate in the U.S., didn't it? Or Kansas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even though it was called the Spanish flu, that originated in the United States. And there were millions of people who died from that. Yeah. Many are weak or sickened from traumatic capture and transport to far-off cities or countries making them prime hosts for viruses. Wildlife markets and captive breeding facilities, with many species jammed together in often filthy, yeah. cramped cages, act like microbial petri dishes, These are just virus breeding grounds. breeding grounds for the next pandemic. Uh. Wild animals and livestock can also swap pathogens, which yep. then evolve to infect new vulnerable hosts that lack natural immunity to them, including humans with undetected microbes then distributed around the planet. While wild animals are traded by all nations, data shows that China is the planet's largest consumer of wildlife. Yeah. The US ranks second with far lower volumes and very different products. Unlike other nations though, China still farms wildlife species in captive breeding facilities. Several pandemics have originated in Asia. Yep. Bush meat often butchered at markets, is another source of disease transmission. Up to 5 million tons of bushmeat is hunted in the Congo Basin annually, the epicenter of the Ebola virus, first transmitted to humans via infected chimpanzees, gorillas, and forest antelopes. And, okay, so the viruses came from these. What did we learn? Continue doing the same? Let's hope not, Tomas. Yeah, China says that they have banned the... the the trade and sale and and you know, of of wild animals like this but that was also true before the pandemic started i think um like all of these things were already illegal it's just they weren't being you know properly addressed they weren't being regulated or policed so let's hope they've really cracked down on that now um here we'll I'll show you another video about that in a minute but yeah well, wildlife yeah. trade is a significant source of disease it's not the only one yeah dangerous livestock practices used by industrial scale agribusiness brought us avian flu passed by chickens to people and nipah virus which is passed on by pigs that's swine flu there yeah i think the covid 19 pandemic illustrates just how fast an outbreak can spread via international trade and travel. Yep. It sparked a global outcry to end the trade and consumption of wildlife for a global crackdown on wildlife trade and an end to wildlife farming in Asia. Experts say that to predict, prevent, and rapidly respond to future outbreaks, we need deeper knowledge of the threats and better disease surveillance by governments. 
Improved planning and enforcement could save countless lives. Yep. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that ecosystem health, animal health, and human health are inextricably linked and that protecting nature protects humanity. Without action, we remain vulnerable to newly emerging viral threats. The takeaway message? Protecting wildlife and the planet's wetlands, forests, and grasslands could prevent the next pandemic, which may be just a plane flight away. There you go. Good stuff. What a lovely video here. Mangabe does such good work. There's a link there to that video. And, um... Yeah... Take a look at this quick video too. This is this might even be AI generated here, but you did an okay job with it. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, could be a hybrid that descended from different clades of bat and pangolin viruses, according yep. to new research in Science Advances. Writing in a news release, the team says the bat virus rat G13 is the closest genetic relative to SARS-CoV-2 with a 96.3% RNA similarity. And so this is how we how we also determine the relatedness of different animals and plants and stuff like that as well, is to, to judge the percent similarity in the DNA, or in this case, RNA. Because uh, viruses don't, I don't even have DNA, it's, it's ribonucleic acid instead of deoxyribonucleic acid. But anyway, um, there's also a pretty high high percentage similarity to pangolins as well. And so it may have spread from bats to pangolins into humans or from pangolins to bats into humans. But at any case, it was like humans putting bats and pangolins together in close proximity and then in close proximity to people that probably is what caused this in the first place. However, the bat virus does not have the spike protein parts used by SARS-CoV-2 for infecting humans. Yeah. Yet another close relative, a clade of SARS-like pangolin virus from China, has receptor-binding domains that closely match the corresponding parts of the novel coronavirus. The bat and pangolin viruses likely recombined to form SARS-CoV-2. Recombining could occur when two similar viruses infect the same cell. When this happens, molecules that made up the distinct viruses are reshuffled into a new pathogen. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> snail chaser. <laughs> yeah, pretty close, I think, snail chaser. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you here. How's the move going, snail chaser? You got things packed up? Um, snail chaser's an old friend of mine. We go back a long, long time. Uh, really like my oldest friend. Not that he's old. We just go way back. Snail chaser, I hope you're having a good day. Snail Chaser is moving to a new, bigger apartment. Um, good for him. Very excited. Very excited. Um, but yeah, it's going. I need to get packing. You get to that, Snail Chaser. I sent you some boxes and some Sharpies and tape. Um, you bet. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll see if I can call you later or you call me later, Snail Chaser. If you need help this weekend, let me know. I'm streaming for World Pangolin Day today instead of tomorrow, just in case you needed help with the move uh, or with packing and everything. So yeah, SB Harkin says you'll never regret packing earlier. Yeah, unless you need something in one of the boxes. <laughs> but don't think about that. I didn't say that. Yeah, <laughs> pack early, Snail Chaser. It's good to have you here. Anyway, and pangolins need help for sure. Absolutely. Type in exclamation mark pangolin into chat. Um, so that, uh, so that you can get a link to a, uh, you know, the world, well, it's the Pangolin Crisis Fund, um, to help conserve these wonderful animals. Distinct viruses are reshuffled anyway. into a new pathogen. Uh, and that, that's the end of the video. Okay. But here, to, to go back to this part. Yeah. However, the bat virus does not have the spike protein parts used by SARS-CoV-2 for infecting humans. 
Yet another close relative, a clade of SARS-like pangolin virus from China, has receptor-binding domains that closely match the corresponding parts of the novel coronavirus. So what's interesting is that the virus is found in horseshoe bats. Different coronaviruses found in horseshoe bats are an extremely, extremely close match with that of COVID-19. But they're missing that particular spike protein that allows the virus to enter human cells. But that seems to have been found in coronaviruses that are found in pangolin populations. So... The bat and pangolin viruses likely recombined to form SARS-CoV-2. Recombining could occur when two similar viruses infect the same cell. When this happens, molecules that made up the distinct viruses are reshuffled into a new pathogen. Yep. And so it could very well be that it's because of, of human beings' extraordinary disrespect of pangolins, their exploitation of these animals, them smuggling them out of their habitats and keeping them in tiny filthy cages in close proximity with other animals like horseshoe bats that may have allowed this this meeting to take place where you get both of these different kinds of coronaviruses that are able to mutate together and form COVID-19. Um, this is not settled science, however, and I want to emphasize that. There are different opinions among different epidemiologists and virologists about this. And I don't want to... The last thing that I want to do, the very last thing that I want to do here is to demonize pangolins. It is not their fault that they themselves are smuggled and abused and slaughtered and poached. That's our fault as human beings. And, and I think when we're, when we watch videos like this right here, um, we should keep that in mind. Um, take a look. People are saying, could this be the revenge of the panga? That may be a little unfair. China has banned the trade of wildlife as it suspects animals are behind COVID-19. But how is this going to help the plight of the pangolin? It is said to be the world's most trafficked animal. In China, the pangolin is seen as a delicacy and is also wanted for its purported medicinal virtues. Yeah. Let's discuss this as we're joined this morning by Professor Ray uh, uh, Jansen, the uh, chairperson of the African Pangolin Working Group. Ray, a very warm welcome to you. Thanks for yeah. coming today. And um, let's get this one out. So this guy also, is uh, he does work with the Pangolin Crisis Fund, which we're hopefully collecting some donations to today with exclamation mark pangolin in the chat um like he helps lead raids um like to recover smuggled pangolins and stuff like that to help these animals uh, By the way, first of all is there a proven link at this point between the pangolin and coronavirus morning morning jeremy um it's possible but it's unlikely um what happened a number of papers three journal articles were submitted um, two prominent journals which are still under review, under peer review. And what they failed to admit, uh, admit was that they actually tested the binding sites uh, of the coronavirus in pangolins and compared it to the one in humans. Oh, and it was Claire, only you're good. And uh, Senator, you're good too. Just 90% similar. Just PG chat. <laughs> and then um, they tested the coronavirus in its natural host, which are normally bats, mm -hmm. the horseshoe bat. And that had about a 97% similarity. So at this stage, it's possible, yeah. but yet it's unlikely that it's pangolins. But the karma for pangolins being the most traded... Sanaton does make a good point there, but also I think those things are also available in China. This is mostly like a, a boutique product for the very wealthy. Once again, it's... the ultra-wealthy who are ruining things for the rest of humanity and causing global pandemics and stuff like that. Um... But yeah, yeah. But yeah, that is one of the purport purported benefits of, uh, you know, using pangolin flesh and scales and stuff. There's zero evidence that, that there's no plausible way in which that could possibly be true. But San Antonio, you're right. And that's like what people think when they when they buy 
smuggled pangolin parts. Yeah. Did mammal on Earth is it's yeah. brought their plight into the lounges of everybody around the world, which in itself is, is fantastic. And we can talk about that in just a moment, because this yep. actually might be a good thing as far as, uh, as the pangolins pangol are concerned. There you go, Charlie's so Dragon, yeah. World's most yeah. trafficked mammal, also extreme degrees of cruelty, I understand. Yes, uh, absolutely. So there's a huge demand for their, their meat oh. as a delicacy in, in countries such as Vietnam. Also in Asia, as a source of rural food as well, they, they're highly sought after. But um, more importantly is the use uh, in Chinese traditional medicine, mm. the scale. Which is neither traditional, nor is it medicine, nor is it really Chinese when you think about it. Because I think Mao's people actually copied that from like, didn't they copy it from some sort of like European manual of like magic medicine or something like that at the time during the 1950s, during the, the Great Leap Forward? Don't get me started on Chinese traditional medicine. Neither medicine, nor is it traditional, nor is it Chinese. Ah! In fact, which are ground yeah. up and used up to 60 different commercial remedies uh, that are sold in, in China. And um, the extent of that trade is, is monumental. How endangered are they? We don't even know how many there are. There you go, Dinosaur you know, Dave, yeah. Uh, the yeah. large majority of, of South Africans have never even seen a pangolin, and some have never even heard of pangolins. They're solitary, they're nocturnal, um, they don't make a noise, you can't find them, so we can't even count them to determine how many there are. But what we know is that the four Asian species are incredibly rare. Mm. And just like uh. you have the Asian rhino and Asian elephant, um, their use and their demise is, is to such an extreme uh, event now that they're coming for their conspecifics which are the african rhinos african elephants and african pangolins because they and the story seat says i've honestly never heard of pangolins until today well i i'm glad to hear that that you've heard of them now i mean holy cow this is these are such remarkable creatures um and if i can help raise awareness about them just a little bit on the eve of world pangolin day that makes me tremendously happy and if we can raise a little bit of money for their conservation as well, there's a there's a donate link if you type in exclamation mark pangolin, which I'll do that right here. Um, yeah. There you go. Uh, the Pangolin Crisis Fund. Yeah, yeah. Remarkable, remarkable animals, pangolins. Incredibly cool critters. Uh, Sayon Hassan stream and had to fall. Thank you. On site, I really appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Got a comrade here, Stolz site. Welcome to Paleontologizer. And it's great to have you here. Normally, my office is decked out with, you know, 3D prints of different dinosaur fossils and stuff, but it's World Pangolin Day tomorrow, and so we're talking about pangolins, these remarkable, remarkable mammals who are in dire need of our of our help and support. And just, just leaving them alone, not poaching them, not selling them on the black market. And we were just talking about how um, how the the illegal trade in these animals may have directly led to the current COVID nineteen pandemic. We know that pangolins uh, within pangolin populations there are various coronaviruses, some of which are ex extremely similar to COVID-19. It seems like it may have been like a, a weird recombination of a bat virus and a pangolin virus. Co you know, both of those different kinds of coronaviruses. Bats and pangolins combined to create the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, combined to create the novel coronavirus that people are still dying from right now. So yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm just trying to draw some attention to these animals today, and I'll be making a donation toward the end of the stream toward their conservation, and I hope some people who might have a little bit of, you know, if you've got a few dollars jangling around in your pocket, you'll help too. Yeah. Um, and Dinosaur Dave, what is this? The chocolate? Football casket? What's this, Dinosaur Day? Squirrels? Squirrels aren't native to Australia. What's wrong with this? That's not good news, Dinosaur Day. 
Um. Oh, but and these. Bilbies. Oh, we'll be talking about Bilbies. Another mammal that's near and dear to my heart. We'll be talking about them before Easter. Australian mammal that's also endangered. And in need of our, uh, need of our help. But yeah, it's good to see that. And yeah, there you, there you go, Brit. I'm going to be collaborating with Brit on a project for, uh, for Bilby conservation as Easter comes up here. But yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. We were talking about this yesterday, but today I don't want to get distracted. We got to get back to our, uh, got to get back to our pangolins here. Um, and so let's return to this. This guy here, um, I'm not sure his name. Shoot, I didn't catch it, but he works for, he works with pangolin conservation and, um, yeah, shoot. He was, um, the video that we were looking at earlier. Where was that? Here, I believe. There we go. Very trite. Penguins are the most illegally trafficked mammals in the world. There he is, right there. We do intelligence operations, retrieving them from the illegal wildlife trade. When I put my hands on the head, that's the signal to take them down. I've had eyes on the animal. It's confirmed. It is yeah. downright scary. The evening before, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you're nauseous. That particular operation took two and a half hours for me to convince the suspect to show me the pangolin. These scales are used in cultural medicines in Asia, in particular China. Stevie was named after one of my team members that's been so loyal. It's quite a personal thing for me and very emotional to know that he's doing fantastic. Oh. The second or third day of us having him, I actually took him out for a walk. Uh. Penguins will ride on their mom's backs for quite a long time. And he adapted to that pose very well. He did love it quite a lot. It was always very easy to try experience new things and to be exposed to new things. Oh. And I put him into a termite mound and he spent nearly 45, 50 minutes in that termite mound just feeding. Just eat termites and ants. Yeah. It's just great to know that he drive and that instinct to do what he needs to do naturally was there. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Um. So anyway, here's that same guy right there um, talking about COVID-19 and pangolins and pangolin conservation. And if I were, uh, you know, a scientist and, and conservationist and activist working full time to save pangolins, I would also be very afraid that the the coronavirus pandemic, that COVID-19 would would make people scared of pangolins and might cause hatred for pangolins, even though it's not their fault. Like, they're the ones being illegally smuggled, the pangolins. Anyway, I think that's kind of where he's coming from in in this right and here. Just like you have the Asian rhino, yeah. some have never even heard of pangolins. They're solitary, they're nocturnal, um, they don't make a noise. You can't find them, so we can't even count them to determine how many there are. But what we know is that the four Asian species are incredibly rare. Mm. And just like you have the Asian rhino and Asian elephant, um, their use and their demand. Transit Biker says, don't blame the hornets when you poke the nest. No, it's it's not even that. It's don't blame the hornets when you kill and eat the hornets. You know? Don't blame the hornets when you're driving them into extinction and eating them and then getting diseases from them. You know? Ah! Ah, yeah. Uh, is, is to such an extreme uh. event now that they're coming for the con specifics, which are the African rhinos, African elephants, and African pangolins, because they're four Asian species of pangolin, and they're four African species of pangolin. So just last year, I calculated, well, I noted that uh, 97 tons of scales left the African continent. That's just what we intercepted, which is only about 10% of the trade. That equates to about 170,000 animals. Mm. And an animal that only has one pup a year and possibly every two years, it's, it's uh, unsustainable for the, for the entire order. Difficult then to quantify the endanger quotient. Yes. Having said that, the, the locale in South Africa is predominantly where? 
Well, with our borders with Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana and Namibia is their natural distribution range. But mm. we're seeing the trade in, uh, in the Temex ground pangolin increasing every single year. And uh, on Wednesday, there was an operation in Marble Hall where a number of chaps were arrested and we retrieved a pangolin, mm. which we now have in the hospital. So um, it, it's, the trade is increasing all through the African continent and the demand is for Asia mm. and mostly traditional Chinese practice. And much like rhino poaching, I'm assuming yep. it is syndicate driven, it is highly effective, it is well organized. It's like there, there are crime lords who are, who are leading this kind of thing, you know? Um, it's like it's almost like a mafia kind of thing, you know? If if Tony Soprano were in Africa, he'd probably on the, be on this, you know, because there is an enormous amount of money at stake. That's exactly right, Jeremy. As soon as you make something rare, and as soon as you ban it, because the trade in pangolins is now CITES Appendix One, so it's not allowed to be sold uh, commercially anywhere in the world. And as soon as it becomes rare and there's a huge demand, it, it becomes a criminal event, and it becomes syndicated, and it becomes involved with the same people that are trafficking rhino horn, perlamun, ivory, mm. uh, drugs, mandrax, heroin, it becomes exactly mm. the same people. And we're finding pangolin scales um, more frequently uh, intercepted in, in areas that are in, involved in illegal crime. As a matter of interest, this little fellow that you got after the Marble Hall raid, yep. um, what's his or her future? Uh -huh. Well, this particular little male pangolin, was about nine kilograms, uh, is uh, somewhat unusual in that he seems reasonably healthy. Mm. So he'll go <laughs> under a rehabilitation process that's facilitated by the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital at an off-site location that we, we don't like to divulge. And uh, at normally two to three weeks, the more severe cases can be six months uh, hospital care. And then they go under a rehabilitation process. So a first a soft release where we, they become acclimatized to their new home. Are there in suitable ants and termites to forage on? Um, do they find shelter and make their own burrows at night? And then we follow them for up to a year mm. with satellite telemetry and VHF telemetry to see if they survive. On our big screen behind us, uh, we have a picture. Um, it looks like a menacing creature, but <laughs> not. They come. It looks like it looks like it looks like a it looks like a an artichoke. Would he say that about an artichoke? Oh, this looks like a menacing creature. <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to dump down on his throat too much, but this guy probably doesn't spend a lot of time outdoors. I'm just gonna say it. You know? It does not look like a menacing creature. What in the world is he talking about? Armored animals in general are not menacing. With the possible exception of, like, I don't know, crocodilians? That's really the only creature I can think of that's got armor and it is, is menacing, you know? I, yeah, I... It, this does not look menacing. I don't know where he got that, you know? It looks like a menacing creature, but... No, it does not. <laughs> They're completely uh, harmless. They, 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 wonderful, docile uh, um, animals. And, and once you've been around them, they, they bewitch you. You know, mm. they're entrancing. They, they've Aww. got a tongue almost as long as their body that's stored in a cavity below their stomach. And, and they oh, only my. feed on ants and termites. Um, this particular there. species, the Temis ground pangolin, is the only bipedal species that walks on its two hind legs. And, um, yeah, they, they have one pup a year, and the, the pup stays with mom for about six to seven months mm. before it's weaned. And they're highly territorial, solitary, mostly nocturnal creatures. And they're, um, yeah, they're, they're quite uh, peaceful. Yeah. They haven't got a mean bone in their body. Mm. I enjoyed the retort oh. that you sent to my email when I said, would it be possible for you to bring one in? <laughs> and I think you said, well, would you bring a rhino in? And I think I got the message from you. But Ray, very quickly, <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, you said... <laughs> Classic TV presenter here. Oh, can you can you bring one in? Can we have one in the studio? No, you can't. They're highly endangered. What are you what are you, what are you talking about? Uh... <laughs> when I said would it be possible for you to bring one in, and I think you said, well, would you bring a rhino in? And I think I got the message from you, uh, Ray. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you said at the beginning of our conversation, this virus, uh, as, as, as difficult as it is for human beings, in fact could have an upside as far as the trade is concerned in pangolins, illegal trade. How yep. then do you capitalize on this? 
Well, firstly, the, the global awareness now of pangolins has just had a skyrocket event, which is really great for the, for, the, for, the, for the order. The problem is, such as the 2002-2003 SARS outbreak in Asia, uh, which is very similar to this because this is also a SARS outbreak, a severe acute respiratory syndrome, it, is, it was from an intermediate host called a palm civet. Now, uh, after that became public knowledge, a sort of a double-edged sword, the palm civet was persecuted quite heavily. So we're not quite sure which oh. way it will go, and we don't know which species this coronavirus originated from. Um, it could be beneficial to pangolins. It may not be beneficial to pangolins. If you're a threat to a human community, they go after that threat, which is a bit concerning yeah. for us. Um, however, in, in saying that, it, 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 certainly the plight of the pangolins being the most trafficked mammal on Earth and the very real reality we could lose them in two decades mm. is, is entered many homes and, and it, that in itself is fantastic for the whole order. Glad you dropped in today. Thank you very much You're for your important welcome. insight into a very critical uh, story. Uh, Ray Jansen with us, uh, who is the uh, chairperson of the uh, Pangolin uh, Working Group. The Pangolin Working Group, which um, excellent organization and they actually receive money from the group that we're trying to raise a little bit of money from today. Type an exclamation mark pangolin into the chat and you will get to the pangolin crisis fund. Um, yeah, and this guy also does work with the pangolin crisis fund as well. So yeah, yeah. And Dame Karen says, don't people pay big money to have coffee beans digested by a civet? Yeah, it's also incredibly stupid. And um, sure enough, I've bookmarked that as well. Um, here, we'll take a look at that because it's kind of pertinent. It's the same kind of idea. Are people paying big money to exploit a wild animal um, for some perceived benefit? In this case, it's a taste benefit, which is not real because it doesn't actually make the coffee taste better. It's like People are spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to drink coffee that was pooped out by a cat-like animal called a civet. It's not actually a cat, but um, civets are... Uh, I'll show you on the tree of life here. Yeah. Let's go to Day, the cats. And then I'll show you that civets are outside of Felidae. They are still Feliformes. They are cat-like mammals, cat-like carnivorans, but they're not true cats. So here we've got our cats here, Felidae, and then civets. Um, let's find the palm civet there. Yeah, so they're they're a little bit outside of the cat family. Um, Yeah. Um, anywho, take a look at this. Um, it's a similar issue with like people eating pangolin flesh and especially pangolin scales for supposed medicinal benefits, which are entirely made up. These people are being scammed. They're being taken for a ride. They're getting scrumped here. And it's the same with this as well, but it's also really, really harmful for the animals. Or shark fins, too, are a good example, too, Sanaton Sepa, and even sadder example, really. But take a look. You know, all chefs have secret ingredients in their favorite recipes. Of course, I put garlic on everything. But the secret to the world's most expensive coffee may make you think twice about your kitty litter. Ugh. How about ABC's Gloria Riviera? You might as well be putting, you know, cat waste in your coffee. It's uh... Take it from here. Hi, gorgeous. What this cuddly you? creature is an Indonesian civet cat, an animal whose precious droppings... I think he's pooping. Is he pooping? Oh, yes, that's a pooping. <laughs> ...hold the secret to a luxury coffee craze. Isn't that kind of icky when you look at that? Isn't that kind of... <laughs> I don't know. Of course it is. You're literally drinking the dung... ...of this cat-like mammal there. You know, like... Wealthy people will just spend money on the dumbest things in the world. It's like, look at me. I am so wealthy. I don't even have to have common sense. I will literally drink an animal's dung and tell you that it's delicious. Oh, 
apparently it's funny. Funny because people right, back right, in the right, U.S. Right. are willing to pay 90 bucks for a single serving of this exotic delicacy. Think about that. $90 for like a single cup of coffee. Is there any better demonstration that, that someone has more money than they have common sense? You know? Wealth is wasted on the wealthy. It really is. You know? Oh, boy. $90 would buy groceries for a small family? Exactly, Lenina. You know, uh, until I moved here, my my grocery budget for the week was $40. $40 a week for groceries. That's my That's my whole, like, food budget for the week. $40. And Thing says, I like coffee. I don't like it that much. No, that's not, it's not, that's not even that. You like coffee, so you wouldn't fall for this nonsense. It doesn't even taste good, Thing. It doesn't even taste good. Like, it, it doesn't even make the coffee better. It legitimately doesn't. It's all a scam. Harvested from a place, well, where the sun don't shine. They call it Kabulawak. And after Jack Nicholson extolled the virtues of his fancy cup of joe in The Bucket List. Kobe Luwak, the rarest beverage in the world. It's I don't understand that also. Like, people want to emulate this? They want to emulate that kind of behavior? I don't see Jack Nils Nicholson, like, uh, as a movie character, as somebody to look up to. He is... He is one of the, the scariest, you know, movie monsters of all time. You know? I mean, he legitimately is. I, I don't understand. I, I don't, it doesn't compute for me. Um. There's this an extremely unsettling aspect about him. Why would you want to emulate him? I don't get it. I don't get it. You know? Bucket list. Kopi Luwak. The rarest beverage in the world. It spawned a frenzy of demand in the West. He's got there. So in the bucket list, he was a dude that was dying. I understand that, Ken. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Ken, and everybody else watching, welcome back, Ken. It's great to see you. I hope you're having, hope you're having a great day. Everybody, Ken was on my field crew this past summer, and... um. He also uh, does work in paleontology. It's good to see you, Ken. I hope you've been, hope you've been well. I I think you showed up in yesterday's stream too, didn't you? Shoot, I was looking through the vod later and I saw your name. I didn't even acknowledge you. It's it's great to have you here, Ken. Chat, did you know that that term bucket list originates with that movie? It's one of these things that everybody thinks is like a term that goes back a really, really long way. And it doesn't. That term started with that film. Everybody's like, oh yeah, I've been using that term for decades. Untrue. Yeah. Um. Here. Yeah. Or at least that's what I read. Hang on. There we go. Wikipedia bucket list. Um. There we go. List of activities to do before dying. Hey, okay, bucket list. 2007 comedy film. Yeah. Yeah. Dame Karen says that phrase existed earlier. Send me a link showing me that it's a testable hypothesis here if we can find an earlier instance of that in print or on the internet i suppose that is conclusively dated before 2007 i'll be convinced but yeah yeah um anyway yeah Oh, it meant kick the bucket. Well, kick the bucket has been around for a long, long time. Shoot. Yeah, kicking the bucket. This is a, 
an English idiom is back a long way. But bucket list, that particular, was particular two words in conjunction like this, meaning a list of activities to do before dying, i.e. kicking the bucket. I'm pretty sure it comes from that film in 2007. Yeah. Um. But yeah, make way says sometimes things are just verbally passed on. No. Or at least we can't test that. If we have a recording of somebody saying it from before then, then that works. But when we're trying to use... When we're trying to use empirical means for testing an idea, you need some sort of proof, you know? People's memories are infallible. Look at the whole, like, uh... People's memories are very fallible, I should say. Not infallible. People's speech is fallible, too. Ah! But, um... Look at the whole, like, Mandela effect thing. People misremember stuff all the time, you know? Yeah. Where would they go on Goya? I misspoke earlier. Said werewolves when I meant wolverines. <laughs> uh, but dope, bucket, lists, many. What is this supposed to be? Into the dope, bucket, Thursday. This is not the same thing. Dinosaur Dave, this is not... This is not the, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um. And bucket lists. Oh, from Wiktionary. Let's see. Uh, the term was used in 1999 by American and British screenwriter Justin Zackham in his screenplay for the 2007 film The Bucket. This is saying exactly what I'm. This, this is, you're. This is exactly what I'm saying. This is a term which was invented for that film. You know? Um. Yeah. Uh, articles about the movie are said to be the earliest known uses with the current meaning. And I think it's even in the trailer, isn't it? Um. Bucket list 2007 trailer. Here we go. Um, here, take a look. I'm pretty sure this, this is like, because most people didn't see this. I never saw this movie. I think the majority of people on our planet Earth, the majority of English speakers never saw this film. It's probably safe to say. But I did see the trailer for it. And I think they actually introduced the term in the trailer. But let's test that hypothesis. Let's take a look. Oh, boy. I run hospitals, not health spas. Two beds to a room, no exceptions. There was a survey once. A thousand people asked if they could know in advance would they want to know the exact day of their death. Who the hell was that? Who the hell are you? 96% of them said no. Gordon Freeman. Oh, God, what am I, the Borg? That was the first time I laid eyes on Edward Cole. I want my own room. You run hospitals, not health spas. Two beds to a room, no exceptions. Damned if I'm going to spend the next three weeks laying next to zombie boy. My freshman philosopher professor signed this exercise and called it a bucket list. We were supposed to make a list of all the things we wanted to do in there our lives before we kicked the bucket cutesy it's pointless now that's it that's the origin of that phrase the world's first armored tank you might say or at least that's what that people have agreed upon i remember reading an article by a linguist plane. about this i probably couldn't find it now but um gby mateo thank you for the follow welcome to paleontologizer yeah uh, good approach to the topic of diet cool green minister maybe i should see it sometime yeah um but yeah, yeah. Amazing movies is Boosted Brims. Highly recommended then. Okay, okay. Nice, nice. Anyway, unfortunately, it's because of that film that, um, <sighs> that this became a thing. Um, yeah. 90 bucks for a single serving of this exotic delicacy oh, harvested from a place, well, where the sun don't shine. They call it Kabulawak. And after Jack Nicholson extolled the virtues of his fancy cup of joe in The Bucket List. Kabulawak. The 
rarest beverage in the world. It spawned a frenzy of demand in the West. So we came to Bali, Indonesia to better understand the mysterious allure of... So that, that particular film was clearly very highly culturally relevant. It seems to have introduced the term bucket list and also introduced this idea, Kopi Luak, civic, you know what, family friendly stream, coffee to the, the general public. Um, civet dung coffee. Yeah. What's brown and sounds like a bell? Dung. <laughs> That's what. This coffee is made from of the most expensive coffee on earth. Wow, that's a heavy bag. No. First stop, a local civet farm. Arabica. Arabica. Run by a woman. Hey, a dinosaur. Master Chief, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Howdy, howdy. Who goes by Ibu or Mother Santi? Uh, she explains after the animals eat the flesh of ripe coffee cherries. Okay, I'll try. Good, mm -hmm. Mm, sweet. Their digestive systems impart a smooth body and aroma to the beans. Scam. They don't. It, it's not something that, well, like, doesn't actually make the coffee better in any sense. Maybe it does have a distinct taste afterward because you're literally eating the dung or, I guess, drinking the re the brewed remains of the dung of one of these carnivorous mammals. But yeah. like that. Yeah. And that's that's the magic stuff. Yes. Historically, it's civets roamed free on coffee plantations. And I have 100 plus two civets. 102 civets. But these days, the vast majority of farms cage their animals to control uh. production. Ibu Santi says most of her civets have been in captivity for over six years. Do they ever get out of the cages? No, they're in there all the time. She insists they are treated well. My friend. Your friend. <laughs> yes. To make big business. Think so. A big business, she said there. You know? Your friend. <laughs> yes. To make big business. You see what I mean? Exploitation of animals like this for some sort of scam product that doesn't actually work or actually confer any real benefits, and yet... It is helping drive these creatures into extinction, or at least, in the case of civets, in, in pangolins, it's driving them into extinction. But for these creatures, it's it's just causing them to lead miserable lives. It's for this kind of, like, economic exploitation like this, you know? I guess I wouldn't want to be your friend, says Green Minister. Oh, yeah, she'd put you in a cage and harvest your dung. Uh... Yeah... Anyway, um, oh, and by the way, it was not SARS-CoV-2, not the novel coronavirus COVID-19 that came from civets, but I think SARS-1. Remember the SARS outbreak back in the early 2000s in Japan? That was traced back to civets from keeping civets in filthy cages like this. <sighs> was it in China? I thought it was in Japan, as we hearken. Maybe I'm thinking of MERS? I'm not sure. Anyway, business. continue. But this big business comes at a big price for the cats, according to animal rights groups who say... Oh, or maybe I'm thinking of Sarin? Maybe I'm getting Sarin and SARS mixed up. There were Sarin gas attacks in Japan. Was SARS in Hong Kong? Was that was that right, S.V. Harkin? You were there. Oh, Sarin, S-A-R-I-N. Um... Not not Sauron, Clarifer. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, Ungoy says at the end of the day, these were dirt poor people yesterday, and now they're probably making a good living. You can do that without exploiting animals. That's the thing, Ungoy, is that this like engine of of constant exploitation. And who knows if she was dirt poor yesterday. She may be like a member of the local aristocracy. She's literally running a coffee plantation. Chances are she was not a peasant 20 years ago. Chances are she was already a wealthy landowner. You know? It's not the exploitation of animals that helps people, you know, uh, 
you know, emerge from poverty. It's more equal economic systems that, yeah, you know, this is a systemic thing, you know? This is just, right here, what you see here is just further exploitation, you know? Yeah. Uh, Do they ever get out of the cages? No. They're in there all the time. She insists they are treated well. My friend. Your friend. <laughs> yes. But they're, if they're never let out of the cages, that's not good treatment. It's not. You can't say that. You can't keep someone in a cage their entire life and say that they're well treated. That's just not how that works. But to make big business, she, she, she admits it, you know, she's honest about it, at least in that regard. But this big business comes at a big price for the cats, according to animal rights groups they're who say cats, captivity takes a serious toll on the civets. Yep. The controversy doesn't seem to scare off Kapilowak aficionados, who pay up to $250 a pound. In this uh. case, quality is not the driving factor for price. It's supply, demand and hype. Yep. Rocky Roads. And so, yeah, um, Mikey likes this. Apparently there's science behind Luwak coffee. I doubt it. So, you could tell this is scientific because he's wearing a white coat, right? <laughs> no, but from what I've read, there's a, a tremendous amount of money in, like, propping up this idea that, like, oh, it makes the coffee better or something. But... It really, it really doesn't make any sense when you think about it. And take a look at this, like, blind taste test here. This coffee consultant and master taster does not believe the Luwak coffee hype. So we asked him to put his theory to the test. Is it dramatically better than other great coffees that we might find uh, at a regular coffee shop? Neither Rocky nor these professional coffee covers know which sample contains Kopi Luwak. This had the detail of blueberry. Fruity pebbles or something on that one. And after tallying votes... That one was my favorite, and the Luwak was the fourth for me. Fourth place. Not a ringing endorsement, especially since this Kopi Luwak costs ten times more than the highest ranking coffee on the table. <laughs> what a scam! What a scam, you know? Oh, boy. Yeah, and yeah, Delta Rain, we're talking about this briefly as as an example of the exploitation of wild animals for just out-and-out -out scams like this, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, here, we'll watch this part one more time. Neither Rocky nor these professional Bottled coffee water. Yeah, don't get started on that, Stavros. Oh, boy. This had the detail of blueberry. Fruity pebbles or something on that one. And after tallying votes... That one was my favorite, and the Luwak was the fourth for me. Fourth place. Not a ringing endorsement, especially since this Kobe Luwak costs ten times more than the highest-ranking coffee on the table. Ah, uh, some people are just... They line up and hand over their whole wallets to be scammed, you know? Third, it may not seem like much. 500 bits goes a long way towards supporting science. I'll click here on Twitch. <laughs> Definitely not doing that, however, is Delta Rain. Thank you for the 500 bits there, Delta. I really, really appreciate that. Holy cow. Um, that is fantastic, and I... Really appreciate your support, Delta. Hope you're having a good day. And happy World Pangolin Day. The whole reason we're talking about this is to bring it back to pangolins in a little bit. Delta, are you familiar with pangolins? Um. Oh, man, they're such cool critters. And if you're not, you... Oh, you are! Lovely. Um, We're uh, we're trying to raise a little bit of money for, for pangolins here with... um, Yeah. For the Pangolin Crisis Fund which we'll get to in a little bit. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Hello, yeah. Hello. Back in Bali, Thank the city still reigns I supreme. This one, this one, and even one, if their coffee one, doesn't always measure up, oh my God, oh my God. For many, the thrill of the hunt is tantalizing enough. For yeah. Nightline, I'm Gloria Riviera in Bali, Indonesia. Would you try cat poop coffee? Head to our Nightline Facebook. <laughs> this coffee tastes like bleep 
Yeah, that's why it costs ten times more than the other finest coffee around that actually is legitimately good. You know? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it tastes like suffering, says S.V. Hargan. Yeah. Oh, and Dinosaur Dave, let's see. Um... Bucket list. Yeah, but that doesn't refer to what you do before you die, Dinosaur Dave. That's kind of the whole point. Um, I appreciate your your tenacity in trying to find examples of this, but that's the things I want to do. Oh, after graduation. But it is June twenty fifth, two thousand four. Interesting. It's tantalizing there, Dinosaur Dave. Interesting. Interesting. And we were talking about... For those of you who just joined us, we were talking about this. My freshman philosopher professor assigned this exercise and called it a bucket list. We were supposed to make a list of all the things we wanted to do in our lives before we kicked the bucket. So this is a 2007 film, apparently written in 1999. I guess they shopped the script around for a while before it got picked up. But that was the... Uh... That was both supposedly the origin of the bucket list phrase, but that was also I run the way that the Kopi Luwak, the civet dung, civet poop coffee was introduced to United States audiences and audiences globally was because Jack Nich Nicholson has like a, a a scene about that in this film, and that's it right there. So anyway, yeah, a nice waft to make a away, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, and it's the same context though. It's what to do after you graduate, but it's not what to do before you die necessarily. So I don't know. It's yeah. Um. And this is from 2002. I have a bucket list. Here it goes. Interesting. It still doesn't predate 1999, though, when the script was written. Because this is from... 2002. So... Yeah... It predates the trailers, but it doesn't predate 1999 when the script was written. So, I don't know. I feel like that's, um... It introduces some ambiguity there. I wouldn't say that's a smoking gun. If you can find me one from prior to 1999, I think that'll be a lot more solid. Yeah... Uh, how can the poster know about it without the script? Have you ever spoken with a screenwriter, Dinosaur Dave? <laughs> not very, not very private people, especially about scripts, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I had, I had a friend who was a screenwriter in, in Montana, and... Oh, man. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Not to give the meaning context. That's assuming that that what they mean there is the modern context for it. I don't. I don't know. We can we can talk about this another time. I don't want to get too hung up on this because we gotta get back to pangolins. We can explore this another time if you'd like. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But we gotta get back to our pangolins here. These remarkable creatures. Yeah. Uh, for world pangolin. Oh, there's a little baby pangolin. I think it's a baby Sunda pangolin there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, the whole, like, traditional medicine aspect of pangolins is utter and complete nonsense. And so that's why we were talking about Kopi Luwak and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of funny because... We can make fun of that kind of thing, because that is a really goofy example, you know? Like, oh, civet poop being used to make coffee, and that makes the coffee so much more expensive and people rave about it, but it's all hype. Or pangolin scales, you know, they actually cure disease or make you more virile or whatever else. Like, again, a scam. But part of understanding science is sometimes is following the evidence where it leads even if it's something that might be very pervasive in our culture I'm going to show you a video here because this is one of those things where in American culture and presumably Amer uh, Canadian and maybe Mexican culture too here in North America we have this really pervasive belief that vitamin C helps prevent you from getting sick. And it's not true. Thankfully, oranges are not an endangered species, nor are they abused in the process or anything. But, um... Delta Rain says, yeah, it's light as Pauling's belt. Yes! And so I, I really hope that my viewership doesn't plummet right here, but... Because this is the thing. There has been a very, very clever marketing campaign to sell people orange juice and sell people vitamin C supplements and stuff like this. And I believed this when I was a kid. When somebody at school would get sick, I would, you know, chug orange juice when I would get home because I was told that, you know, vitamin C helps boost your immune system. Turns out that phrase itself is meaningless. And vitamin C wouldn't do that even if that were a real phenomenon. So, take a look at this. Orange juice. What did you say? Orange juice. It's for when you're feeling hot and not so hot. Don't you worry about Susie getting enough vitamin C? Many people reach straight for the orange juice when they get a cold. Or mix up one of these cold-busting, immune-boosting supplements packed full of vitamin C. Yep. It's supposed to help cure the common cold. They're a growing $200 million industry. And unsurprisingly, their sales peak when the cold and flu season does. And with boxes that claim that vitamin C helps support your immune system, why wouldn't you pop a fizzy tablet when you start to feel a bit stuffy? Yeah, and a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. It's like, we're really, really lucky that vitamin C happens to be a water-soluble vitamin because you are just ultra-mega-dosing on this. Like, how many times your daily dose of vitamin C is this right here? 9,000! Something like that. Yeah, it's nuts. And like... There is a, a vague kind of plausibility that some people ascribe to this because it's like, well, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough vitamin C, then you can get scurvy and your your gums get all spongy and your teeth can fall out, you know, like like sailors during the you know the age of sail. That's why the the British would eat limes, right? And they were called limeys for that reason, and they wouldn't get scurvy because they realized that. It's like yes, but even at that time, generally, some of the only people who would get scurvy were sailors. Because they were only eating salted pork and bread while they were out at sea. And they weren't getting any vitamin C at all in their diets. If you eat anything at all close to a, a balanced diet, uh, you know, in the world today. Even if... Oh, shoot. Remember, um, remember this guy? Uh... Remember Super Size Me? with this guy, Morgan Spurlock, where he only ate McDonald's every day for however long. Um, zero risk of getting scurvy right there. You know why? 
because potatoes contain vitamin C. Like, a surprising amount of vitamin C. And so even if he only ate french fries every day for a year or for the rest of his life, he would not get scurvy. Because potatoes have vitamin C. Um, many, many, many things that you consume on a daily basis contain vitamin C. It's not some sort of rare vitamin or something, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's continue. But if you follow this little asterisk, you'll see that the claim isn't supported by the FDA. Yeah. That's because vitamin C doesn't cure your cold. A nope. powerhouse of vitamin C. You really crave but orange. But we, especially as Americans, have been sold this will. idea for like, you just like a half century. Taste. You can trace the vitamin C craze back to this guy, Linus Pauling. Yeah. He was a pretty big deal. He won a Nobel Prize for his work with quantum chemistry and oh a Nobel Peace Prize in the 60s for his anti-nuclear weapon advocacy. Good stuff. So when he came out with a book in 1970 claiming that vitamin C could help you avoid colds and improve your health, it took off. Americans clear... And the... There does seem to be... I don't, I don't know if this is actually true statistically, but it, it seems as though... Maybe this is my bias as a, an evolutionary biologist, earth scientist, that kind of thing. But it seems like people in physics and chemistry, scientists in those fields, might be kind of susceptible to woo-woo claims like this. Whether it's Linus Pauling ascribing magical powers to vitamin C that do not comport with experiment, or whether it's... Um, you know, whether it's, it's, it's Fred Hoyle um, you know, claiming that Archaeopteryx is a fake and a forgery and that evolution is actually the result of alien viruses descending from outer space. Um, and then, like, conforming to, like, you know, an intelligent purpose to make creatures evolve. All kinds of, like, crazy woo-woo claims like that. Um, I don't know, like, high-profile physicists and chemists... Maybe it's not a real phenomenon. Maybe I'm just picking two examples here, but it's it does seem odd, you know. Yeah. In chemistry and a Nobel Peace Prize in the sixties for his yeah. anti-nuclear yeah. weapon advocacy. <laughs> so when he came out with a book, this is why if you're if you're asking a, like if you're curious about a particular subject, trust the advice of people who actually work on that subject. You know, don't ask an astronomer about evolution. Don't ask uh, a chemist about the immune system. Go to the specialists, the people who actually study that, you know? I, as a paleontologist, am not qualified to talk about, I don't know, quantum physics or, I don't know, Hegelian philosophy or something like that. I, I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Ask me about dinosaurs. I'm not even an expert on pangolins. I'm talking about them today, but I'm trying to defer to the experts on that. You know? Danny, tell us about metallurgy. No, Stuffer. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Uh, yeah, and... um, Yeah, here. Um, let's see. Where was that? Where was that episode? Um... Let's see. I think it was this from Skeptoid. Scientists are not created equal. And it just means that, like, stick to your, your topic of, of expertise is the point there. And holy cow, stats bloke. What? Welcome, Stats Bloke and your raiders. Holy cow, that is an enormous raid. And I appreciate that very much. Holy cow. How was your stream, Stats Bloke? I hope it was really good. Uh, statistically significant, I am sure. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. But for once, we're not talking about dinosaurs on the stream today. We're talking about another kind of creature. Um, 
let me, uh, oh yeah, can we, can we do that poll? No, absolutely, SV Harkin. Yes, yes, yes. First of all, stats bloke, thank you. How did your stream go? Tell me about it. I want to hear all about it. Um, let's do a quick poll here. And thank you, uh, Bo Nidal. Bo Nidal, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontology. All right. Uh, our question for the poll is, um, have you heard of pangolins? Yes. Turn off the all caps there. Yes or no? And begin. We're talking about a remarkable animal today. Not penguins, not the flightless birds. We're talking about pangolins. The coolest mammal that many, many, many people have never heard of. Yeah. And Bone Idol says, thanks for rating me a new stream. Great to have you here. Yeah. Oh, Bo Nidley. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, Statsbloke, for the correction. Bo Nidley. Um, we're doing our own... This is not a rigorous statistical sample here, but, you know, we're doing our best. Um, have you heard of pangolins before? And so far, about 17% of people have not. Yeah, this is a Twitch audience, so this is not like a representative sample of the population at large. Um, people here will be a little bit more science savvy, especially coming in from Stats Bloke's channel, I presume. Not a representative sample of the general populace, but about 17% of people so they haven't heard of pangolins before. And I am delighted to introduce you to them. These are remarkable creatures. They are mammals, even though they might look like some kind of bizarre seropsid creature, like a reptile. They're, they are not. They are mammals. Their closest living relatives are, are dogs and cats and sea lions and bears and other carnivorans. But they are very much mammals. Um, it is World Pangolin Day tomorrow, February 17th. But since I'm not planning the stream tomorrow, we're talking about these wonderful creatures today. And hopefully, by the end of this stream, you will fall in love with these creatures just as much as I have. They are in dire need of our support and conservation. There are eight or nine living species of pangolin in the world. They are all endangered or at risk of extinction. Uh, maybe mostly critically endangered. I think like five or six of those species are critically endangered. They're unique among mammals in having scales. They eat ants and termites, and pretty much only ants and termites. And they are also, they've got a, a reputation for being the most heavily trafficked mammal in the entire world. I guess as a group. Pangolins, there's among those eight or nine species. Um, they are captured and, and trafficked and slaughtered for their flesh and for their scales, which is used in various kinds of quote-unquote traditional medicine in East Asia. Even though it's just made of keratin. Their scales are the same material as like our fingernails, you know? And some of them do have a prehensile tail. Absolutely, Bone Needle, yes. Yes. Um, and not only, well, not only are they uncommon, they are... Most of their populations are disappearing. Yeah. They are... Well, shoot. Let me find you a, uh, a little introduction to them right here. There we go. This um, and that's actually not the one I was looking for. And new to Twitch, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Um, take a look at these. This is a male tree pangolin. He is six months old. Oh. Critically endangered and under-researched, the tree pangolin is a mammalian species like no other. 
Found throughout Asia and Africa, pangolins can be traced back 66 million years, meaning they lived amongst dinosaurs. Mm, not quite. The ancestor of the pangolins lived among the dinosaurs, but pangolins in their present form did not exist back then. It's just that that clay diverged from the rest of mammals. Um, and it may have actually been just after the, the KPG extinction, so it may have been that extinction event that prompted their divergence, most likely. Mammals see a, a massive adaptive radiation after, just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Except for birds. Strictly speaking, dinosaurs never went extinct. Um, They're the only mammals birds on today. Earth covered in scales, which yeah. account for about 20% of their body weight. Yeah. These large protective scales are made of keratin, the same thing human nails and hair are made from. Yep. Tree pangolins use their long claws to climb on trees and branches in an endless search for prey. Baby pangolins, like the one here, get around by riding their mother's tails. Though they have poor eyesight and hearing, their strong sense of smell and elastic tongue allows them to catch a meal of mostly ants and termites. Oh. When the pangolin senses danger, it will curl up into a ball, making it almost invincible in the wild. Oh. Humans, however, are a dangerous threat. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Let me show you footage of a pangolin withstanding a lion attack. An attack from several lions, actually. Take a look at this right here. So that's an African giant ground pangolin. And this hungry lioness is like, that smells good. I want to eat it. Actually, that might be a juvenile lion there. That looks like a lioness there. But that armor is incredible. Yeah. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Afterward, the lions get bored and the penguin just walks away. Unscathed. There you go. See? Uh, and new to Twitch says, couldn't the lion just peel off the scale to expose the flesh? Nope. I can't. It's too strong. Yeah. Oh, another's gonna try. They're gonna try. And nope. Doesn't work. <laughs> uh, Dave Karen says, that must be terrifying inside the armor, though. Uh, not really. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Really, really doing their darnest to try and get in there. Yeah. And that is convergent evolution, Bone Needle. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Digital Dax has any connection to anteaters? No. Great question, Digital Dax. That's convergent evolution. There, this is convergence between pangolins and anteaters. Um, they are, they are not close relatives at all. Uh, pangolins are much more closely related to dogs and cats than they are to, uh, oh, and to lions. Than they are to anteaters. Yeah. Who's better, armor, armadillo or pangolin? I would say pangolin, for sure. It's much more flexible. It covers more of the body. Uh, they can more easily curl up into a ball, and plus they've got that lovely pretty much prehensile tail. But yeah, I would say a pangolin's got better armor. A lion would be able to crack into an armadillo's armor, I think. But not a pangolin. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And Sanaton Seppa? Yeah, a, a, a turtle shell is, is its modified ribcage. Yeah, we've talked about that before here. Yeah, that's different from this. This is not part of the animal skeleton that's on the outside. Pangolin skeleton looks like uh, looks like this. I actually have this same uh, same one up on my wall right now. The those armor plates are not bone; they're made of keratin, the same material as our fingernails. 
Yeah. Um, and that's that same illustration right there. That same photo. Yeah, this one, uh, this one here. Very cool stuff. Um, pangolins are really, really neat. Really cool critters. Uh, does look quite feline, says Boneedle. Yeah. Well, they are, uh, they're close to the carnivorans, as we were talking about at the beginning of our stream today. If we look at our grand tree of life here. Um, let's go to mammals. Oh, by the way, for all the new people... Uh, we as scientists classify living things based on who they're actually related to. Like, we look at DNA similarities, and if we don't have DNA, like for fossil animals, we look at the similarities of their skeletons. Um, are there other fossil evidence? And um, as far as we know, all life on Earth evolved from a single common ancestor about 3.8 billion years ago. And so the next time we're walking through San Francisco, through Haight-Ashbury, some hippie guy walks up to you on the sidewalk and goes like, Hey man, hey groovy, like, you know, all all life on Earth is one, man. He's actually correct in that sense. All life on Earth seems to have, seems to have evolved from a single common ancestor about 3.8 billion years ago. And, um... Yeah, we can jump to mammals here on our tree of life. There's our mammals. And then we'll go from mammals to pangolins. Yeah, Folodota is the clade there. Pangolins. Their closest living relatives are these guys, the carnivorans. Lions and tigers and bears, hyenas and otters weasels and sea lions and walruses and etc. So, uh, that pangolin is more closely related to that lion that was trying to eat it than to, like, an anteater or, or something like that. Anteaters are not close by. Again, here's pangolins. Let's go to anteaters. Anteaters. They are way over there. Yeah the anteaters. Anteaters are more closely related to sloths um, than they are to uh, and armadillos than they are to pangolins. Yeah. And Pope says, did you know elephants are a type of shrew? That's not quite that's, yeah. So Pope, you're maybe somebody told you that wrong, but elephant shrews are not shrews, but they are related to elephants. They're also called, also called sengis. Uh, let's see. Well, let's go to elephants here. There we go. There's elephants. And then we go up a little bit further. We got hyraxes and sea cows. Are you a fan of dinosaurs? I won't get angry if you aren't. <laughs> Inigo Montoya, thank you for the follow. I promise I did not kill your father. Uh, thank you for the follow. Good to have you. Yeah. So elephant shrews are... They're also called sengis. They're part of this group. There we go. Golden rumped elephant shrew. So they're they're part of this group called Atlanta Janata, which is part of a larger group called... Um, oh, no. Smaller group. Afrotheria here. Aardvarks. Elephant shrews, like these guys, and these guys. Tenrex, and dugongs, and elephants. They're all they're all part of this group called Afrotheria. So an elephant is more closely related to an elephant shrew than it is to, like, a rhinoceros or a hippo. And you remember that old term, uh, pachyderm? Yeah, um... Pachyderms. Um, pachyderm group? Anyway, there's an old an old group that included rhinos and elephants and hippos. These gray, thick-skinned mammals. Um, 
Yeah, pachyderm species. These are not, this is not a real group. These creatures are not each other's closest relatives. Rhinos are actually closer to horses. Elephants are actually closer to manatees and elephant shrews. Um, yeah, yeah, pigs are, uh, are closer to cows, etc. So, yeah. Myosaurs always ate their vegetables. Nathire, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, and correct, the whale, whale families are effectively descended from seagoing bears. Bow needle, oh, that's actually, I think I know probably where you heard that. Darwin actually proposed that way back in like 1859. But it turns out that whales are actually more closely related to hoofed mammals. The things like deer and, well, the closest thing is hippos, actually. But I, if there was a recent documentary that mentioned that, that bit about Darwin thinking they, they were maybe related to something like bears, but he was just wildly guessing. He didn't know. And he admits that. He said it was wildly speculative. So I bet you, you, you probably heard, you maybe heard it like that. And then, you know, memory is very fallible. But yeah. Um, but yeah, and Stoicite, thank you for subscribing. If they're removed, America loses them forever. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's wonderful to have you here. Holy cow. Um, Stoicite, I appreciate that pledge of ongoing support. Enjoy the emotes that you will get having subscribed. Uh, oh, and these two. Good stuff. Use them at your leisure in, uh, all over Twitch. Yeah. Um, I guess the truth came out with research, which is the whole point of research. Bingo. Bone needle. Yes. Yes. Speaking of research, before we get back to our beloved pangolins, we've got a bunch of cool new people here. I think it's about time that I play a quick little welcome video for all of those new folks here. Or maybe wondering how in the world a paleontologist arrived on Twitch here in the first place. And, uh... Hang on, goodness. He's ready and raring to go. Um, I'm gonna quickly hand you over to our good friend previously recorded Danny. And he's gonna tell you a little bit about who I am, what this whole channel is about, why a paleontologist is on this platform in the first place. So, um... Again, thank you very, very much to StatsBloke. Can we get another shout-out for StatsBloke? And without further ado, um, I'll leave you in the very capable hands of previously recorded Danny here. Just a few moments. Previously recorded Danny, take it away. Thanks, present-day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, 
helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic fieldwork in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada, but most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. At, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. But of course, thank you even more to Stats Bloke and all of their wonderful raiders. Really, really appreciate that. Holy cow. And Master Chiff 007 says, Wow, what a gem I found. Uh, forget in Lurk? Welcome, welcome, Master Chiff. Appreciate you. Then, of course. 
has to be a reference, that name, Master Shift. To, uh, well, here on Twitch, you know what's really big is, um, uh, cooking, right? Mas Master Chef? Right? <laughs> I'm kidding. But yeah. Um, anyway. Anyway. Master Chef, it's good to have you here. <laughs> uh, and Trace, it's good to have you here, too. Welcome, welcome, everybody. And a very, very happy World Pangolin Day, which is, at least here the beautiful sunny San Francisco Bay Area. World Pangolin Day is still tomorrow. But those of you who are watching from time zones more advanced than my own, it is already World Pangolin Day where you are. February 17th. If you're in the UK or if you're in other parts of Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, it's already World Pangolin Day where you live. And you might even be lucky to live on a continent where pangolins exist in the wild. If you happen to live in Africa or uh, or Asia, we're talking about these wonderful critters. And Grant, why? I'm glad your question is a meta question about the Thagomizer and not asking me that exact question. Because I do get that a lot, Grant, why? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Um, I happen to have, we were just showing this off earlier, a Stegosaur tail spike right here. This one's a 3D print. Not the actual fossil, which I think is in a, I think it's in Utah, in the uh, the Natural History Museum of Utah collections. But if this were the real thing, where would it belong? That belongs in a museum. Yeah, this is a 3D print, life size of a stegosaur tail spike, part of the Thagomizer, and in life it would have been covered by a keratinous sheath that would make it maybe like a third again as long, maybe even twice as long. Much, much sharper, more formidable. We're talking, this is relevant because we're talking about keratin today. Or world pangolin then. That's what um, pangolin scales are made out of. Yeah. How much would a 3D print of that cost? Depends who you're buying them from. Now, car. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> I had to print it into multiple pieces. So you got to incorporate, like, labor time and stuff into that. The labor value that went into that, you know? Uh, so, yeah. But not not very much filament. That was maybe... I don't know. Maybe about $10 worth of filament? Probably less. Yeah. Nunez Twitch says, Have you found any evidence of creation from God in paleontology? No. Yeah. That's the thing. is like what we call creation ex nihilo. Creation from nothing. The fossil record shows very, very clearly a direct and, and it shows very clearly and directly gradual evolution over time. We don't really have any groups that just like kind of poof into existence, you know, and I'm not going to get into like theological stuff here. I myself am not a theologian. I am not qualified to talk on stuff like that. But as a paleontologist, I can tell you that through our study of the fossil record, we can trace back the origins of different groups through evolution going back hundreds of millions of years. And the more fossils we find, the easier that gets. And the smoother those evolutionary transitions get. So yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of religious folks around the world who believe that um, that God or gods you know, maybe kick-started evolution in the first place, or created the first unicellular organism or something, but that's not really, like, a thing that we could test in science. Anytime you're dealing with any kind of, like, if you're considering some sort of divine intervention or something, kind of by definition, it's not something that we can test in science. You know? And here, before we get to our pangolins, let me see if I can find you a cool clip about this uh, that kind of helps explain we call methodological naturalism in science. Um, and uh, Sabangam, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Let me know if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, it is good to have you here. Um, let's see. I think... Oh, 
shoot, where did that go? I'm looking for it, I'm looking for it here. It should be in this documentary. Um, but there is a... a scientist who was a key witness in this trial. And he himself is a devout Catholic. Um, but he was talking about why... Uh, why we have to use methodological naturalism in science. Um, let's see, where was that? This is from the 2005 Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, uh, which we were just talking about the other day as well. But this is important stuff, and it kind of gets down to the very, very core of what science means. Which is why I'm willing to derail things just a little bit here, while I try and find that clip. Um, about humanity. There we go. I've never made a secret of the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic, and a long tradition of scholarship in the Catholic Church has argued that truth is one, that science and religion should ultimately be in harmony. But that doesn't make faith a scientific proposition. Right. I think, as many religious people do, that faith and reason are both gifts from God. And if God is real, then faith and reason... So science and religion do not have to be in conflict with one another. Being in conflict. Certainly not. Hmm. And while that was lovely, that's not the particular spot that I was looking for. I was looking for when Ken Miller is talking about methodological naturalism. Um, and that might be later on here. Um, when they're talking about kind of the philosophy of science and was it here where he's talking about baseball a little bit? And oh shoot, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it. Here, let me do a quick Google search and see if the the quote comes up, um, so I can pinpoint it in the video. Um, uh. Let's see. He's talking about George Steinbrenner and the New York Yankees. Um, and that is about 40% of the way through this. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. This narrows it down. It should be... About here, I think. Um, there it is. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, in in the biological sciences, we use evolution all the time. Like biology would not work as a discipline if it weren't for evolution. Confirmed in molecular biology labs today. That's a yeah. very profound statement of a very successful theory. Not a single observation, not a single experimental result has ever emerged in 150 years that contradicts the general outlines of the theory of evolution. Any theory that can stand up to 150 years of contentious testing is a pretty darn good theory. And that's what... Yep, and that's, that's the cool thing about science is that it doesn't matter who you are, what your particular background is, your, your national background, your cultural background, your religious background, or whatever. Science is for everybody. As long as you play by the rules of science and, and you, you're there to figure out what's true and what's not, it doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are. Evolution is. And the deep understanding of evolution, as proposed by Darwin, has with genetics unlocked many of the secrets of life. 
It's an explanatory framework within which all the rest of biology fits. Right? It's something that we use uh, in practical biological applications. Medicine, agriculture, yep. industry. When you're getting a flu vaccine, that or studying the COVID virus, you also use evolution to study that in as well, many, like we're talking many about today. specific ways, like evolution makes a practical difference. It's not just something that happened in the past, evolution's happening now. So if evolution has stood up to all this scrutiny, what about intelligent design? No, no. Nope. Does it play by the same rules? It doesn't. It if tries you to invoke cheat. a non-natural cause, a spirit force or something like that in your research. And by the way, this is... This is a dramatization right here because they didn't actually have cameras. They didn't have video cameras in the courtroom. But they have transcripts. And so for this documentary, they have to reenact this. So here's an actor reading the words of Dr. Ken Miller here, who himself is a biologist, a well-respected biologist, but also a you know, devout Catholic. He's arguing against creationism here. He's arguing against intelligent design because, of course, he is. He's... He's a working scientist. Creationism is basically the opposite of science. And he's going to explain why, why that's the case. About intelligent design. Does it play by the same rules? If you invoke a non-natural cause, a spirit force or something like that in your research, I have no way to test it. So supernatural causation is not considered part of science? Yep. I hesitate to beg the patience of the court with this, but being a Boston Red Sox fan, I can't resist it. One might say, for example, that the reason the Boston Red Sox were able to come back from three games down against the New York Yankees was because God was tired of George Steinbrenner and wanted the Red Sox to win. In my part of the country, you'd be surprised how many people think that's a perfectly reasonable explanation for what happened last year. And you know what? It, it could be true. But it certainly wouldn't be science. It, it's not scientific. Yep. And it's certainly not something we can test. The fundamental problem with intelligent design is that you can't use it to explain the natural world. It's essentially yep. a negative argument. It says evolution doesn't work, therefore the designer did it. Evolution doesn't work, therefore we win by default. But when you ask them, what does intelligent design tell you about nature? Uh, does it tell you uh, what the designer did? Does it tell you what the designer used to design something with? Does it tell you what purpose the designer had for designing something? Does it tell you when the designer did it? Why the designer did it? It doesn't tell you anything like that. Basically, it's a negative argument, and you can't build a science on a negative argument. Yep. After three weeks of testimony on the nature of science, the evidence for evolution, and the failings of intelligent design, the plaintiffs had presented their case. Anyway, I'll give you a link to this documentary if you find this sort of thing fascinating. I'd highly recommend it. Really, really good stuff. This particular documentary won all kinds of awards. I don't like that means anything, but it's good stuff. Take it from me. If you don't believe me, watch it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, and yeah, convergent evolution is a wonderful example of that. But you know, kind of like with um, with these critters here, bringing it back around to pangolins. Um, there's a creature in South and Central America called the silky anteater, and they've got these really cool claws like this that they use to tear open trees and stuff like that to get to the tasty, tasty bugs inside. This creature is not related to pangolins. It's from a totally different group of mammals that evolved from different ancestors and it doesn't have scaly armor on it because well, it's different in that regard, but like, it does the same thing that anteaters do, or that, that pangolins do, excuse me, as an anteater. It's got an overall very similar body shape to pangolins. And so it's evolved the a similar form. are thought to have healing properties, though there's oh, no boy. science to back that up. Yeah. Because of that, pangolins are the most heavily trafficked mammals in the world, Enough. worth almost $300 per pound on the black market. Enough. So 
I don't know. Again, another reason why I brought up that little clip about methodological naturalism, about like not having supernatural, you know, not not introducing like magical thinking into science is very pertinent to today's topic because it is magical thinking that is killing the pangolin, that is driving these creatures further toward extinction. Because people who are buying the, the parts of slaughtered pangolins, they think that those, those like scales on it have some sort of magical property, you know? It, this is like a, it's a very, very pertinent example of how magical thinking is harmful. These scales are made out of keratin. That's the same material as your fingernails or your toenails. It, like, chemically, it is keratin. It's not going to cure cancer. It's not going to, you know... Uh, like, if you give it to your wife, it's not going to make her have a baby or anything like that. But, like, people think that... That that's the case. The people who are buying these things, the people who are funding the the systematic slaughter of these creatures, that's what they're convinced of. They think that those scales have got mystical, magical properties. And it's 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 just not the case. No one knows how many pangolins are left, but we do know that their number is shrinking fast. This they don't make any noises, noise. really. Stolicite, no. No. And rhino horns, same problem. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it is World Pangolin Day tomorrow, and um, that's why we're talking about this in the first place. But here, take a look at this little video here. When you see your first pangolin, you just, you, you can't help but fall in love. Oh, I they, agree. They're magical animals, and we have no right to touch them, to interfere with them, because they are so special and so vulnerable, and it's really, it's an animal that should just be in the wild. But the pangolin is the most trafficked animal in the world. These shy and vulnerable creatures are smoked out from their homes, beaten, tortured and burnt alive. Pangolins are trafficked by the thousands for their scales, which are boiled off their bodies and used in phony Asian traditional medicine. Oh. To add to their woes, pangolins and even their unborn babies are considered a delicacy and eaten as a status symbol in some countries. The demand is just going to lead to the demise of all four of the African pangolin species because the Asian ones are pretty much extinct for all intent and purposes. Shockingly, oh. it's estimated that one pangolin is poached from the wild in Africa every five minutes. We uh. need to act oh. now. Recently, our team rushed to the scene where a pangolin was rescued from poachers in Southern Africa's Kalahari mm. Desert. We are here in the Northern Cape the most remote part of South Africa to find out about I know this is really upsetting to watch we're we're watching this for a reason we're hopefully i'm i'm hoping that that today some of you will feel compelled to to donate a little bit of money to the pangolin crisis fund like i'm going to be doing in fact in fact, I'm going to do that right now, actually. I donate here. And let's make this $150. Here's some objects. Red Zed, thank you for the 17 months there. I appreciate it very much. There we go. And let's see, let me go ahead and fill this out right here. And 
let's do it via PayPal here. Submit. Oh, I gotta put in this stuff too, okay. California. Seven. Three. There we go. And proceed to PayPal. Here we go. That's working. That's working. Um. Okay, and complete purchase. There you go. I, I hope some of you, if you can afford it, might feel compelled to donate as well. Um, yeah. This is a really important cause. Pangolin conservation is extraordinarily important. Partly because, you know, those of you who raided in recently, we were talking earlier about how the current COVID-19 pandemic may be a direct result of pangolin poaching. We'll get back to that in a little bit, but for right now, let's... Let's get back to this. Pangolin that has been rescued from the illegal wildlife trade. Pangolins are in such danger from poachers that we have to keep secret the location of a pangolin rehabilitation sanctuary where we work. Because poachers might break in and steal them because they are so valuable on the black market if they don't keep that secret. Yeah, was there we met Michelle Van Niekerk, a highly qualified veterinary nurse who runs the sanctuary with vital help from scientists from pangolin.africa. Mm. During the rehabilitation process, pangolins are as vulnerable as newborn infants. Aww. They must be kept warm and they have very specific dietary requirements. They there was a cat right outside the window there, wasn't there? <laughs> oh. Cat wants to be let in. Nope, sorry, cat. It's pangolin time. You can come in a little bit later. Yeah. And uh, Bonita, we were talking all about that earlier. We were talking about um, zoonotic diseases. Yes, that is the correct term. COVID-19 is thought to have come from horseshoe bats, a specific species of bat. But pangolins may have actually been the bridge for that virus to get from bats to humans. And it was, it seems to, the COVID-19 virus seems to have, seems to have emerged in the, the city of Wuhan, China, in a a wildlife market there, where um, various kinds of wild animals were being held illegally. By the way, this is already against the law in China, but it just hadn't been properly enforced. Um, you know, like just in these filthy cages of of wild animals kept together in this market, and you can get transmission of diseases between them and then to people. This had been such a common thing that. They literally built a zoonotic disease like laboratory there in the city of Wuhan because this is such a common phenomenon in that city. Hopefully now that has changed. Um, in fact, actually, we have a little video about that right here. Let's hope that they are serious about this. But, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Pangolin, some, the animal some people believe may have played a role in the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, will no longer be authorized for use in tra traditional Chinese medicine. Offering a vital lifeline to the rare and endangered species. Let's hope that this is actually enforced. China has removed pangolin parts from its official list of traditional medicines. 
state media reported on Tuesday. Just days after making the animal the country's highest level of protected status due to its dwindling numbers. The move has been lauded as a major step in saving the species by animal protection groups. Yeah, this is a really significant action on the part of mainland China to help protect pangolin species around the world. The traditional Chinese medicine practitioners have used pangolin for centuries as part of their prescriptions and the scales in particular. And uh, maybe other pangolins in Asia, but not African ground pangolins. They haven't been using those for hundreds of years. Anyway, even this, I'm a little skeptical that like pangolin scales were even used in traditional medicines. A lot of stuff originated in the 1950s with, with Mao Zedong and, and the Great Leap Forward and the country doctors and all of that. Um, yeah. Pangolin scales are used in Chinese medicine for a range of ailments. Doesn't work, obviously. It's irritant. Including treating blood clots and aiding lactation. Yeah, nonsense. There's no feasible way it could ever help with that kind of thing. Though there's no scientific evidence that that has any medicinal value. Yes. Yeah. And hey, Lordy, how are you doing? Um, demand for pangolin scales and meat has led to the animal becoming the most trafficked in the world. Uh, so look, in 2019 alone, more than 130 tons of pangolin parts were seized by authorities. 130 tons! If this is using the imperial system, like the English system... One ton is 2,000 pounds. So that would be 260,000 pounds of pangolin parts. These animals are small. They don't weigh very much, especially if they're from Asia. African giant pangolins are a little bit bigger. but And if that's just their scales, their scales don't really weigh anything. They're just made of keratin. It's like, imagine 130 tons of fingernails. Imagine how many fingernails you would have to pull out of people in order to to add up to 130 tons that's 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 it boggles the mind and these are creatures that are on the brink of extinction <sighs> those are just their scales there 400,000 animals. Uh. Illegal poaching has taken a heavy toll on pangolin numbers. I mean, how could it not? With figures like that. The eight species of the animal found in Africa and Asia, they're listed as critically endangered. Three are listed as critically endangered. Probably more, honestly. The thing is, we don't really have good a good handle on like, those three are probably the three species that are actually well-studied, and we have a good handle on their numbers. Penguins are not easy to track or to count, you know? Yeah. People are desperate and misled. This is true, Dame Karen, yeah. Yeah. Although, I don't know, the people who are purchasing this in, in China, for instance, they're not desperate people they're misled but these things are incredibly expensive it's the wealthy it's the elite who are who are purchasing these they're the only people who can afford it you know and misled by folks trying to make that money money exactly lordy yeah yeah you're you're you know your average person in china wouldn't dream of purchasing pangolin parts because that's not it's, it's, it's incredibly expensive stuff. You know? Yeah. The animal's been in the spotlight recently due to a possible link to COVID-19. Yeah, it might be because of trafficking of... Missing its claws. Ah. Studies have suggested it might be the intermediate host that transmitted COVID-19 to humans. 
it could be that millions of people around the world have died as a direct result of our mistreatment of this incredible animal, you know? China has since banned the sale of wild animals for food at quote-unquote wet markets. Such as the one at Wuhan where the virus is believed to have first emerged. Yeah. Their trade for medicine has remained legal. Oh, for medicine? This needs to change. I mean... That needs to change. Their trade for medicine has remained legal. That one million percent has to change. And if you'd like to help make a change with that kind of thing, I, I think the most tangible thing that anybody can do is to... to try and get the word out about this. And to see if you can help out a pangolin conservation fund, like the pangolin crisis fund that we're trying to raise money for today, you know? Here's a link to that video right there. Werewolf gas. And understand that. Animals. Yeah. Yeah. Here, now from that, let's try and. Here, let, let's get back to this video right here. How do we how do we push back against that poaching? It can never be met outside of their natural environment. Pangolin dot Africa. During the rehabilitation process. Pangolins are as vulnerable as newborn infants. They must be kept warm, and they have very specific dietary requirements that can never be met outside of their natural environment. They only eat ants and termites. You can't really keep them in captivity. It's Once extremely difficult. Pangolins are well enough, they need to be taken for walks every three to five hours to forage yeah. and readjust to their natural way of life. Someone has to be with them every step of the way. Oh. This is a time-consuming and exhausting job. A lot of ants and termites, yeah. yeah. They don't just attached, eat two or three. So Michelle doesn't lose him as the cold Kalahari night approaches. The poor creature was confiscated from poachers and was in terrible condition. When he arrived, he was very traumatized. He was dehydrated in very bad shape. You can see, I've taken in so so many, but he was aggressive. Pangolins are extremely vulnerable to stress, making them very difficult to keep in captivity. Most die within six months of capture, which is why it's so important they return to the wild quickly. So the pangolins just come back from its walk, and it gets a bit cold at night, so they keep it in this crate. Put some blankets and i think that there's even an electric blanket that goes underneath that the pangolin can stay warm for the night because usually usually in the wild they'll bear, burrow deep under the sand after three long days and nights of intensive care our pangolin was strong enough to be released to make sure we can keep track of him in the future we fitted him with a satellite tracking device i don't think there's a better feeling than setting them free just can't describe it. We're saving pangolins one animal at a time, but so many are in dire need of our help. International trade in pangolins is prohibited in terms of the Global Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the CITES Agreement. Yet the trafficking continues unabated. We're working to raise awareness about this issue and putting pressure on authorities to enforce existing laws. Truthfully, we shouldn't have to. Pangolins harbor a wide variety of coronaviruses, and scientists say Chinese wet markets, where pangolins are sold alive, was the source of COVID-19, the result of the cruel and unnecessary exploitation of a gentle and vulnerable creature. They're very special animals that deserve every effort that we can make right now to protect them.
We came here and we met and fell in love with the pangolin. Without your help, the species will no longer exist. Please support us and the work we do and give generously. Um, here's a link to that video right there. And if you'd like to help pangolins, um, here, we've got that link there for the Pangolin Crisis Fund. This is the organization here. They made this video. Um, this drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Thank you, Cherish85, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Um, these are, they should be cherished animals, I believe. Let's talk about them. This is a pangolin. While the scale-covered pangolin may look like a little dragon, they're actually more closely related to dogs and cats than to any lizard. Yep. Or to other mammals. They're more closely related to dogs and cats than they are to, like, anteaters or armadillos or something like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And Wolfwill says, I've just never heard of them before. Are they related to another animal we know? Dogs and cats. Yeah. So, uh, pangolins are, to go back to our tree of life, um, here. Let's go to mammals here. And then I'll show you where pangolins are. They're close to what we call carnivorous mammals. Lions and tigers and bears, seals and sea lions, and critters like that. Within Boreutheria, carnivorous bats, hedgehogs, and more. Um, hang on. Up here. Let's find our... There we go. So here's the carnivorous which includes lions and tigers and bears, hyenas, walruses, otters, and weasels and critters like that, carnivorous mammals. And then just outside of carnivora, you got the pangolins. So they don't look super similar to any other mammal because they actually diverge very early on. They are unique among my mammals today. Their closest relatives don't look very much like them because everything in between basically went extinct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Check them out. Pangolins are nature's gardeners. They keep ecosystems balanced and insect populations... We've got a amazing 70 million maximum darnage. Uh-oh. Oh. Cool! Yeah, don't, don't be like that, kid. Respect nature. <laughs> Maximum Darnish, thank you for the 20 months of support. I really appreciate that. Uh, pangolins, yes, indeed. Yeah. Actually more closely related to dogs and cats than to any lizard. Yeah. Pangolins are nature's gardeners. They keep ecosystems balanced and insect populations in check. Gentle by nature, pangolins roll into an armored ball when threatened. Yep. A defensive maneuver that has protected them from natural predators for millions of years. We watched video earlier of a pride of lions trying to eat a pangolin. The pangolin just calmly curls up into a ball until the lions just, you know, they're chewing on it. They're batting at it. They're rolling it around. They're trying to eat it. Eventually, the lions just get bored and go away. And the pangolin, like, peeks out of this little ball and then just goes on its merry way afterward. But unfortunately, that kind of behavior rolling up into a ball, while it protects them from their natural predators, it does not protect them against poachers. In fact, it's quite the opposite. But now that life-saving adaptation has left them vulnerable to poachers, who can easily yeah. scoop them from the forest floor and into the black market. Yeah. Pangolins are the most illegally trafficked mammals on Earth. Their meat is eaten as a delicacy in Asia, while their scales are used in traditional medicines, alongside rhino horn and tiger parts. As a result, all eight species of pangolins are threatened with extinction, and pangolin trafficking threatens human health, as wildlife consumption can transmit diseases like COVID-19. Yep. 
The global illegal pangolin trade must be eliminated if these lovable creatures are to survive and if future wildlife-related pandemics are to be prevented. This is possible if pangolin conservation, long underfunded and under-resourced, is given proper support. This is the strategy of the Pangolin Crisis Fund. That's the organization that I just donated to, gave $150 to them a few minutes ago. Um, and when we, here, I'll put the command in again. Um, there is a link if you'd like to donate yourself, if you feel compelled to. Created by the Wildlife Conservation Network and Save Pangolins, the Pangolin Crisis Fund has one goal, to save pangolins from extinction. Yeah. The Pangolin Crisis Fund sends 100% of every dollar donated directly to the most innovative and effective methods of saving pangolins across their entire range in Africa and Asia. And I want to let you know, I, I didn't choose this lightly either. I looked at a, probably a dozen different charities and organizations and groups. Um, this was the, the best place I could find. Um, they say they said 100%. There's like... They strive to have basically zero overhead with this kind of thing. Um, and the thing is, they, they're providing funding to various projects, various other groups... This really seemed like the most legit, the, the best bang for your buck if you want to help save these animals. Um, spent over an hour an hour today trying to trying to look into this and yeah. This fund sends one hundred percent of every in? dollar Thank you. donated directly to the most that. innovative and effective methods of saving pangolins across their entire range in Africa and Asia. We also invest in campaigns to raise awareness and rally support for the protection of these little-known creatures. <laughs> but saving a species cannot be accomplished by any single organization working alone. Yep. That's why the Pangolin Crisis Fund is committed to bringing the conservation community together to change the fate of these endangered animals. Because the future of pangolins hasn't been decided yet there's still time to change the course of history, to outwit poachers, outgrow tradition, and outrun extinction. Please join us and support the Pangolin Crisis Fund today. Together, we can save these unique animals. It's tough. Dave Karen says, good on Jackie Chen. Let me let me pull up that video again too. Um here. Oh, here, take a look at this. Come on. No. There we go. <laughs> Jackie Chan joined the pitch to save Pangolins. In an animated ad, let's just look at the ad. We don't need a video about it. <laughs> uh. Up to now, penguin only defense from poachers was to roll up into a ball. But now all species are protected by law. A little goofy, but so please fun. never buy penguin meat or skills. When the buying stop, the killing can too. Yeah. 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 I think that organization was probably involved with this ad. I remember seeing there were there were ads on on Bart here. Um, the Bay Area Rapid Transit train system. This is how I get around in the Bay Area. Um, I remember seeing... I, I wish I'd taken a picture. Maybe I do have a picture somewhere on my camera roll. But, um... Why is this not... Working? Come on, Google. Images. There we go. Yeah, there were subway ads like this that I would see. 
on Bart all over the place. And some of them were in Chinese as well. Um, because San Francisco has got a, a sizable Chinatown, so does Oakland. And um, I'm pretty sure I've seen pangolin scales for sale in, uh, in Chinatown in San Francisco before. Um, but yeah. Uh, and Drake and Oakleaf, I was just wondering how they help an ecosystem, like I'm still unsure about hippos. You can't pick and choose with cre which creatures to save out of a given ecosystem, Drake and Oakleaf, because here's the thing about ecology, is that generally these ecosystems are not very well studied in the first place, and we only find out after a creature has gone extinct that the ecosystem starts to collapse, because we didn't recognize how important it was. Pangolins right now are still severely understudied, and who knows what might happen if they completely disappear from some of these ecosystems. It could spell widespread collapse, you know? I... For, but we do know one thing, and it's that the poaching of pangolins may have directly led... to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are like 7 million people around the world who died from COVID-19, which may have come from pangolin trafficking in the first place. In this Take a look. time of crisis, it's worth recalling that nature creates the weird and wonderful alongside the lethal. Sometimes they're connected. It may be you're looking at a link in the chain of transmission of COVID-19 from bat to human. Yep. The science isn't yet certain, but indisputable Still not that the pangolin is gravely endangered. Could it be that a coronavirus connection helps it survive? What I'd like to say about this whole COVID thing is hashtag don't forget where it started. Conservationists want an end to the trade in all yeah. wild animals. I think the message is very clear that it is a human welfare argument. It's not just an animal welfare argument. And this is the beginning. It's not the end. The beginnings yep. of COVID-19 remain obscure, but ground zero for the pandemic was this market in Wuhan, where live yep. animals were sold for human consumption, a perfect place for the virus to mutate and to jump species, as several fatal pathogens have done before. Yep. Millions of pangolins, dead and alive, are smuggled into China for their meat, and for their scales. The link with the market and the virus is contested, but the potential danger is not. If you keep animals in that way and you eat them, you're going to be eating whatever they are going through. Uh, and, and disease is one of the things that you're going to be consuming. China has now banned the consumption of wild animals, but the pangolin trade has been illegal for years and it hasn't stopped their slaughter but convince the consumer they're linked to a deadly disease and perhaps the disaster that is COVID-19 will contain one small but significant consolation. Oh. John Ray, ITV News. Interesting stuff. I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist. I'm a paleontologist. Or from what I understand about this, Having actually read through a couple of papers about this, is that it seems like the general consensus in those fields is that COVID-19 is maybe a direct result of keeping pangolins in these tiny, filthy cages next to other wild animals. Here's another news article about that, or news, the news piece. As the coronavirus outbreak continues to spread across the globe, a common public opinion is that the virus originated from a market in Wuhan in China from a pangolin. Scientists are trying to trace COVID-19 to its original source and questions remain about how the virus was passed on to humans and from which species. Dr Andrew Peters, who is an associate professor in wildlife health and pathology at Charles Sturt University, says that it's not a matter of tracing the host species, but to determine uh, how... And Wolf will, COVID-19 is not over and done with. People are still dying from it every day. Shoot. I had a COVID scare just the other week. Um, 
luckily I tested negative, but like it's still going around and, and people with compromised immune systems are still dying from it. Elderly people are still dying from it. Babies are still Let's dying from it. Fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Cherish, thank you so much for that that pledge of ongoing support. Holy cow! Cherish! Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizing. I hope you feel right at home here. Normally, we're not talking about topics as dire as this. It's World Pangolin Day tomorrow. Or today, for some of you in chat. Time zone's more advanced than my own. Um, but yeah, normally we do kind of more lighthearted stuff than this. This is an important topic, and that's why we're talking about it today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and Wolf Will says, I've never heard of that day, so it's that's new one to me. Oh yeah, the pangolin? I'm I'm thrilled that you are now aware of pangolins, Wolfville. They are such cool creatures. They are they are amazing animals, and I it warms my heart that I've been able to raise awareness about them just a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh Atalanoa says the streamer I mod for and her husband are battling COVID right now. My sister's whole house uh, had it just a few weeks ago. It's very much still around? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And most people who are, you know, able-bodied or young and healthy, you know, we can make it through, but that's not true of the whole population. And it's important not to, not to forget about people who are immunocompromised or who are elderly or who are very young. And ultimately, we also still don't know the, the long, long-term effects of COVID-19. Like, I had it once, even though I was very, very careful about this. I've had it once so far. And there might... I don't know. I remember while I had COVID, it was really scary. Like, it really messed with my brain. Where I would I would wake up from, from being asleep and I wouldn't know where I was. Like, it, it really affected my brain while I had it. And that's a deeply, deeply scary thing. You know, for someone who uses his brain on a daily basis, <laughs> um, it was it was really scary. Like I was I was terrified in this few moments where like it, it, that never happens to me. But like waking up in my own bed and n not knowing where I was or what was going on is deeply scary. And there are some there are some scientific studies that have suggested that. It does impair cognitive fun function in some people on a long-term basis. And there will be further research about this. And anyway, it's... COVID's really serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe since I know a musician who had to have sinus surgery because COVID messed with the soft tissue in her sinuses. It was insane. Yeah. Anytime you have a virus like this that circulates really widely through the population, it will affect different people in different ways, and it will kill certain people. And it'll have serious long-term consequences for certain people, and it's... it's nothing to... It's nothing to laugh off, you know? Yeah. Uh, Nalkar says there are people who had it early in the pandemic that are still having complications from it? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but to determine yeah. uh, how the virus jumped from animals to humans. Um, we can be pretty confident that originally um, it came from bats. We know that bats are the natural host for the SARS coronaviruses more broadly. Uh, I guess the remaining question is whether and what intermediate host it might have gone through. Um, the SARS uh, that emerged in 2002, the first version of SARS, that we became aware civets, of right? went from bats to it's thought to be the palm civet so another yeah. intermediate host that then infected that's the same critter that was pooping out the coffee beans like we talked about earlier in the stream those are civets there they're related to cats to people so there has there is um some evidence that the pangolin is a possible um intermediate host 
but um, there's not the evidence isn't quite there yet to conclusively say that that is the case. Uh, Professor, there's also been a lot of talk about how that transmission actually transpired. There's been a lot of talk on the chat rooms that say this was through the consumption of this wild animal. Could you clear that up for us? How does the transmission then happen to humans? Yeah, look, it's going to be very difficult to conclusively say exactly what event led to the transmission to occur, but certainly look... Especially because that was like, that was probably a singular event. Where it was like one particular animal meeting another animal and getting a virus from that animal to the other animal and then that transmitting that to a human that like that would have been maybe even a single momentary thing just like a chance meeting there but those chance meetings become more and more and more common and more and more and more likely when you've got these huge warehouses filled with filthy cages of wild animals kept there all in close contact with one another like in contagion exactly patrick crusader were you here earlier when we watched that clip from Contagion? Because we watched that earlier. Looking at other yeah. infectious diseases that have come from wildlife to humans, we do have a few clues. Um, there are different routes that these viruses can be transmitted, um, including in urine and blood. So there, there are a number of different mechanisms that they can be transmitted. For instance, Ebola, which is another good example of an infectious disease that comes from wildlife. In fact, um, the majority of human new, new emerging infectious diseases Maybe come from start. wildlife. Nice, Patrick. Yeah, um, yeah. Cool, Ebola cool, cool. comes is thought to come mainly through, um, again, through urine and, and um, contact like that. HIV originally came through people um, butchering carcasses of primates. So yeah. really close blood-to-blood -blood contact. What we do know is that there has to be pretty close contact between the original wild animal and humans um, so it has to be a pretty pretty recent and direct transmission and most likely that's going to occur with um, live animals are there lessons that we can learn from past examples where viruses have been transmitted from animals into humans that might help in this pandemic hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's going to be intense focus on the wet markets in China as a focus for um, human spillover of viruses from wildlife. And that's rightfully so. I mean, they've been demonstrated to be a significant risk to new viruses emerging in, in um, people. But I think that the thing we mustn't lose sight of is that there are a whole lot of other things that we do in the natural environment that can lead to these kinds of spillovers occurring. And Closer to home in Australia, um, we've seen a number of emerging infectious diseases, including Hendra virus, which is obviously a very well-known and deadly virus that infects horses and humans from bats. Um, and the causes of that are thought to be deforestation on the coastal plain of Australia and the pressure that puts on bat populations as they move down to the coast in winter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to be a bit more broad-minded about all of the different types of things that can lead this to occur. And I think we have to basically um, just reconsider our relationship with the natural world, essentially, and, um, and try and work out where these, where these spillover events come from more broadly and address that rather than focusing on just wet markets. You know, Andrew, yep. at the start uh, of this yeah. particular outbreak, a lot of people were concerned that perhaps their pets might get infected with uh, coronavirus. Um, and we were assured by many experts that that could not happen, that it's only... It did happen in a few minor, minor cases, but I don't think any pets ever, like, died as a direct result of that. You know? Really a one-way traffic from animal to human. Now we're seeing a couple of animals in Hong Kong. I think there's an animal in Belgium, and we've just heard about this tiger in a Bronx zoo that's yeah. been infected uh, with COVID-19 as well. Does this mean that the virus... This is a non-issue. It's uh, so dumb that on the news they're talking about this. A tiger was fine. Like, I think it was an asymptomatic case where they, like... They decided to like test the tiger just for funsies and that's like oh shoot it's covid negative it's covid positive uh but i i think the tiger was totally fine right it's mutating and going back into the animals 
No, the um, the receptor that it binds to. So in order to yep. affect an animal, you. Um, including us, it has um, attachment proteins. They just wanted an excuse to show footage of tigers running around. It's on its surface. And the receptor it binds oh, to is boy. across um, across all mammals. So it really comes down to how closely that can bind to that receptor. And what we know is that it, it does that very well for humans. That's why it's so infectious for humans. It's all that kind of song, uh, yes. And what it's we know is we that if in. animals are exposed to enough of this, some animals, so um, particularly cats um, and um, ferrets are another example, they can actually be infected. But And that's the thing is that... that Cats and ferrets are related to pangolins, as we were talking about earlier. So pangolins right here are very close to the carnivorans, which includes cats and ferrets, uh, mongoose and otters, hyenas and bears, etc. Like, it would make perfect sense that if it spread from pangolins to humans, then it might also infect the carnivorans as well, which are pretty close to... To pangolins but um yeah oop. wrong video the likelihood of them being infected is quite low compared to humans it appears at this point and also they're not significant in terms of the transmission of the virus in the broader population sense so that is really where there you um, go. asymptomatic you know, yes the there you go Ningo. yeah has been trying to uh... minimize the concern people have because in reality, um, our pets are not at very high likelihood of being infected. Um, and the other thing is that they're not significant in terms of the transmission of it from human to human as far as we know. So they're just, yep. it's, it's one of those things, there's so much coronavirus now out in the human population that it's not surprising that we are seeing some spillover events into some of our companion animals and other animals that we work with. Yeah. Good on this guy. Like, really, really good. Good outreach he was doing there. Good for him. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah. Now, we've got a lovely documentary here about penguins, and I feel like this is a place that we need to get to in our stream here. Let's take a look at that. We might not finish the whole thing, because I've already been streaming for six hours at this point. But let's start this up. And I'll give you the link to it as well, so you can enjoy it at home if you are captivated by these animals like I am. Check this out. And yeah, the, the minx thing was really sad. Bingo. There's something special about it, and I can't always explain it, but once you see it, you'll know it. Unless they're literally crossing the road in front of you, you don't see them. <laughs> they're just such an incredible, unique animal. I always say they just bewitch you. Knowledge is critical. Oh, <laughs> oh man, we need to change your tone here. But, um... At Lanoa says, you're not allowed to have ferrets as pets in California, and this is true. This is true indeed. I do live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, and it's true. Ferrets are prohibited as pets here in this state, and a big part of that is that if they were ever to, were to escape, they could wreak havoc on our ecosystems here in California. And California happens to be kind of the breadbasket of the United States, like, the majority of of several different kinds of agriculture take place here in California. And also we have pretty strong protections for our wildlife here. So it's understandable that you would want to keep ferrets out. They could be very vicious animals. If they were able to establish a feral population here, holy cow, that would be bad news. Um, and we do have coyotes. Yes, indeed, Crunchy Raccoon. I've seen them in downtown San Francisco. Well, not downtown, but like in urban San Francisco. Um, coyotes are all over the place. They're probably responsible for most of those missing cat posters you see. All over the place. Um, 
place. Keep your cats inside, people, or coyotes will eat them. Um, but anyway, um, I was gonna tell a story about how my little brother, when I was a kid, he, he really liked ferrets, they're one of his favorite animals. And a friend of mine, who now streams on Twitch, Snail Chaser, he was like, well, Steven, you really like ferrets, you know, it's, it's it'd be tricky trying to get them here into California, you know? You'd have to, you have to put the ferrets, like, into a balloon, and then tie the balloons to a, all tie the balloons to a string, and then, like, swallow them, and <laughs> smuggle them into the state. <laughs> I still remember that to this day. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm sure that's much funnier to me than it is to most of you. Sorry about that. But yeah. And Steven too? Yeah. Dame Karen, yep. Yep. Yeah. And Werewolf Cast is, is that the proper pronunciation of coyotes? Coyotes, 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 tomato, potato, you know? I say coyotes because my mentor at Berkeley said coyotes, and that's because she spent a lot of time in Wyoming digging fossils there, and in Wyoming, a lot of people say coyotes. Same with Montana. I've also spent a lot of time in Montana. Coyotes. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Back to a different kind of, uh, of Laurasiatherian mammal. Pangolin. We know Very nice to hear about yeah. these animals. Yeah. I think I can comfortably say at least 65 to 70% of the world's population doesn't know about a pangolin. So yeah. why it's so important. Like most people, I didn't know much about pangolins. Mm. So when Johan asked me to make a pangolin film with him, my first question was why? I did know that you hardly ever see them in the wild. I mean, Johan grew up in the bush and has spent his life making films there, and he still hadn't ever seen one. That's nuts. Growing up in a place and spending a lot of time outdoors and making films about wildlife... And never having seen one of these animals in the wild is, is, is nuts, you know? Yeah. Then he told me about the illegal wildlife trade. It's almost wiped out the four Asian species and is now coming for the African pangolins, uh. making them more trafficked than any other mammal on Earth. This got my attention. I wanted to know more about these odd little animals that are on the verge of extinction. Uh. Once we'd agreed to make the film, we decided to do something that had never been done before. Get all four species of African pangolin into one film. Huh. It would mean Can they do it though? from South Africa deep into some of Africa's remotest areas. But we began our search at home. You got something? Probably in the same place it was last night. And so, yeah, so you cannot use this device to find any old pangolin. It has to already have a radio tracker on it. That's what she's trying to, what she's trying to pick up here. There's a radio transmitter on a previously tagged pangolin. That even, even just using this with a pangolin that has a tracker on it, you can't always find them. You know? Wendy's been tracking and studying the Timmings ground pangolin for the past three years. These animals exist all over Southern Africa. And in spite of being very difficult to find, they're now being poached and sold into the illegal wildlife trade in rapidly increasing numbers. So you think that's where he is? No, I think he's in that burrow over there. Angle an amateur radio operator. There you go, Charles Dragon. <laughs> what was that? What was that, um... Here. Yeah. There we go. Right now, my only outlet is my ham radio. And right now, 
My only outlet is my ham radio. Oh, they don't have the next clip where it... There's like some sort of... Ah! The punchline is gone. Goodness. That's frustrating. Um... Frustrating. Frustrating. Anyway, there, it zooms in on the radio and there's like somebody's speaking through the radio in some foreign language and then it translates it at the bottom with subtitles. It says, I have a ham radio. <laughs> that's, that's what the person was saying through the ham radio. Um, anyway, sorry for the letdown there. Disappointing. Straight into a bush. I'm more disappointed than you are. I assure you. And now, we just wait. And now we wait. The wait begins. Waiting patiently. Thrilling stuff. Lovely sunset there. From Hammer to Twitch chat, there you go, SVR Kin, yeah. <laughs> particular guy that has, that has hooked you uh just the fact that he's so relaxed means i can follow him and watch him do his natural behaviors without me influencing it at all and being able to skills are hard there crunchy raccoon is really important if we're trying to understand what these guys do in their natural habits. they're lion proof i started following this guy about three years ago so the bond is is really strong it's a strong bond yeah he's i shouldn't have a favorite but he's my favorite <laughs> oh I see the tracker on his tail there. We know that they're under a threat at the moment and the numbers are declining at a rapid rate. And if we want to be able to manage that and conserve that, we need to understand that animal. So the research that anybody is doing is going to be really vital to contribute to the understanding of that animal. And with the, the Pangolin Crisis Fund here that I donated to earlier, um, they help fund pangolin research so that we can actually survey them and understand how many are left in certain areas to better conserve them. It's it's like basic scientific research that's being funded through that organization and conservation and sting operations to, to catch poacher, poachers and stuff like that. Uh, the massive spike in the illegal wildlife trade in African pangolins in the last two years has made it essential to learn about this animal as quickly as possible, if we want to save it. A new book about the trade came out while we were making the film. Poached is written by New York journalist Rachel Neuer. Good book. Her story good is things told about this. through exhaustive first-hand reporting. Rachel's encounters with the traditional medicine black markets in China and poachers and wild meat restaurants in Vietnam bring home the stark reality of the trade. Her investigations paid particular attention to pangolins. We go way back, me and pangolins. In 2010, I was doing my research for my ecology masters in Vietnam. And already at that time, pangolins were being absolutely hammered by the illegal trade. When I came back to the UK to present my research findings, I gave you know a 20 minute presentation on what I've been doing in Vietnam. And the first question I got at the end of my presentation was, what's a pangolin? And I was like, oh, wow. And this is a room full of ecologists and ecology students. That's nuts. That's nuts right there that ecologists and ecology students wouldn't, that some of them wouldn't know what a pangolin was. I mean, like, that's expected of the general public, but... Yeah. 
a lot of this trade is just happening with absolute impunity. I showed up for one day in a Chinese market in Guangzhou, China, and within an hour, I was able to find a bag of illegal pangolin scales. And you know, clearly, I don't fit in there, and I don't speak Chinese, and yet it was not that difficult. So yeah. seeing that for myself really showed me how far we have to come in, in tackling this trade. An estimated 1,900 pangolins are killed for every one ton of scale seized. Up in his blanket. That's a pangolin right there, Dan, the BC man. When pangolins in South Africa are recovered from the trade, they're rehabilitated by people like Nikki Wright. One of the coolest mammals in the world. Bait. She's also executive director of the African Pangolin Working Group, established in 2011. It's a dedicated team involved in education, rehabilitation, enforcement, and legislation around the conservation of pangolins and their habitat. Last year, there was 48 tons of African pangolin scales intercepted in Asia by their customs officials. 48. 48 tons. That's what, 196,000 pounds? No, hang on. Anyway, it, it's a tremendous... And for every ton, it's estimated there were 1,900 pangolins killed. Those were only the ones that were intercepted as well, which is probably a tiny, tiny fraction of the ones that were made that made it through, the ones that were illegally smuggled without being caught. You know, like these are animals that are being intentionally driven into extinction through the illegal trade of their body parts. It's it's truly disgusting. Tons. You think each animal has maybe 70 scales on them. It's a lot of animals. They don't weigh much. Nikki was briefing anti-poaching unit trainees about a pangolin she was about to release back into the wild. Aww. The pangolin's name was Umkumboti, or Umi as she became known. Aww. She got her name because the poacher who'd captured her had kept her in a plastic drum filled with homemade beer called Umkumboti. Two weeks probably is the minimum that they spend with us at the hospital. They're all compromised, so they've all been in captivity for a week or 10 days without any food. And she traveled like that all the way from Mozambique. So we had to wash her and get her all cleaned up. But luckily she's okay. And so now she's desperate to get out. So we put her telemetry on her yesterday. So um, we'll Rian and his there. team are going to be tracking her because it's all very well fixing animals and flinging them out. And it's a nice feeling, but you need to know what happens to them afterwards. She's foraging. Well, she's starting. She's looking for food. They've got an amazing sense of smell. I've walked behind a pangolin, and then suddenly it stopped, and it's turned due left, and it walked for 20 meters and started digging there. They oh. can smell ants that far. It's amazing. She's absolutely fine to go. There's going to be no problem, hopefully. Dr. Cleo Graf helped us understand the ecological reasons why the pangolin should be saved. In ecological terms, a keystone species is something that has an impact greater than you would expect yep. for its biomass in the system. Which brings me to pangolin and aardvark, both of which we know so little about. Through their feeding on ants and termites, and therefore potentially controlling their populations, they change the landscape yep if you take something like a pangolin out of the system we really don't know what impact that would have on ants and termites this is echoing what i said earlier when somebody in the chat was asking about like well what happens if these animals disappear like what what's their role in the ecosystem the thing is they're so poorly studied that we don't even know but we know that they feed on the creatures which the animals which probably have the highest biomass in that ecosystem they feed on ants and termites and help control their numbers that's gonna be important would they become super abundant there was a very nice study done in venezuela they 
flooded a valley and formed these different sized islands. Some of the islands became completely denuded, stripped of everything, and others functioned normally. What they discovered that in the completely stripped islands, the leaf cutter ants became completely super abundant and just stripped everything. And so without the anteaters that control those leaf cutter ant populations, the America. entire system yeah. just fell apart. Huh. So Interesting. we just don't know if we took pangolins out of a system, what the knock-on effects would be, but my guess would be huge. Yeah. There you go. I'm glad we brought this up. It's getting the frequency right. A few days after her release, Umi went missing. The monitoring team lost contact with her telemetry signal. It's crucial to know that a released pangolin has survived those first few days. So Professor Ray Janssen, chairman of the African Pangolin Working Group, came down to help find... Yeah, and this is the same guy who made the video for the Pangolin Crisis Fund that we were... Uh, that I donated to earlier. Same guy there. So Prof What's his name? Professor Ray Janssen, chairman of... Ray Janssen. ...of the African Pangolin Working Group, came down to help find her. So we fortunate to go up in one of the anti-poaching aircraft that normally monitor for uh, rhino poaching. So we hope Oh man, I Maybe this is just me as a as a dumb American, but you would hope that an anti-poaching aircraft would be like you know, it would look less like that and maybe more like a uh... you know, and look Maybe more like something like this, you know? You know, I... But this is what they have to work with. Hopefully get to about a thousand to fifteen hundred foot and we should be able to pick her up with the line of sight within 30 kilometers of uh charlie's dragon says bush aircraft tend to be small and light to take off easily you don't need a long runway or tons of fuel well you know same with an a10 thunderbolt 2 you know they're specifically engineered to take off from small short unimproved runways under rugged conditions you know but you make a good point, Charlie Strachan. I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. <laughs> this young female pangolin, which seems to be heading straight back to uh... Mozambique, where she came from. Okay. Might okay. be a few little bumps, if you don't mind. That it's okay. I'm, I was up in a chopper last week, so I'm, that was pretty bumpy. Yeah, but that stuff's unstable. It's not easy, to take, easy to take off and can have a pilot and observer. You're also, Bow Needle, describing the A-10 Warthog. <laughs> Wait, is it only one pilot? Maybe it's just a pilot for the warthog. I don't know if they. I don't know if it's a group too. I think it's just one. But um, but that's much much cheaper, so you can observe. I know, Bo Needle. I know. I know. I just. I I I I wish that that there were, you know, that that pangolins had had some heavier ammunition behind them protecting them. You know, that's that's my. I know it's I know it's juvenile, but that's what I'm saying, you know. Yeah, uh, we're just wishing that conservationists had the ability to be a tad more forceful, says Rachodactylus, when it comes to protecting the environment from poachers. Yes, yes. It's dangerous. It's just a bit. It's bumpy. just bumpy. Uh, I'll just try not uh... to cook, but... <laughs> I've got a sick bag. If you do. Okay, that might be helpful. We'll do a circular so we can get a triangulation and then I'll do a drop pin to the ground crew and uh, go try and find it. Target painter, that might be true, Lepid Yeah. Role in the African pangolin world. And um, uh, Diagosa, thank you. Diagosa? Diagos? Not sure what language that is, but welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. That's for, thanks for joining us. Uh, and there you go, Dave Karen. True. Diego Ease. Oh, Diego Ease. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we're, 
we're in in South Africa with this this documentary here so far, and I'm thinking like these Germanic languages, like like German or Afrikaans or Dutch. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Diego Ease, thank you for the for being here. Welcome, welcome, Diego Ease. D D Gertza. <laughs> no. I've been streaming for six and a quarter hours so far, everybody. <laughs> Bear with me, please. Working group means that he's often uh... directly responsible for retrieving pangolins from the illegal wildlife trade in Southern Africa. It is organized crime, and it's highly organized, and there are syndicates operating, and there are Asian syndicates. So it's deep underground. It's the same level rhino and pelamon and elephant ivory are being traded, but we haven't had any success breaking into them. What, what they need are, well, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to have some people on the inside. Um, but yeah, what, what is it? And what is this, Lordy? Just in case anyone is interested. Um, gifts and accessories. Pangolin. Oh, there we go, Lordy. Yeah, yeah. Um, a hand-woven pangolin right there. Adopt a pangolin. From the World Wildlife Fund, the WWF. Which, funny story about the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, is they actually, they, they beat the World Wrestling Foundation in a legal battle over who would have that I think the World the World Wrestling Foundation sued them to try and get the WWF you know acronym exclusively and and these guys won so good for them but um yeah adopt a pangolin that's really lovely and you can get a plush pangolin holy cow lordy that I've never seen this before that's really cool World Wrestling Federation. Thank you, Mikey Lex. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Again, here is uh, here is the link for that, Lordy. Thank you. Thank you. And also, if uh, if you'd like to contribute to Pangolin Conservation, there's another link there, the Pangolin Crisis Fund dot org that I donated to earlier. And it's actually the other way around. Well, good for them, Will Six Two. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's continue. But we haven't had any success breaking into them. <laughs> oh. The 48 tons we seized last year leaving the African continent and the 23 tons we seized this year so far leaving the African continent in terms of pangolin scales, it represents 8 to 10 percent of the actual trade. Thinking about it, pangolins are the perfect animals to traffic. Natural instinct to roll into a ball, tie a piece of wire around it, throw it on the back of the bucky. You don't need to worry about it, it's not going anywhere. Unfortunately, that mechanism of them, of them wanting to protect themselves is one of their biggest downfalls. Yeah. It protects them from every other animal except for humans. Again, for those of you who are just tuned in a little bit um those of you who came in recently lions unable to kill and eat pangolins because that behavior and those thick keratinous scales protect them Watch this. Here's a pangolin trying to walk away. Lions run over. Can't do it. At the end of this video, there is a happy, calm pangolin. Feeling perfectly safe just walking away from these lions after they get bored. You know? Yeah. Look at this. Imagine being a person being subjected to this assault. You would be dead so fast. But a pangolin, not even worried about it. You know? Yeah.
Penguin just has to wait for the lions to get bored and walk away. And it's fine. Like at the end of the video. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Traffic. Natural instinct to roll into a ball, tie a piece of wire around it, throw it on the back of the bucky. You don't need to worry about it. It's not going anywhere. Unfortunately, that mechanism of them, of them wanting to protect themselves is one of their biggest downfalls. Andrew Jackson is head of an anti-poaching unit, focused mainly... Andrew Jackson. <laughs> Salute to this guy. I'm sure he'd make a better president than... <laughs> An old hickory. Oh, boy. ...on rhinos. But he volunteered to help rehabilitate a young female pangolin whose mother died on an electric fence. Uh, Sadly, electric fences cause approximately 1,000 pangolin deaths in South Africa every year. Oh. So I, I had the privilege and the opportunity to, to raise an uh, uh, orphaned pangolin baby called Electra. Uh, when I received her, she was just on 1.9 kilos. Electra. At that age, she still needs a, a, a parental figure, a mother. So my job uh, was a babysitter. I was her mom, in fact. I had to take her out twice a day, oh. at least, for about one and a half to... Uh, I love that, this big, tough dude going, yes, I was, I, was her, I was her mom. Salute to this guy. I mean, holy cow. she still needs a, a, a parental figure, a mother. So my job uh, was a babysitter. I was her mom, in fact. I had to take her out twice a day, at least, for about one and a half to two hours and find nests for her to feed on and just completely fell in love with her. She was the most amazing animal I've ever encountered. At the beginning, I would actually take her to her ant nest and put her down and off you go, girl. And she would just move off. She wouldn't feed on those ants that I'd picked and she would go find her own ants. And she became incredibly picky in what species of ants she was feeding on. <laughs> At one stage, she only wanted to eat ant eggs. So I had to go and find ant eggs. And as you can imagine, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, to find ant nests, n never mind just the nest, but then to actually find the ant chambers. Their ability to smell those, those ants and those eggs like anything else. He's I'm not the stepdad, he's the dad that stepped up. There you go, Lordy. Yes. Or the, or the mom who stepped up, as you said. Yeah, yeah. 30 centimeters underground yeah. is just absolutely mind-blowing. I'm not a pangolin expert by any stretch of the imagination. And I was learning from her every second I spent with her. If she tasted something that really tasted ugly, her entire tongue would come out and she's actually tied in a knot and who use her tongue to squeeze this taste off that she didn't like and she would start frothing a little bit and you would realize that there was something in the nest that she didn't like and she would move off and she would go to the next nest. Her personality was amazing. She was, she was vibrant, she was full of go and, she, and just so relaxed. She was so comfortable with, with people. And um, at one stage, I kind of thought we made a connection. Uh, we'd be walking around in the bush and it's probably me just looking into it way too much. But she would follow me. She was associating me with getting food and probably that, that's oh. the reason. I thought that we had a unique connection. She was just an amazing, amazing creature. I, I really cherished every single second that I was with her. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a really sad story and something sure <laughs> that that oof, really gets to me. Um, unfortunately, she she passed away. Um, we're not sure why. We we surmising maybe that at that age they still are drinking milk. They still need that that mother's milk that they're feeding on, and which we weren't giving her. We 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 weren't uh, able to give her. Um, so she, she, she didn't slowly decline. It was an amazing thing. She just overnight just dropped. And this is mm, how in tune you get to them. As I opened the box, I knew there was something wrong. Immediately. She was limp, lethargic. Uh, she was really cold. We raced through to, to meet a veterinarian and they put her on, on a drip and uh, put uh, the saline into her and, and try to get her glucose levels up. And she kind of maintained for about a week, and then she just crashed, crashed and passed away. So, although it's, a, it's an incredibly sad event, we're learning so much just from her. You know, for future pangolins, she could be one that, what we've learned from her could save pangolins in the future that are in the similar, similar type of situation that get brought in, specifically from the, the, uh, the, the trade now with pangolins. The mothers are being caught with babies. 
And these babies now, we're learning how to be able to rehab them back to the wild, which is vitally important. Meanwhile, the search for the missing Umi was continuing on the ground. Ray had picked up her signal from the plane the previous evening, and now he was trying to pinpoint her exact position so they could check on her condition. I've got a feeling she's heading Mozambique way. Should we go? Can we get up to that copy? We can, yeah. I've got a feeling she's heading, and she's been going northeast ever since. Let's try that, because the GPS was... They are struggling with that pin drop for about five minutes. So we had to turn the plane around. So there's a pin and we are here. I watched this and there's like a visceral connection here, you know. It's like, these are my people. As somebody who's done a lot of field work myself, you know, being out in the outdoors, working towards some sort of goal that's larger than just yourself, you know. It's really easy to relate to this for me, and, and hopefully a, a lot... I'm not a... Well, I've climbed a lot of outcrop and some trees in my day pre-breakfast banana. Welcome back, by the way. It's good to see you here. Didn't I used to see you in Wild Earth streams? Holy cow. Great to have you here, pre-breakfast. Pre-breakfast banana, howdy, howdy. Yeah. So that means we're going to have to go on that road. Okay. Follow it to the left side. Okay. And then we're going to end up right there by the foot. Okay, awesome. I got involved with the African Bangalore Working Group about three, four months ago um, when there was a sting operation in the area between the various law enforcement for being agencies here. regarding uh, Bangalore. I had the opportunity to work with a, a live pangolin, the first time ever. I spent quite some time in the bush and I've, I've never seen one, you know. Um, and to be able to, to follow and monitor and do some research on a pangolin, you know, it's, it's just, I can't describe it. Gopher tortoise. Yeah, Gopher tortoise are so life. important. That's another keystone species, Emily. Gopher tortoise dig burrows that make life possible for so many other animals in their environment. When there are fires, you, I'm sure you already know this, Emily, but like this is important. This idea of like a keystone species like this. Um, yeah. Have gopher tortoise saved hundreds of animals from wildfire? A world away from the watery expanse of the Everglades. A gopher tortoise. The open savanna beneath the trees makes it easy to move around and feed. And you've never heard of a gopher tortoise? Well, you know why they're called gopher tortoise, S.B. Harkin? Because they dig like gophers. They're so cool. Indeed. But at this time of year, the wire grass is tinderbox dry. Uh-oh. Over a million bolts strike each year. Use these tunnels Rico, yeah. to shelter from fire, hurricanes, uh, and all the extremes Florida's climate can throw at them. Florida and Georgia and... All the other states too. That's why the gopher tortoise is one of the most important animals in these forests. Yeah. Uh, anyway, gopher tortoises, amazing critters. Um, really, really cool. And we understand gopher tortoises. They've been well studied by wildlife biologists, by zoologists, by ecologists. Pangolins, on the other hand, are very hard to study, and they're not common, and they're... Like gopher tortoises, pangolins are probably extraordinarily important to their ecosystems. And we just don't know yet, because... Because they're so rare, and because they've not been well studied. And you can see how difficult they are to study here. like a solar panel four-way, but it's quite high ground. But you scan... Basically, the whole of the West. We can't get her there, then she's gone to Mozambique. It's bad not finding her, but at least we know she's moving, eh? She is. <laughs> you don't get to see them a lot, and that's why it's so difficult to do research on them. Yeah. And we're fighting a war where they're getting traded, and they might go extinct before we realize what's going Fire on with it. Yeah, there you go, Emily. It's true. Yeah. The whole system. 
Yeah. I got a phone number. Have you got a signal? Yes, thanks, mate. Totally. Yeah. I've got a faint. Yeah, I can hardly, I can hardly hear it. That very dense part of the comp as it comes we'll never learn. I hope that's not the case, Amelia Bedelia. I hope, I hope we're making some small dent here. The stream with talking about these animals, talking about the importance of wildlife conservation. You always got to have that, that hope, you know? Yeah. People need other options than illegal. Exactly, SV Harkin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. found yeah. it. She's just curled up on the side of a bush and not even in oh. a hole, just chilling there. Good news, eh? She's traveled, how far are you reckon? Between six and eight k's. It's about, it's about Seven. nine to ten, eh? In, in 48 hours. <clears throat> 48 hours. That's right? huge. It's a big dog. It's a long distance for such a small critter. And we've seen lots of her foraging signs, her field signs, so she's obviously finding food. And she's tucked up in the shade of a bush here and doing fine. You lose so many and then you, mm. you get this and, and it's all worthwhile, even if it's one. Rian is going to carry on following her and monitoring her. And it's just the most rewarding thing to see this animal in her environment. Um, They go through the most horrific time. They're starving, they've been ripped out of their beautiful existence and terrified at the hands of the poachers. Um, they've been abused, they've been pushed and shoved and looked at and shouted over and haggled over and, and eventually the lucky ones come through to us. Um, so to see her here is very moving. And I'm just so grateful that we've had a part in, in making her better and getting her to where she needs to be so that she can carry on. And I should interrupt briefly to say that if you want to help with this kind of thing, consider donating to the Pangolin Crisis Fund like I did earlier in the stream. Um... Someone else who's been caring for pangolins for nearly 27 years at the Tiki Highwood Foundation in Zimbabwe is Lisa Highwood. She loves all types of wildlife, but pangolins have a special place in her heart. Aww. So October 1994, I received my first call from the authorities. They said that um, an animal had been confiscated and would I please go and... Dinosaurs lived a long time ago. Lordy. They were terrible lizards, don't you know? Thanks for long stream and important content. Thank you, Lordy, for those hundred, uh, those thousand bits. Excuse me. Thank you, thank you, Lordy. Um, I appreciate that, Lordy. I really do. Um, in fact, shoot, I should put my money where my mouth is, more or less literally here, and um. I should I should give another donation to the the Pangolin Crisis Fund for that amount. Um, you know, let's make it let's up it to fifteen dollars actually, not just ten, fifteen. This isn't right. What? Why is it auto filling with? That's not correct. Hang on a second. Okay, my mistake. Um, there we go. PayPal. New address. Now, new 
Alcatraz, come on. There we go. Good stuff. Um, it worked. Thank you, Lordy, for, uh, for that support. That has gone directly to, uh, to pangolins there. Plus, plus a little bit extra. Recover the animal and then start really? the process of rehabilitation. And um, I had thank you, pre breakfast banana, banana, for that gift up there. I appreciate that. Drop XO XO. I really do. Thank you. Thank drive you. Drive about two and a half hours to where the location was. And when I got there, I was on the side of the road. I'd handed over appreciate a sack. That. Being given an animal in a sack, I don't know why, but that really had major ramifications at that moment for me. Uh, and then when I looked, and I saw this one eye staring at me. Um, my world stood still. Since that moment, the Tiki Highwood Foundation has grown to become a major influence in pangolin conservation all over Africa. People will say, oh, in Africa, forget it. You're never gonna overcome that. It's just how it is. Well, I disagree with that. But what works in Canada or the UK may not actually work in Zimbabwe or in South Africa. Let's do what's right for Africa. Because these are African problems. And therefore, we have to find African solutions. If we lose the pangolin, we lose the Earth's great well, those gardeners. Those paws on the wings are, once again, invaluable. Maelstrom doll, thank you for 22 months of support. Happy pangolin day. Happy World Pangolin Day to you too, Maelstrom doll. Thank you, thank you for the 22 months of ongoing support for this channel. I really appreciate that. Thanks for keeping me online. Supporting this mission of science outreach and education. It means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. They are our yeah. caretakers. And for me, they are my essence. Pangolins exist in very remote areas. So to find the second African pangolin on our list, it took us two long days to get to Western Ghana. Hmm. We were hoping to see the white-bellied tree pangolin. Ooh, I don't know if they're gonna get to see it. These are rare. These are very rare. Oh! Oh, this looks like an injured one. The study is also about knowing the ectoparasites of the white-bellied pangolin. So any pangolin that we release or tag, we take out the ectoparasite on his body. Those are external so parasites. The ectoparasite. yeah. So we determine the type of ectoparasite that are on these pangolins. Max will spend 10 years studying in South Africa before returning home to Ghana. So he could concentrate on an animal that he was clearly passionate about conserving. Axel's project requires that he establish pangolin numbers in Ghana. To do this, he needs access to the bushmeat trade. Any yeah. information I want about bushmeat trade, I can come to them. So they are the ones who initially informed me about the Chinese trade, their purchase of the skill. So these guys have come to buy the skill. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. And these are the scales from the pangolin? Yeah. So this is the white belly pangolin. Yeah. It's amazing, this is what it's all about. The bushmeat trade also provides him with an opportunity to gather DNA samples as he builds his database on the pangolin commodity chain. Based on my experience and our research so far with African Pangolin Working Group, we've realized that the processing of the pangolin meat is different. Those who are aware of the Chinese trade of scale, they remove it with hot water. Those who are not aware, they just bend the scale. So these guys are not aware of the trade in uh -huh. pangolin scales. Okay. 
But this goes to what what I think Rakedactylus was talking about earlier, where it's like if if you want people to stop slaughtering endangered animals, sometimes these people that's the most lucrative thing that they can do. That's the way that they can support their families. You have to provide other economic opportunities for them. You have to improve the conditions of people's lives. And that's not... That's not the general incentive for people who are profit-minded, you know? It's... Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna skip forward through this part. Here we go. Well, let's continue here. Basically, with my home ring studies, the guys assist me in uh, getting the pangolins to put a tag on. So what you do is you do a night patrol because they come out at night. That is when they feed. Plan is to release it near a log where there are some ants so that it'll remain in the area and hopefully begin to feed and we can get some footage of our first wild pangolin in the in the forest. <laughs> it still wants to be in the defensive position. So we are about to release it uh, where it was caught. You know what? This reminds me of something, too. Looking at this right here, looking at this animal walking around through its natural habitat, I'm struck by something in particular. Does, does anybody else know what I'm talking about here? Something related to... this critter? Look at... This big claw right here. So pangolins, they tend to have one big claw on each on each hand. They use their arms for for breaking open termite mounds and ant nests and stuff like that for digging. And they've usually got one really big claw right there, and the rest of the claws are a lot smaller. This is very, very similar to these critters. The Alvarosaurus. This group of dinosaurs, which were a mystery for a long time, what are they doing with these really weird... These guys have got one big claw on each hand. And they also have these mouths with tiny, tiny, tiny teeth. Some of them seem to have no teeth at all. A lot like pangolins, you know? Um, this is a... A sculpt that I made of Trirarchuncus. This is the first dinosaur um, with with my name on it. So I'm one of the authors on this paper. Trirarchuncus prairiensis. A species of a hook-handed dinosaur uncovered in Montana. Published on this in 2020. Um, it's a really, really cool critter. Trirarchuncus there on Wikipedia. There you go. And then there on the references list. Jennifer Fowler, Jack Wilson, Liz Friedman Fowler, Christopher Noto, Danny Anduza right there. One of the authors on this paper. Um Yeah. Um Yeah. This whole group of dinosaurs is incredibly weird. And for a long time it was a mystery, like, what in the world are they doing? They've got these super short but very powerful stout arms with one big claw on each hand. 
what in the world are they doing with those? And now, we think we understand. By studying modern animals that have similar claws, we can gain better clues about that. Like here, this is a very close relative of Tree Archuncus. In fact, our our Tree Archuncus may have evolved from this animal right here, Mononychus. Mononychus is a desert specialist. Such hypersensitive directional hearing gives her a mental map of this hollow log and what lies within. Dame Karen says they look terrifying. <laughs> really? <laughs> Um. Uh, so, I, I'm sure you were referring to to this illustrate. These are these are little guys, you know. Yeah. 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 She now uses the weapon that gives this hunter its name. Mononychus. Single giant claw. Yeah. Just what she needs to open a termite's nest. And Rakedactyl, it says a tradition and authorship is the most senior status author is last. That's not really true in paleontology, Rakedactyl. I think that might be true in medical science or maybe other fields. Um, in this case, the first author is the the one who contributed the most to the project, usually. So in this, in this case, it's Denver Fowler. Jack Wilson discovered one of the key components there, one of these claws that allowed us to actually do the description. So he's second author. Um, I kind of provided some background information, and I scoured the collections at, at UCMP in Berkeley. See if we could find any more Alvaris or material. There wasn't any. As thoroughly as I looked, there just wasn't a single scrap. So I'm second to last author on this. And then we've got Jack Horner, who had some comments about ontogeny and paleoecology of the Hell Creek Formation and stuff. So yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm second to last author on this, is uh, my contribution to this was not huge, you know? Yeah. Uh, authorship order is generally best decided before projects begin to avoid jockeying for position. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely in some fields, the last author is like the head author or the most prominent one. That's not the case with, with paleontology. Yeah. And she has another special piece of equipment. Like a pangolin? A flexible tongue twice the length of her head. Yeah. We don't actually know if they had a long tongue like that, because it doesn't fossilize, but it would make a lot of An sense. Excellent protein packed meal. If only termites weren't quite so irritating. Yeah. <laughs> uh um But yeah, yeah. A lot like a pangolin with that big, big, big claw right there on these fairly short arms. We think that those dinosaurs are doing the same thing that these guys are with their claws. This is why it's so important to, to study these animals as well and to make sure they don't go extinct because if these animals go extinct, then how are we going to study their behavior to learn how extinct dinosaurs may have behaved? You know? All of these things come together like this at the end of the day. Like, the pangolins are extremely important to study for dinosaur paleobiology for this very reason. Yeah, Rachodactyla says it's almost as if nature is very interconnected. We need to learn a lot about nature by studying any part of it. Exactly, exactly. <sighs> yeah. Where else is? Why didn't woodpeckers adapt like this? Because they had different ancestors that used their their beaks rather than their claws for 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 getting prey. But this sort of behavior has also evolved in in critters like silky anteaters. Where they've also got um, this critter I showed you earlier, which is not closely related to pangolins at all. But these guys also have got one big honking claw like that to tear open 
bits of trees and stuff in order to get to uh, to their insect prey. Yeah. Um. So especially in in paleontology, you never know where these insights are going to come from. Which modern creatures that you might study to give you clues about extinct animals? Because we can't behave, we can't observe the behavior of, of creatures like this. You know, they're long dead. We can look at creatures today that have similar morphology, similar body features. Figure out what they use those for as a clue for what dinosaurs were doing back then. So that's why here we've got all of these different pangolin, you know, illustrations and, and framed bits of you know, skeletons and, and, and portraits and, and paintings and and then we've got a dinosaur here, too. I've always got to put a dinosaur in there, as you know, as a dinosaur paleontologist. But, yeah. Conversion to evolution. There you go, Will62. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. Good stuff. Anyway. With that having been said, I'm going to give you a link to this documentary. so that you can watch the rest of it. And... We... are gonna go ahead... and start wrapping things up here. Or we were, at least. The search for dinosaur bones begins in a place like this. Happy Nightmares' search has succeeded with their four co-explorers. Happy Nightmares, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Happy World Pangolin Day to you. Holy cow. I've been streaming for almost seven hours at this point. And it's about me. It's about time for me to, to curl up into a ball like this pangolin here. Just like that. Happy Nightmares. Can we get a shout-out for you? Oh, we already got one. You were doing some science and tech, too? Awesome. Thank you, thank you, Happy Nightmares. Science is like a blabbermouth who ruins a movie by telling you how it ends. Well, I say there are some things we don't want to know. Important things. Hey, Rumi Kim, thank you for the follow. We'll continue for a little while longer. We will continue for a little while longer here. I won't wrap things up just yet. Um. Yeah, here. We were... Here, I believe. Yeah. There we go. So can I ask you a personal question? Why are you doing it? Yeah, I'm doing it because I'm interested in what I do. Yes, a kindred spirit. This is one of my people, you know? Scientists and conservationists and, and academics in general, we do what we do because we're interested in it. Because, because it drives us. Because we're passionate about it. It's a reason to get out of bed in the morning. It's a reason to... It, it's, it's, part, part of, it's being part of something that's larger than just ourselves. You know? When you've got a purpose like this in life, it, it drives you. It... It, it makes you happy. You know? I wish that everyone had something that, that drove them, something that they were passionate about, something to strive for. Because that, that feeling of purpose is, is so important to human beings. And in this world, there are, there are so many forces arrayed against that. You know? There are people who want to keep you down and exploit you and and just you know make you toil away day after day for the the profit or well-being of other people. You know, so that some billionaire can buy a, a sixth vacation house or a third mega yacht, or that's not what life should be about. Especially since those same economic systems are what are driving the the extinction of creatures like pangolins, you know? 
just this increasing exploitation of our of our planet and all of the creatures upon it. So Yeah. So can I ask you a personal question? Why are you doing it? Yeah, I'm doing it because I'm interested in what I do. And I like bumbling. I've become fascinated about the animal. That actually motivates me that there's a lot to study. Yeah, so much left to learn. The third pangolin that we wanted to film is the smallest and has a reputation for being the cutest. Again, it took more than two days to get to the forest in the Central African Republic where we hoped to find them. The trip took months to set up, but finally we were off to meet Rod and Tamar Cassidy, who run a pangolin rehabilitation program at their eco-lodge. The black-bellied tree pangolin. Beth kind of sort of says, too bad that money doesn't buy their happiness. Yeah, money doesn't buy happiness. It can buy a certain degree of security. Money, you know, can buy a certain degree of, like, safety, freedom from hunger. But it won't actually make you happy. You need something greater than that. That's why, shoot, the, the children of very, very wealthy people are often... They've got extremely high rates of depression. Stuff like that. Money itself does not buy you happiness, and above a certain threshold, it actually makes you more unhappy. Having too much money makes you paranoid. It robs you of your humanity. It turns you into a bad person. Research has shown this. It's... I had a coup d'etat, so I came in 2004 and fell in love with the place. Thank you, Casey Snowart. Yeah, yeah. We'd crossed the river from Cameroon, uh, and as we were driving through the village, um, and hang on, uh, Ningao Ball says, "Do we think stegosaurs walked on their hindlands like pangolins?" That I'm so sorry, I didn't find that that question until right now. That's a brilliant question. There, pangolins, especially ground pangolins like this, um, so pangolins are well known for walking around on their hind legs like this, but they don't seem like that would like they, they, they could just kind of barely manage it and Ningao says uh, could stegosaurs have done the same thing I have asked the very same question you know it's uh that's a brilliant question There are a number of paleontologists who have suggested that stegosaurs could easily rear up on their hind legs like this. That they're kind of perfectly built for this. Where they've got very short hind very short forelimbs and longer hind limbs. Their center of gravity is probably just forward of their hips. And um yeah, there's a lovely Mark Witten illustration right there of a, uh, I think, Kentrosaurus rearing up on its hind limbs. Stegosaurs, a lot like pangolins, could probably do this in order to feed. And Bob Bakker has some illustrations of this in, uh, in his 1986 book. Let me find that. Camera's probably frozen again, but let me check. No, it's not. Good. Uh, I've rearranged these recently, and uh, it's a little tough to find sometimes. Where did I put Bakker's The Dinosaur Harris? Before the onslaught of the beast. The what? The beast. The what? Well, let me turn the music off. I didn't catch that. The what? The who? I'm sorry, one more time. The what? Knife Clown. Thank you for the 13 months of support and the... Um, again? What, what was that? <laughs> yes, indeed, Knife Clan. Thanks for helping me stay reading. 
with those 13 months of support. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Appreciate that. Um, I need to do a better job organizing this. is there. Yeah. Um, really interesting book by Bob Bacher. This is one of my favorites when I was a kid. There's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. There's some wild ideas too. A lot of these things still remain. They're still here, like, they should still be tested. But, um, talking about stegosaurs and I think it's in the herbivory chapter. Bucker calls it when dinosaurs invented flowers. Um, yeah. But uh, he has some nifty illustrations of. There we go. Of stegosaurs rearing up on their hind legs like this. And I think this is an idea that should be explored further. It's not really been. Uh, rigorously tested, this idea that Bakker just kind of threw out there in this book. But... Here, the tall vertebral spines give back muscles and ligaments leverage for racing the body, just like a crane's ribs. A crane's jib is braced by a cable. Stegosaurs had much larger, larger back-raising leverages than did the elephants of the same weight. And even though elephants can rear up on their hind legs like that, it makes sense, but like, I would like to see this idea further tested. You know? Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's interesting stuff. And here, Bakker shows a stegosaur rearing up on its hind legs right there to browse higher in the treetops. Yeah. Uh, it did not roll up into a ball, SVR. No, definitely not. But, um, yeah. Anyway, I think that's all the illustrations I want to show you. Oh, there's stegosaurs there too. Rearing up. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Good stuff. And the name of the book, Dalmalax, is The Dinosaur Heresies by Bob Bakker. 1986. Um, if you're looking for a, a nice book from the 80s to read about dinosaurs, this one is a real page-turner. It's a very engaging book. I don't agree with everything that Bacher says in here, but it's definitely worth a read. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would recommend it. Um, and I, I would more heartily endorse Bacher's ideas from this book than some of Bacher's ideas today. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, and hi hi to you too, Regal Blurb. It's good to have you here. How you doing? Uh, Worldcast, have you read the Dinosaur Sanctuary manga? No, no, I haven't. Um, yeah. But anyway, and... The moon does exist. Thank you, Regal Blurb. Good information. Appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thanks for the follow. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Here, back to our... Our pangolins here. I do have to wrap up. Oh, I'm being assaulted by by, by cats. Besieged. We were running through the, the pie. And uh, a pangolin ran out into the road. I think I want some dinner. 
and I'm have to feed uh, you. I jumped out of the car, and these guys were all chasing it, and one of the guys grabbed it, and I just grabbed it from him and got back in the car. <laughs> that was the first pangolin I'd, I'd ever seen, technically, in oh. the wild. Mm. And we brought it back to the camp here and released it. It was a black-bellied pangolin, mm. and, oh. and we didn't even know that these things were diurnal. We thought all pangolins were nocturnal, like everybody thought at that stage. There's and still so, so we, little we that's known about so many of these creatures. Release it. <laughs> we released it like at six o'clock at night. You know, the thing was going, oh shit, it's dark now. I've got to go find a place to sleep. <laughs> so we, we've learned a lot since then. Oh. Tracking pangolins with telemetry is not an option in the forest here. So Rod and Tamar have hit on a novel solution. They huh. trained teams of local Baaka tribesmen to monitor the black-bellied tree pangolins that have been rehabilitated and returned to the forest. Nice. The Baaka follow the pangolins from sunrise to sunset every day as they feed in the treetops high above. Wow. They record pangolin behavior, their movements, and what oh, they eat. Hello, we spent a day with them watching Pangi, a favorite of Tamar's. Oh. Yes, yes. Oh. Right. Oh. I just saw the movement and that was there. But that's what happened. You should they'll disappear in there for hours. <laughs> you won't see them, you just know that they're eating. Look at that. The and the way, look at inchworm, the way they move oh, up a tree yeah. like that is wild. That's so cool. I could do this all the time. I mean, I have. Sat and walked and walked and walked. And something that draws you in. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? Oh. Yeah, so there was always something to do, some question to answer. I've got to know what they eat. afro -therian what slots. They eat. Well, these are these are related to uh, to carnivorans. Order Folodota, I think. Ken? Yeah. We used to think they were xenarthrans, and no longer. Yeah. Yeah, no worries, Ken. Mammal taxonomy is weird. Uh, aren't they pretty, Casey Snower? Yeah, absolutely. When the rain stopped, we met Maya, a Swiss researcher who is living at the lodge and running the pangolin rehabilitation program Aww. that Rod and Tamar set up. Ndima was a rescued pangolin who'd been returned to the forest, but while being monitored, his team noticed that he didn't seem to be as strong as he should be. Aww. He started slipping off branches and coming down to the ground to sleep. So Maya and the Baaka have brought him in for observation and some feeding up. <laughs> Yeah. And here. It's like <laughs> the Baaka spend many hours harvesting ants from trees in the forest so that Indima can put on weight as quickly as possible and wow. return to the treetops. Just some ants to go, please. <laughs> just, a, just a quick order of, of takeout ants. <laughs> the dedication of these wonderful people. Good on them. These are my people. Holy cow. Yeah. And good night to you, Emily. Thank you for being here. So what we're going to do is now he's going to walk uh, with the pangolin and find some ant nest and just follow people. him. Even. Yeah. You're a bit concerned. Who ordered the ants? Yeah, there you go, Afro Yeah. No, he has not. Yeah. For sure. He used to be much stronger and much steady and confident in going up the, the branches. They do fall, but he he now falls like every day a couple of times. Oh. We're gonna watch him the whole day, and then at the end of the day, that's where when the bark is gonna hopefully climb a little bit and take him carefully. Again, the dedication of these people. Incredible. Everyone, 
everyone who comes into contact with him, everyone who works with him, Isn't somehow it? gets connected. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it is. Do you I, know? I, I, there's something mystical. What an incredible animal. Holy cow. And I think that's probably where I should leave it for today. Again, if, if you want to help save these incredible animals, thank you, Lenina. There's the command there. The Pangolin Crisis Fund. I've already given... $165 today to go. Um, if you want to help save these animals, I'd recommend you check it out. Click that link there and read about that organization. Consider, consider giving. There are some hungry cats here that I've got to feed, and I've been streaming for seven and a quarter hours now at this point. So it's time to wrap this up. Without further ado... Let's put another mammal under our credits here. This one, the state fossil of California, the Smilodon. Um, thank you everybody for making this a wonderful stream. I hope you learned something. I hope... I hope you've got a newfound appreciation for these incredible creatures. And why they're important. Why they're worth saving. And why they're worth leaving alone. In the sense that... Could be that COVID-19 is a direct result of poaching pangolins. But we're going to continue on with some more science here. We're going to raid into science streams. Go hang out with Blint and Lita too. Lita is on us also. Excellent. We're going to go hang out with some other scientists, with um, uh, some molecular and systems biologists as they discuss fossil news. Fossil news? Science news, excuse me. I need to wrap this up. Fade in here. But uh, everybody, thank you so much for your, your support. Moderators and raiders, followers and cheerers, subscribers and gifters. And everybody, an extra, extra special thanks to everybody who contributed to Pangolin Conservation during this stream. And there are a lot of you. I appreciate you so much. And those of you who, uh, who are still considering donating, think about it. Anyway, thank you, everybody. And um, happy World Pangolin Day. Let's go right into Science Streams. I'll see you there. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.